So you still have some time.
Good morning good. for those of you who are here and uh, good morning, afternoon and evening for those who are online. I think we have a sizable number of people online. Um, I know most, uh, some of you could not make it here since we are away from our usual spot in Geneva and um, here in um, Vienna. So before we start, just want to do the usual that the meeting is being recorded. Um, when you uh, request the floor, you can request with your hand up or you can request with your um, badge like this. And the chair will call your name. I would also like to point out that on the IGF website, we do have a list of documents which we will be referring to um, th throughout today and also tomorrow. Um, so if you go to the front page, there is um, input documents and there's a list of documents there. And when you speak, can you please just uh, introduce yourself and speak slowly so that people can hear you? And I think that's it. There's going to be an action point oriented summary that's going to come out of this meeting. So it's not a uh, transcript, but just the action points that have been discussed to today. And with that, I will give the floor to our chair, Paul Mitchell, to start the meeting. Good morning and welcome. And to actually start this morning, we have a video uh, from you and Dessa. So we'll start with that and then come back to, to me. Members of the IGF Multi Stakeholder Advisory Group. It is a pleasure for me to address you on behalf of the United Nations. Let me first thank the 2022 MAC members for shaping a successful meeting at Sababa and for laying the groundwork for this year's preparations on our way to Kyoto. The 2022 IGF brought together more than 5,000 stakeholders from over 170 countries and representing multiple disciplines. The dialogue and the exchanges in Addis Ababa delivered a forward-looking and action-oriented messages. They are aimed at improving the digital landscape and shaping a resilient and inclusive internet that can contribute to the global good Stakeholders called for better cooperation to bridge the digital divide. They encouraged more effective deployment of the critical infrastructure and the need of the broad-based development of digital competencies and skills. And they placed a particular emphasis on the need to include women and girls in all spheres of a digital life. Stakeholders called us to work towards a single, safe, secure, and unfragmented internet. And they noted the need for good digital policy that would allow us to embrace new technology in the service of, and not at the expense of, humanity. Let us keep these and many more messages from Addis Ababa in mind as we designed the agenda for IGF 2023. This year's multi-stakeholder advisory group has an important task ahead. You need to put together a program that will further move the needle on the implementation. The agenda of the 18th annual meeting must be ambitious. You also need to ensure that the Kyoto IGF enables all stakeholders to contribute to decision-making. It must reflect the priorities of the people living around the world. The IGF 2023 themes 
must be carefully crafted, guided by inputs of stakeholders and institutions received through the IGF's public call. The new leadership panel will be a valuable partner in your preparations to make the IGF even more strategic and impactful. I have no doubt that the IGF 2023 agenda will tackle the long-standing challenges and emerging ones, and provide insight on policy issues highlighted in the Global Digital Compact proposed by the UN Secretary General. Thank you very much, and that I wish you a fruitful meeting. And now it gives me pleasure to introduce my co-chair. Members of the IGF Mind Stakeholder Advisory Group. It is a pleasure for me to address. Okay. Um, it gives me pleasure to introduce my co-chair, um, Goichi Ide from Japan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh... Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, my name is Yoichi Ida, uh, working at the Japanese uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. And uh, I'm very happy to join you as co-chair uh, of uh, MAG meeting uh, as host uh, representative. Uh, we have started our preparation uh, at home and uh, 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 after maybe later in this session, uh, I will introduce briefly uh, uh, the current situation and uh, our uh, uh, some uh, foresight uh, toward the IGF in Kyoto this year. Thank you. Thank you. It also gives me great pleasure as a father of five daughters uh, to note that it is International Women's Day today and uh, hope we all take um, appropriate notice of that. And uh, now I'd like to um, adopt the agenda if there's any that would like to uh, to add to the agenda. And we've got a message from the 2022 host country. Yeah. Good morning, all. I would like to say happy International Women's Day. Today is March 8th. So there are a lot of strong women that I have seen and happy International Women's Day for all strong women all over the world. Um, dear Excellencies, dear members of high level leadership panel, dear members of the MAG, invited guests, the IGF Secretariat's members, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to say good morning to all. It's an honor to make a keynote speech at this uh, opening ceremony for MAG. Uh, when Ethiopia receives the responsibility of hosting IGF 2022 forum, in addition to contributing the overall objective of the IGF, Ethiopia had additional objectives of bringing the IGF from a forum back to Africa soil, inciting Africans and other developing countries, unique agendas related with the internet governance. We believe the IGF 2022, which was conducted in Addis Ababa was a success which hopefully you are also a witness for that. I know most of you were in Addis. To make the IGF success, we have made a lot of efforts. The first thing we have made was to create clarity on what IGF is and its objectives. After creating clarity and setting the agendas, we have creating a national governance structure which includes a national and steering committees composed of representatives from the government, the private sector, and the civil societies. And a secretariat who is following up 
the day-to-day -day activity also was the IJF Secretariat. The National Secretariat was also closely working with the local and international mugs. That's why it's a success because of this strong team. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of the IGF is not only in terms of venues and facilities, but it was also a successful on addressing relevant international surrounding internet governance, including digital inclusion, artificial intelligence and emerging technologies, sustainability, digital rights, cybersecurity, and much more. The IGF 2022 also successful in hosting the youth and parliamentary forums. The forum's agenda were also linked with United Nations Secretary General roadmaps on digital cooperation, as well as the agenda of the global digital compact. I would like to take this opportunity to thank again the leadership panel, the MAG members, the IGF Secretariat, the UNEC, and UNDESA for their relentless efforts to make IGF a success. I wish IGF 2023 become more successful and brought the understanding, the issues raised during IGF 2022. The level to the next level. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, the purpose of this meeting today is to take stock and note the consultations that have been held so far relating to inputs to the 2023. Um, IGF, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and I'd ask for the secretariat to provide the summary of the inputs that are received to date. Apparently my voice is too quiet. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Um, so I, I'm asking for the secretariat to provide a, a little update of the inputs that have been received into the stock taking process up to this point in time. And this will be begin our substantive portion of the morning. So I'll turn it over to Secretariat. Yeah, so, um, first of all, we're going to have adoption agenda, I mean, presentation and update from the 2023. Okay, we're going to adopt the agenda first. I thought I did that mm -hmm. a little back. Um, and we'll have a presentation from the 2023 host company company country um first so yeah okay, thank you very much chair so uh let me briefly take the floor to uh, present uh, our uh, current situation in preparation and also the some of the objectives and the proposals towards the a, a, a IGF this year uh, in Kyoto. So first page, please. So as uh, many of you, or all of you, uh, well recognize, uh, the around the world digitalization in society and the economy uh, is going on, and the internet is becoming even more uh, in important uh, essential infrastructure for the society and economy, uh, which now is truly fundamental infrastructure for the whole range of economic and social activities and accessibility to the network. It uh, can be set uh, as a part of basic human rights. So uh, Japan believed now is the time to realize global and inclusive internet for everyone. That is the background of uh, our proposal to host IGF uh, in Japan. And uh, at the same time, over the past uh, few years, uh, we believe world experienced global challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic, 
uh, which uh, uh, reminded us of the uh, importance of accessibility and also connectivity and even the resilience of network. And also the uh, Ukraine case uh, also reminded us uh, the importance of resilience of the network and also the uh, some uh, trustworthiness or uh, uh, the uh, importance of uh, uh, information over the network. So uh, these are the backgrounds of the our intention uh, to host the uh, the IGF uh, 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 in our country to work together with the stakeholders from around the world and also uh, yes thank you and at, of course uh, uh, on, on uh, and, and in the background Japan firmly believe uh, inclusivity and diversity of the internet it's the core source of uh, innovation and growth of economy or development of society and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, the uh, fundamental value of internet uh, 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 as a social uh, foundation so i think uh, this is uh, uh, th these elements uh, can be uh, part of the uh, themes uh, for this uh, year's igf hopefully so we are going to host IGF in the city of Kyoto. Uh, I hope uh, many of you know uh, uh, where uh, Kyoto is, but let me briefly introduce. Uh, Kyoto is in the western part uh, of Japan, and uh, which is this, <laughs> this map uh, is not uh, really recognizable, but uh, uh, Kyoto is uh, uh, one uh, two hours trip uh, from Tokyo by bullet train and the close to the uh, second uh, largest airport in Kansai area. So uh, you can uh, uh, arrive in Kansai International Airport, or you can move from Tokyo uh, using uh, uh, Tokyo International Airport uh, and uh, using a billet train uh, to move from Tokyo to Kyoto. Uh, and uh, 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 Kyoto uh, is uh, uh, the most uh, uh, historical uh, city uh, in Japan, and so that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, cultural and uh, uh, historical uh, uniqueness uh, in the city. So next page, please. Okay, you may see a little bit better uh, where Kyoto is. Uh, which uh, you see in the red uh, as a red mark. Uh, it, it is in the center of the western part of Japan. And uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, the uh, access from Tokyo is two hours by billet train, or you can arrive uh, in Osaka airport uh, uh, you, by using a domestic flight from Tokyo or Kansai uh, Air, uh, International Airport. Okay, so next page, please. So as I said, uh, Kyoto is, uh, uh, we hope, one of the most famous uh, cities in Japan. And uh, Kyoto has uh, uh, used to be the capital of the country for more than uh, 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 12 decades, no, no, 12 centuries, uh, from probably from sixth century until 18th, uh, 19th century, uh, and uh, 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 from the uh, later 19th century, uh, it became uh, Tokyo became the capital. So Tokyo is quite new, and Kyoto ha ha had been uh, uh, center of uh, the country for a long time. That's why Kyoto has a lot of uh, cultural and historical uh, uh, uniqueness. And uh, Kyoto is uh, based in a, a small uh, valley surrounded by uh, low mountains and uh, uh, basically warm area, uh, even in uh, uh, autumn, but uh, 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 cold in winter time. But I think uh, October uh, must be a very good season to visit. So uh, visitors can 
uh, uh, experience some uh, traditional uh, Japanese uh, uh, cultures, including cuisine or heritage sites or uh, museums, and also uh, some cultural events such as tea ceremonies or sake brewery tours or uh, some kimono uh, testing uh, uh, experiences. So uh, uh, please uh, check it in the uh, tourist uh, pages and uh, please uh, plan your visit. So next page, please. Once again, Kyoto, uh, which has uh, 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 1.4 million uh, populations and the, the uh, temperature is uh, relatively high in October, uh, in the peak more than 20, and uh, in the lowest, even uh, in even in the lowest, you have uh, more than 10. And uh, uh, rainfall is not too much. And uh, Japan is in, o, o, has only one time zone, uh, which is uh, uh, nine hours ahead uh, of uh, uh, global uh, standard. And uh, uh, a uh, city is quite compact, and the city is, uh, uh, was designed in a grid uh, style uh, with square roads uh, across, uh, you know, uh, the uh, from west to uh, east and from north to uh, south. So uh, you can easily walk around uh, in the city. And they have uh, uh, a lot of uh, universities and also these uh, uh, good uh, research and development institutes. And uh, some of the famous companies are based uh, in Kyoto, including Nintendo. So next page, please. Uh, Kyoto is uh, the, uh, one of the most popular uh, uh, cities, uh, even for Japanese tourists. So uh, October is uh, a kind of tourist se touristic season, and they have uh, 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 plenty of accommodations, uh, more than 44,000 facilities, including hotels and the traditional inns and uh, uh, dormitories, but, and they, they have more than uh, 50,000 uh, rooms, but still, uh, the October, uh, uh, we have uh, we expect a lot of people visiting Kyoto. So uh, we recommend uh, uh, to to make your uh, uh, reservation as soon as possible. But uh, of course, uh, uh, you need to plan your visit, and uh, uh, I would recommend uh, to check uh, with your. Uh, 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 tour guide uh, pages on the uh, internet. Of course, uh, we will provide some information on our uh, website page uh, when uh, it uh, is uh, launched. But the launch will be maybe in May or June, so please wait a little bit uh, more. Uh, Kyoto is also equipped with uh, uh, good uh, uh, public transportation, so uh, you uh, you have uh, you. I, I hope you don't have any trouble uh, in uh, uh, moving around in the city. So next page, please. Uh, this is uh, this uh, introduce uh, some information on public transportation. And uh, one of the problems you may have is uh, Japanese economy is uh, still strongly uh, uh, dependent on uh, uh, cash rather than uh, 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 virtual money. So you may need to uh, uh, exchange your money uh, into Japanese yen at the airport or somewhere else. Uh, but we hope we try to uh, to prepare a um, uh, more uh, convenient way to spend your money uh, when you visit, uh, just like uh, prepaid cards or some other ways to pay your accommodation um, and uh, uh, transport. So next page, please. So this uh, shows the overall view of the uh, conference venue. Uh, which is called the International Conference uh, Center of Kyoto, uh, which is located in the middle of uh, 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 nature uh, rich uh, area of Kyoto, a uh, little uh, not far away from the center of the city. 
and uh, uh, easy accessible by subway or any other public transport. And also, uh, they have a lot of accommodations around the venue. Uh, uh, one of them is just across the road. So next page, please. So uh, let me introduce briefly uh, the preparation situation uh, on our side. Uh, our ministry uh, had set up a special dedicated team uh, with uh, uh, design uh, designated members from the private sector. And uh, that is uh, uh, called uh, uh, Japan IGF Task Force, uh, which uh, 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 also includes the members uh, of national uh, IGF team and the national IGF team uh, has been also reactivated for this uh, particular uh, uh, preparation. And we are also preparing a professional uh, a Congress organizer uh, from private sector. And uh, we hope uh, uh, they are uh, uh, efficient enough to welcome all of you uh, in Kyoto. And also we are now preparing uh, a logo mark uh, for IGF uh, to uh, 2023. And uh, uh, we hope uh, uh, we, uh, uh, our team can uh, select some stylish uh, uh, logo mark uh, for the conference. And all information will be uh, available on our uh, website, but it will come in May or June. And uh, in, uh, on the homepage, we will, of course, uh, share uh, information on accommodation, transport, and the visa or whatever. But uh, in case uh, you have questions, uh, please contact us directly. So next page, please. Uh, this shows uh, our uh, some of our main members uh, of the uh, uh, preparatory team. On the left side, uh, uh, our minister Matsumoto is very much looking forward to welcoming all of you. Uh, uh, he is very much excited because his friend is a great master of uh, traditional Japanese tea. And the, the, this uh, tea master is 100 year old, but he's also uh, very excited to welcome guests uh, from around the world to uh, welcome uh, with the hospitality of a traditional tea ceremony. <laughs> that I, I, I think that it's not directly related to internet, but we try to, to what you say, demonstrate <laughs> uh, how we can reach our traditional historical uh, element with uh, digitalized uh, way of presentation. In the, in the middle, uh, our vice minister, uh, Hiroshi Yoshida, uh, who is also the member of the leadership panel, and he's also uh, very much uh, uh, engaged uh, uh, in this work. And on the right side, uh, that's myself, and I'm very, very excited and very happy to work uh, with all of you. So on the last page, these are some of the uh, elements we propose uh, for theme for IGF 2023. Uh, first, uh, global or unfragmented internet for everyone. This is very important, uh, we believe. And second, uh, internet for everyone, a uh, critical infrastructure for democracy. Third one is better internet for the planet, uh, which may uh, imply uh, good for environment too, and internet way of ethics, peace, and civilization. Fourth one is trustworthy internet for the future, a uh, kind of uh, future uh, for, uh, uh, forward-looking uh, team. And the fifth one is empowering multi-stakeholders for future of the internet. So these are five uh, different uh, ways of uh, uh, presenting uh, our uh, uh, emphasis and the priorities as host country. And I, we just uh, wanted to present these uh, for the discussion uh, among uh, stakeholders and the uh, MAG members. And uh, uh, we hope uh, we could uh, see the best way to uh, organize these elements uh, as uh, Common, commonly shared theme for IGF 
for our IGF 2023 in Kyoto. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for the presentation. I just open the floor for anyone who has questions or comments they would like to make in response to the presentation. Okay, there's no questions. So moving right along, we move to the, the um, Secretariat's report. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. So at the end of the IGF 2022 meeting, we did have a um, stock taking at the venue, uh, one of it was um, the session just before the closing session, and then we also had a online call um, for stop taking, uh, which ended, I think, it was the twentieth of last month, and which we invited people to um, write in and tell us what worked well, what didn't work so well, what they want us to make sure that we keep and any suggestions uh, for improvement. Uh, we had um, a total of 51 contributions um, in the online form and um, from all over the globe. And the largest group that um, came in was from the Africa group. Now, the Secretariat did make a summary, um, but I will not read through all the summary, but I would like to invite you to um, download the summary. If you go to the IGF um, website, if you go to the front page and you go to the input documents, and then I think it's the third bullet point, um, in the um, input documents um, that you can see from the input tab. You can go to the contributions. Um, so uh, I would hope that you would um, just scan the document with me and it is divided up into six sections. And um, I will just um, point out some highlights um, from each of the sections, and then we can ask to see if there's anything that they think that um, you think is missing from um, each section that you think it's important that um, we take particular note of uh, when we are planning for the IGF uh, 2023 meeting, whether it is um, logistically speaking or um as a matter of the substantive um, preparations for the IGF um, meeting. So the first part, which I'll just uh, briefly go through, is the uh, preparatory process. I hope you can, most of you have been able to access the document. Can I just have a nod from people here? Yes? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Overall, the comments, I mean, overwhelmingly, not just overall, overwhelmingly in, in general, were very, very positive, describing it as smooth, um, well-organized, and um, to be repeated in 2023. And they emphasize um, where the timeliness of the announcement of the host country, and also um, the clarity surrounding the steps for the uh, session proposals and submissions, and um, it was also said that communications on the IGF website were prompt and instructive. Some suggestions for improvement in specific areas were, and this is what we're concentrating on. We're not saying that uh, this was the majority, but we do want to improve. So we're concentrating on the suggestions for um, improvement. So the first one is, um, a suggestion was made for direct training and sensitization sessions um, for the IGF themes and mechanisms, and in particular for youth, newcomers, and journalists. Uh, 
The second one was um, concerning the program themes. It was felt that they should be selected in a way that is more explicitly involves the perspectives of the um, national and regional initiatives and young people. So more input from the national and regional in initiatives and young people. Uh, there was a need um, for more inclusion of the dynamic coalitions in the program building and, and in the uh, MAG discussions. Uh, it was a suggestion of holding of citizen dialogues for collecting the views of everyday people around the world, especially from the global south, as a way of um, recommending um, programmatic input. There were several calls for greater transparency of the MAG's decision-making approach and rationales. And concerning the MAG meetings, it was mentioned that they should be held more frequently and more frequently in person uh, with advance notice to their dates. It was felt that the uh, IGF themes mer mer merited a longer MAG discussion and further to the above, uh, the MAG should take a more leading role in sessions. Uh, the MAG and the Secretary were also urged to take into account lessons learned from last year's process for this uh, 2023 um, period. So now I would like just to ask, does anybody want to add anything for commenting on the uh, preparatory uh, process? Chris? Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chengatai. Um, good morning, everyone. First time I'm speaking. Happy International Women's Day. Um, uh, th thank you for this. I think there's a lot for us to unpack there. And uh, one question I had um, it, in relation to um, uh, calls for more transparency of the MAG's decision making process, at sort of, and again, speaking as a MAG, I realize this is the open consultation, but I think this is important um, input for us as the MAG. Um, I, I, is that was it specifically about the mag or is it about um transparency of the agenda development process because i think one of the concerns we've expressed as mag is that the parts of the agenda that we determine have actually diminished a little in, in recent years as a significant part of the of the igf agenda which is not determined by the mag so i'm i'd certainly be curious if if there is concern from the inputs we have about the makeup of the whole agenda or whether the concerns are more specifically about the mag's um decision making regarding workshop proposals i stand to be corrected but i do think that this is um asking for rationale on the decisions of the mag especially in the selection of workshops why was this workshop selected than this, that than the other one, and the rationale behind those choices. Um, I think that's what uh, this refers to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Adam. Good morning, Adam Peak, another Mac member. Sorry for taking the community's time. Um, I'd also heard on this topic, uh, people were concerned, they thought that the MAG were, was using the MAG private list quite extensively last year. And while that's not correct, we were not using the MAG private list extensively last year. And I, I can say that and Changatai, if you were, if anyone's concerned, you could probably make a note about it, but I, I don't think it's necessary. But um, perhaps, given that concern, we ought to as MAG have a discussion at some point about when the list is used, how the private list is used, which isn't archived, um, how the list is used, why it is used, and if it has been used. So we could notify uh, the MAG public list that such and such discussion is going on on the private list. Um, uh, the vast majority of times private is used, it, is, it has been, in my experience, when we've discussed the names of somebody or some people who might be a, for a panel or something like that, where you wouldn't really want to discuss 
criteria and qualities about people and and so on on a on a on a public list it would not be correct um but i think if we were um if we just made a note when the private list we was used then that would give comfort to people um even though i think we can assure them we are not excessively using the private list so thank you No, thank you, Adam, and I uh, I totally agree with with you. And that is the purpose of the private list is just not to have a public discussion when we're discussing um, sensitive items such as that that may unintentionally um, cause some people I don't know concern, embarrassment, or for etc. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, we can put that as an agenda item if the chair agrees um tomorrow and the day after for the discussion just to have a, another discussion on this and to make sure that the criteria for use of the private list is um understood by everybody uh, i see Henriette on the Henriette, please go ahead thanks Online. thanks Shangata. can you hear me Yes, we can. Good. And mm -hmm. um, well, thanks very much, and congratulate to to every everyone who worked on IGF twenty two. I just want to one make one suggestion, which is I think addressed in some of the points in the input that you just presented, um, Shangatai, but perhaps not explicitly, and that's continuity. And um, I think that IGF twenty twenty two produced a really excellent set of messages. I think it's really probably one of the best set of messages that we've produced, very substantial messages. And I, I want to suggest that the MAG consider following up on those messages, building on some of the issues raised in IGF 2022 um, in the intercessional work, but also in the thematic development of IGF 2023, just so that we get more into the rhythm of a multi-year approach and creating deeper engagement and more, you know, more in-depth exploration of issues that emerged in one IGF and picking them up and developing them, developing them into the next IGF. That's all. Back to you, Shengatai. Uh, thank you very much, Henriette. Thank you for your input. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone in the room that would like to comment? Yes, please. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair and uh, uh, MAC members. Um, my, my, mine is along the lines of um, number seven, um, where it says further to the above, the MAC should be seen as taking more leading roles in sessions. I think this needs to be really very clear because I remember the last time when we had meetings and where we have MAC members also taking part in some of the workshops and some of the other sessions. Um, I think we need to be very clear exactly um, what the MAC members actually need to do in terms of assisting um, various programs because otherwise um, we may have issues in, a, in particular sessions and there is no MAC member or very few MAC members um, that are in the picture in knowing exactly what it is. So my suggestion is just to, once we have these programs, uh, we assign MAC members to those sessions um, so that if issues arise, those MAC members will be on hand to be able to resolve those issues on time. Uh, thank you very much, yes. And I think this is also uh, something that we can discuss um, during the MAC meeting tomorrow and the day after. Um, if there's no more questions on that section, because we do have uh, five more sections to go, I'll quickly go through to uh, section two, intercessional work and NRIs. Okay, so uh, for the intercessional work and the national regional initiatives, um, Uh, the, the NRIs and their participation in the annum, annual meetings continue to be a, an important aspect of the IGF experience for many stakeholders. And this is where we can get the regional and national perspective coming in to the global um, IGF. And it also enriches the quality of the discussions um, that we have. 
And then also we have the um, best practice forums and the policy networks and the dynamic coalitions, which are part of the um, intersessional work. And this and last year as well was the first year for the policy network on internet um, fragmentation. And this was cited as, you know, for its timely theme and also for its good work. And it goes without saying that this um, policy network was also recharted for this year as well. So that's, um, I think that is very good. Um, so as far as the comments co uh, go, uh, number one, um, despite the impact of many NRIs present in the IGF 2022, respondents asked for greater integration of the initiatives in the intersessional period and as actors in the global IGF program, building specifically, building uh, specifically, the MAG could report in to NRI coordinators on the progress of annual meeting preparations. Uh, two, given the higher number of NRIs and the utility for making contacts that are both significant and informal, it was suggested an extended uh, NRI lunch fair be held during the meeting to allow for a more for more interaction among the initiatives and other participants uh, we can of course follow that up with our host to see if um, uh, that is possible and if we can find uh, some place within the venue and uh, date um, to do that it was felt that the work of best practice forums and dynamic coalitions could be better promoted, particularly the outputs by the DCs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, number four, at a more detailed level, the suggestion was made that the best practice forums and dynamic coalitions brief on their activities uh, on day zero of the annual IGF for maximum visibility. So, sorry, let me just read that again, um, that the BPFs and DCs could brief on their activities in a special session on day zero. Um, and that their work clearly feeds into the subsequent main and high level sessions. And number five, Continuity between different editions of intersessional work was requested as a means to assess substantive progress on issues from the prior year. This could perhaps have a dedicated session. Uh, that's the end of the summarized inputs. Does anybody have any? Marcus? Yes, I got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the right point to make this proposal, but I think as the discussion went and what you just read out, Cheng I think it may well be. I'm speaking in my capacity as co-facilitator of the Dynamic Coalition Coordination Group. We discussed precisely these issues and we would like to make a formal proposal to have hold an intercessional meeting to discuss these point on how better to integrate all the various intercessional components BPFs, DCs, policy networks, and also the NRIs, and to discuss among themselves how to do this. And this also ties in very nicely with Henriette's proposal to build on last year's messages and to discuss on how to take them further. And the point was also made yesterday at the meeting between the leadership panel and the MAG, that maybe the messages should be prepared beforehand, not just at the last minute at the annual meeting, so that we would have a sense of continuity. And the Dynamic Coalition's coordination group feels that such an intercessional meeting could be a great step forward to achieving this aim of a better integration of all the various intercessional components into the main program. Now, we felt uh, it may be held in conjunction with the next MAG meeting, which, if I'm not mistaken, is planned to be held in June. But all that is open for discussion, and we would like to submit that to the MAG for consideration. And we'd also be interested in hearing from 
other members of the community and in particular the various components of the intersessional activities how they would feel about this proposal thank you for your attention thank you and just um curious to take a little temperature in the room um about if anyone has additional comment to add to marcus's intervention um and any any commentary on your views of the idea yes. Vito? Oh, okay we'll take it up uh, yes thank you um, so for the record, I'm Elisa Heaver, MAG member. Um, I, well, I haven't discussed this proposal uh, that's now on the table or seems to be on the table. Um, maybe before we would decide on anything, could we see a bit more or hear a bit more about what, what is being proposed here? Um, so we could, uh, well, make an informed decision or have an informed discussion. Thanks. Yeah, just to be clear, I wasn't asking for a decision or even proposing that we would make one. I'm just curious as to the resonance of the idea within this room at the moment, whether it's something that people would would like to see developed a little bit further. That's all. Well, if I may respond to that, then I, I would be interested to to see and hear a bit more about it. But it's a very brief uh, comment now, and uh, and before we we we. Well, having a good discussion on it, I, I would like to read a bit more about it. Thanks. Other comments or questions to this point? Marcus? If I may get back, obviously, uh, it is our suggestion that would be open for discussion how we would flesh it out. but. As it was noted in the feedback, uh, there is a general feeling that there is room for improvement on the integration of these various components. The DCs in particular mentioned the DCs also feel they could contribute more to the annual meeting, also to the workshops, also to the main sessions. And up to now, it was always a sort of a based on an opting in basis. That if the DCs want to be part of a BPF or a policy network, they would have to knock on the door. But I think we can work both ways. And this is definitely something we feel could be discussed on how better to do this. I think that, and I also noticed it as part of the team involved in the BPF on security. We tried several times to. Uh, log in with the NRIs, but it has always proved very difficult. Yes, we understand everybody is very busy, but we also think we might be able to find a mechanism of how better to do that. And there, I think we feel it would be good to have people in the same room to discuss it among themselves, how this could be achieved. And how this can be done, obviously, would be open for discussion. And we hope that the MAG would be ready uh, to help discuss and find solutions on how to achieve this objective. Thank you. Uh, during the MAG meeting, we are going to discuss intercession activities on Friday afternoon. So we can discuss that then. And we could also, or the chair can also consider whether or not we could form a working group between the DCs and the MAG uh, to uh figure out how best to do that Bruna. thank you um yeah no just just maybe um thinking about uh, marco's suggestion as well something that maybe we could create would be some sort of a place for interaction between NRIs, intercessional groups and, and all of the work. Like we could do like maybe two checkpoints during the year, one before the program rolls out, a second one once we have launched the program, just so we can see like where could things um, fit better into each other. Because I do agree that like some more interaction between them is interesting. Last year we tried with the BPF gender to have like 
better conversations with other intersectional work, but it's, um, I don't know, it, it was much more a matter of time than anything else, but it would be also interesting. Um, I just wanted to also add a comment on the NRI's um, work. I don't think I'm, 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 I remember us discussing maybe the chance of having a liaison with the MAG and the NRI's. Um, so maybe it's one idea for this year, like have one or two dedicated people to like help um, follow this part of the work and just draft back like and, and bring back and forth information and um, inform the NRI network. So thank you. Anyone uh, further comments on this point? Yes. Lucien Castex speaking. Hello, everyone. So um, I was I wanted to comment a bit on the NRI processes, and uh, I'm in favor, obviously, of uh, a greater integration of the NRIs in the preparatory process, but as well of DCs and of BPFs and policy network. First, to discuss, obviously, issues uh, both at the global level, but also at the local levels, regional and national, but also to actually increase participation of local communities uh, to the IGF processes and to improve linguistic and cultural diversity. Um, I would also favor uh, increasing integration uh, of the NRIs in the work of DCs and BPF, as well as policy network. And on that part, um, I quite agree with Bruna. It could be quite interesting having a liaison uh, with the MAG, with people from the NRI network, uh, to actually try making it better, making it work. You know, um, we have quite a great network and IDs, uh, both at the local and global levels, and it could be excellent uh, for increasing participation as well as um, bettering the preparatory process. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We'll have further discussion within the MAG uh, Friday afternoon and of, of course after that as well, if we do establish a, a group to further um, refine and define this. Okay. I'll just go on to um, the third point, which is program and structure. And um, within the inputs, the high caliber and dynamism of discussions were, a highlight of the IGF uh, 2022, it was noted. And this was remarked upon in several inputs and uh, can be attributed to a selection process managed by the MAG that continues to be effective, as well as the preparedness and enthusiasm of the uh, session organizers. Inputs also raised uh, disparate issues in connection with the program having to do with the themes, the, ses the session typologies, session dynamics, and um, the conduct of sessions and structured tracks. So they were synthesized as follows. Um, several contributions converged on the need to make climate change issues a focus of the IGF program, indicating that the 2022 climate focused sessions were too few and that the theme was insufficiently explored. Um, the, the second point was um, the program's alignment with the global digital compact was widely lauded with many insisting it should continue in 2023. One input underscored that the tie in to the GDC could be made more complete with inclusion of an area on digital commons as a global public good. While the spotlight on GDC was appreciated, some input suggested constituent uh, topics such as artificial intelligence or human rights were too broad and encouraging a narrower substantive focus for the program. I suppose within these topics, just uh, narrow it down. The thematic foci suggested for 2023 include new developments in AI, quantum computing, 
green digitalization, as well as data governance, and the way it intersects with internet fragmentation risk. The next point was that um, the further development of the high level and parliamentary tracks was positively highlighted, including their integration of women and different regions. However, it was asked that the high level track be given more session time, that the parliamentary track have a more, more open sessions and both should also engage communities more widely and slot their speakers sooner whenever possible. A separate ministerial track could also enhance uh, the two tracks above. The open sessions with members of the IGF leadership panel was, was a welcome addition and described as very interesting. Specifically, it's discussion on how to make IGF recommendations more actionable for policymakers. More time was requested for the open mic session, as well as the uh, potential for open mic segments per day or per theme. Although the variety of session types within the program could be viewed as an advantage, it was also said that these, ha these had proliferated in a way that made the agenda dense and confusing. And similarly, some suggestions, uh, some suggested fewer tracks for an overall more streamlined program. My tongue is really getting a workout for <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, Roz Kenny Birch, Observer um, from the United Kingdom. Um, first off, I just wanted to say it's fantastic to see everyone here after a successful 2022 UN IGF in Addis Ababa. And we're very much looking forward to attending the 2023 UN IGF in Kyoto. Uh, we thank Japan for updating us today on its progress to organize the 2023 IGF. And we also thank Austria for hosting us. Um, I just wanted to come here because uh, to point out a couple of key linkages between the UN IGF and the broader UN policy agenda that have been alluded to here, um, and also to flag the WISIS plus 20 review process, which will culminate in a debate at the UNGA in 2025. Collecting multi-stakeholder input will be an essential component of this process, and it will therefore be crucial for the UN IGF to feed into this important process, ensuring that that multi-stakeholder input is effectively, effectively captured and directly informs the review. The 2023 IGF schedule may wish to consider a plenary session on WISIS Plus 20 to allow the IGF community to share ideas for how we can all prepare for and contribute to this important review. The leadership panel can also play a key ambassadorial role in promoting the successes of the multi-stakeholder UN IGF across the UN system more widely and in other institutions beyond the UN. It's also welcome that the 2022 UN IGF agenda's alignment with the proposed global digital compact topics, including avoiding internet fragmentation, again, which has been captured here. It is critical that the global digital compact meaningfully takes account of multi-stakeholder views up to and beyond the ministerial meeting scheduled for September 2023. It is also critical that in, it endorses the work of both the UN IGF and the NRIs. We look forward to opportunities to discuss these important processes, both WISIS Plus 20 and the Global Digital Compact, at the annual multi-stakeholder UN IGF this year and at its corresponding national and regional initiatives throughout the year. In closing, multi-stakeholderism, including the key role of the UN IGF as a multi-stakeholder fora, has been instrumental in supporting the development of a global and open internet. We look forward to celebrating the successes of this model at the 2023 UN IGF. And finally, we look forward to further discussion and an update on the Global Digital Compact and would, of course, welcome, as we did in Addis Ababa, the contribution of the UN Tech Envoy in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, good morning. Uh, Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy Group. So, Changatai, at the beginning of your synopsis of the feedback, you know, you had a little bit of people asking, we want more on our issues, and we didn't feel as though that they were included in the program last year. Yet we're hearing from you and Dessa this morning that we need to have a more focused, a more directed, more action-oriented uh, program going into this year because of the Global Digital Compact. So um, I have empathy for the members of the MAG who have to sort of square that, uh, square those two uh, arguments. Um, maybe what I could suggest, and I think it follows along with uh, the intervention from the UK, is um, as part of the Global Digital Compact, we've heard that there are going to be thematic deep dives in uh, eight, possibly nine different issue areas. Um, maybe the hard work has already been done. Maybe that's a, a perfect uh, opportunity for the MAG to follow. And you know, maybe those are potential tracks or issue themes or for IGF 2023 to really make it impactful as part of a, a contribution to the, the consultation process. And the timing of the IGF could not be better for those purposes. Thanks. Thank you. Big chair, uh, Walter Atwis, observer. Um, coming to the, com uh, the comment that I made on specific topics that come back 10 or 20 times in the program. As we are focusing more and more on messages, would it not be advisable to look at, for example, you can expect chat GPT to come up 20 times this year in proposals. What would be the message at the end of, of this session of all these work groups? So if we, as the matter, not we, but I could advise a Mac to add a question, say, what is the purpose of your session? And that will probably allow getting them together into one room, have perhaps two different sessions on two different aspects. But that would also aid the messages that have to come out of the IGF and lead to some sort of conclusion because otherwise we'll be talking about chat GPT into 2024, again, with the same people probably saying the same story. So how can we get more focus to this discussion and then come to a conclusion on the discussion? Thank you. Okay. Oh, hey, online. Go ahead, you have the floor. We'll just give you a six count and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, the unmute thing uh, by the secretary took took also some time. Uh, in any case, uh, thanks very much. Uh, this is Jorge Cancio, Swiss government speaking. Thanks very much for for giving me the floor, and also thanks very much for for the presentations uh, for the summary. I'm very much looking forward to to going to Kyoto. Uh, we made a submission in the stock taking, so I will spare you reading it out. Uh, I will just uh, uh, concentrate on uh, some important uh, aspects uh, relating to, to the program. And the first one would be that uh, uh, another year, I, I think we, we have been making progress, but uh, there is still room for improvement in uh, attaining uh, FIP. And FIP is a fully integrated program. And that the program is uh, uh, streamlined in all aspects, those organized by the MAC, those organized by the uh, Secretariat, those organized by uh, the host country. This means that we use the same tracks the same integrated program, both for the ministerial, the high level tracks, the parliamentarian track, and uh, the intercessional work feeding into the main sessions of the program. So we avoid 
different uh, tags or different denominations for the different uh, uh, topics or issues being discussed. So the first point would be this one, fully integrated program to really make uh, improvements there. A second point uh, also to stress that the global digital compact and its tracks uh, I think uh, provide a good framework for the thematic tracks of uh, a fully integrated program. We can use those tracks. They have evolved a little bit since last week, uh, uh, last uh, year, as we have heard. And we could also integrate perhaps the climatic aspects. So I think the GDC is still a very important reference point and uh, is broad enough to, to cover all the issues that interest us. And uh, 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 following up on the discussion we had yesterday between the MAC and the leadership panel, I think the, that the IGF 2023 would be ideally placed to serve as a venue for hosting uh, discussions of uh, the proposed multi-stakeholder drafting group of the Global Digital Compact. So if that group is assembled in the coming uh, months or weeks as a result of the proposal of, of the IGF, uh, it could very well uh, get together in Kyoto uh, look at uh, the, the work done in the deep dives being organized by the Tekken Boy office and the co-facilitators in the next months. Look at what the ministerial uh, meeting in September has discussed and uh, work on uh, first drafts of the Global Digital Compact. I think this would be a really very specific um, contribution of the IGF 2023 to the uh, larger discussions about the Global Digital Compact. And lastly, uh, two minor but important points. I think that the physical presence of the Secretary General uh, during the IGF in Kyoto would be very important. And for, uh, another point is that the opening of the IGF in uh, Kyoto would be great if uh, we came back to an interactive uh, modus, to an interactive session, perhaps uh, with a round table format, having the Secretary General of the United Nations and perhaps the Prime Minister of Japan, if that would be possible in a round table setting. So I'll leave it by that. And thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, sharing uh, these inputs with you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'm Odas uh, Nyungu uh, from the MAC. So I just wanted to echo a quick point uh, from the stock taking and um, uh, programming and uh, programming structure and content um, around topics that, or the terminologies to, that uh, explain the topics that might be too broad. And here I uh, quoted artificial intelligence and human rights. Um, I would like for us maybe to, to put a specific emphasis on that because um, I think even yesterday during the meeting um, with the leadership panel, for example, um, digital commons as a public good uh, was not specific enough for um, to provide a common understanding for everyone, um, and so as to also manage expectations on the outcome on that. Um, so yeah, just a quick point on on um, uh, I'd, I'd say focusing or or using specific terminologies, especially um, uh, on topics that might uh, represent a wide range of subtopics. I guess. If there's no more comments, I'll go to the next section. Uh, okay, Justin, please.
Um, thank you, Chang Tai and Chair, and, and good morning, um, everyone. I'll speak today on, on behalf of the, the U.S. government um, in the open consultations. But first, just wanted to thank the host for um, IGF 2022 um, and welcome. Uh, have an opportunity to, to have an IGF uh, back on the continent of Africa. Uh, certainly, I think the conversations there took a different nature just by the location, which is really goes to the point of why it's important for um, uh, geographic um, um, representation and rotating the IGF because I think it does bring different elements to the conversation, which is really valuable and, and found the, the discussions there really helpful. Um, also appreciate the briefing this morning from uh, host country uh, 2023 from um, um, a colleague from Japan uh, and really look forward to um, the uh, IGF in Kyoto um, this year. I, I just wanted to intervene. I certainly, um, I want to reiterate the uh, point just made by a Swiss colleague. I think the level of participation at the IHF this year, the United States will certainly support uh, senior representation in person at the IHF. I think we always value any kind of participation, but um, the IHF is taking this key role uh, and a lot of the discussions that are happening in New York. So I think it would be helpful if, you know, there is an attempt to made to ensure high level representation from the UN in those discussions. And the, but the, the comment I wanted to make this morning, I, I know there's been a lot of conversation about the Global Digital Compact and WSIS plus 20 and some of these more New York based um, processes. And I think it is very fair to say that the IGF has a unique role in those both um, the IGF coming from the WSIS and the kind of the conversation around WSIS. And clearly within the Global Digital Compact, uh, IGF is referenced right al alongside the call to develop the Global Digital Compact. And there's been a lot of calls for how the IGF can support that. And we did a lot of work last year in aligning the, the program uh, to the proposals for the IGF. There was some discussion yesterday about not overly focusing on these New York processes. And I think that's a very valid point. Um, uh, the the IGF is not a preparatory meeting for New York processes, and I think we want to maintain, um, you know, the independence and the broader aperture of the IGF community and and engaging on on several issues. I think in this case, there's there, we have the ability to to have our cake and eat it too, because at least the conversations around the Global Digital Compact right now, I think, are just highlighting. Um, challenges that the global community sees within the, the tech space right now. These are not unique to just a UN process. The, the, the conversation is really capturing, I think, what are the big issues that folks are worried about? What are the opportunities that folks are discussing? And I think that is good input into uh, the MAG discussions that will happen later this week about how the MAG can structure a IGF program that is both responsive uh, to those New York-based processes, but also uh, covers the larger aperture of uh, policy debates that are happening around the world. Thanks. Thank you very much, Justin. And yes, I would also like to underline what the UK was saying about the WSS Plus 20 as well. We should also focus a bit on that, but Justin is totally correct as well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the next one is uh, technical matters, including hybrid features. Um, the hybrid nature of the IGF, specifically its extensive virtual access to program sessions and even to side or social events was highly appreciated by the respondents and even those who are participating online. Um, and this also uh, builds on the idea of strong commitment to open and virtually accessible discussions, um, which allowed for the attendance of multiple sessions at once. And the 3D rendered venue of the annual IGF in 2022, um, which was used for the third year running was also described as awesome. And <laughs> nevertheless, some um, challenges related to technical aspects of the meeting were mentioned. Um, th there was also uh, praise for the communications surrounding the event and also for the run-up to the annual meeting. So for the issues on the technical side, uh, uh, there were audio-visual difficulties inside the meeting rooms. 
and um, also in connecting to the uh, virtual platform and uh, the capacity building of the technical staff at the venue would have been um, advisable. Uh, for that point, I also just like to mention that they were actually switching over the, the system from a system that was installed basically in the 90s to a newer, more modern system, which had been delayed by COVID. So um, some of these difficulties are understandable, but the point is taken. Um, yeah. Uh, similarly, issues with Zoom bombings, um, though complex, would, advia, would require advanced um, security solutions. Three, the unreliability of the IGF website on the first day prevented access to sessions for some respondents, slowing loading times, and in some places, uh, uninit unintuitive navigation uh, using made using the website more complicated. And sorry for responding to that again. Yes, we're gonna make sure that we have at least three points, three different websites where you can access uh, critical um, information in case one um, goes down. So that's part of the lessons learned. Um, the IGF mobile app is an excellent feature and could be better promoted. The access to remote links and to the schedule should be far simpler and more direct. The importance of multilingualism, particularly among Francophone respondents, was underscored. It was requested that general communications, whether in promoting the IGF or in its intercessional work, be expressed in more languages. Communication to participants and session organizers should be strengthened to better prepare them for the annual meeting and orient them on the program. More effort should be made to secure the presence of international media at the annual meeting. And the final point, an additional press conference on the final day of the meeting to present the IGF messages was suggested. Hmm. Any questions, comments arising from those? Teresa, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this update, dear Ch Changetai. Um, on the question of the schedule, I would just also like to bring up again that uh, it would be excellent, I think, uh, for us being an event uh, dealing with in internet uh, issues, uh, if the schedule is a bit more intuitive and easier uh, to navigate. Yes, I think there are several aspects that uh, that were confusing, and if we can uh, avoid situations with uh, participants and speakers, online speakers alike, uh, kind of uh, having a really hard time few minutes before the session uh, to figure out how to access the session. Like, I believe this is possible uh, to be eliminated. It should not be a, a rocket science to uh, need to have uh, kind of guidelines how to access a session. It should be much easier than that. Uh, even the visual presentation of the schedule uh, could be um, Yes, uh, a bit friendlier. Uh, it was confusing what time zone uh, the schedule is actually in. Uh, it was it was confusing in the sense that when you accessed it, as far as I remember, like uh, depending on the time, sometimes you had like the middle of the night, you know, and it looked empty, so you had to scroll down. So it just wasn't as intuitive as we could make it. So if we could see how to improve this for this year, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Um, thank you, and, and once again, speaking on behalf of the uh, U.S. government. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for the the work on the the IT issues for the IGF. I know this is always a challenge. I think there, we did see improvement this year. I, I know that there's been some changes to the um, the infrastructure, and so um, you know, as we move to a, a new host country, as we um, <laughs> gear up for another IGF, you know, to the degree there can be stress testing or something to to ensure that on. Yeah, we, we hit the ground running on day zero and there's not the IT. Uh, that would be great. I know it's a, a challenge, but I did want to say um, just on the, the Zoom bombing, you know, I think uh, particularly today on International Women's Day, um, it's important just to note that the kind of incidents 
that happen um, where folks can hack into something is, is completely unacceptable. And I think we need to, I, I don't know um, in your intervention, Chiang Tai, whether there will be these advanced kind of features installed the next time, whether there is that resource coming from the UN. But I think we need to ensure a way that, yes, the meetings are open to all stakeholders, um, but not open to anyone that just wants to come and you know, drop content uh, into a discussion. Uh, and so finding that right balance, um, I think, is important in ensuring the conversations are constructive and not um, destructive. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Justin. Yes, uh, this is something that we are looking at um, very seriously, and we're going to be open with the community, um, with the people that experienced the Zoom bombings um, last year as well, just to see where, and we're also going to be working with our hosts and the um, event organizers for the technical aspects, just to make sure that these are minimized to zero if we, we can do it. Yes, Bruna. I'll be brief, I promise. Um, no, just because on the Zoom bombing note, it's important to put this on the record that most of the sessions that were um, like victims of Zoom bombing were the gender ones. So it really means like, again, the idea of bringing like a better focus or even a more um, general, like uh, an umbrella, like focus on the gender discussions. It's really important here because a lot of the activists that went through that, they were very kind of like, upset with the situation and it's really bad that it's mostly them that were um kind of like um targeted in this situation so just bringing back the gender um importance here uh, exactly i mean i mean these were it wasn't random it was purely targeted and these people had the aim and objective to um do that so we are going to work with it and we are going to work with with the people that experienced it to see what we can do yes. mm -hmm. Thank you. This is Lito um, from the MAG. Uh, looking at the suggestions regarding uh, media presence and coverage, uh, we should remember that the leadership panel has Group A devoted to raising awareness and outreach. Also, I think we can we can all work together. I mean, some people from the MAG also can help in these communication efforts. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Yes, um, we will do that. Um, we don't have any hands up. I will carry on. I know we're supposed. Oh, OK, yes, uh, just one more statement. Uh, we're actually just waiting for um, like this. <laughs> we are waiting for Vint. We are waiting for Vint, and then when Vint comes, we can start the um, the, the, the next uh, session, but please go ahead. Thank you, Shangatai, uh, Lucien Castex, uh, for the records. I'll get my flag in a minute, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I wanted to echo um, the comment you made on multilingualism uh, and uh, um, the discussion on communication about the IGF. Could be quite a good idea to well, we have also the ambassadors, um, the IGF ambassadors helping with the communication, but having it in all six UN languages and try to have MAG members, NRIs and so on, help out in the different languages, in the diversity, obviously, of languages could be quite a good idea um, to further participation and to bring the international press as well as uh, a bunch of media from different countries and languages like the Monde in France and obviously a big media internationally. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And again, uh, yeah, it's a balance that we have to really keep on um, our use of resources. But as you were saying, um, it may be useful to invest those resources for the media um, because that also brings up the visibility of the um, IGF. Clearly, and the, the, NRI net, uh, the NRI network could clearly help out on that. Yes. Oh. Hello, everyone, and sorry for being late. It was quite an adventure coming here because uh, France is in, in, on strike. Um, so <laughs> I've been dragging this suitcase for a while. Um, 
I just want to say that, uh, you know, it, it, as marvelous as it was, you know, and I appreciate the work done, you know, by the IGF uh, uh, Secretariat. There's one thing that uh, I think it needs improvement is the communication with the general public. Um, it's quite uh, um, striking that uh, some of the decisions that are made and some of the conversations that are held in the scope of the of the IGF um, are so um, I'd say uh, deeply, um, uh, so deeply affect uh, um, life, you know, everywhere, but still um, the general public is not very aware of what the IGF does and how it, those decisions are made and what comes out of this and what is the follow-up process after that. So uh, I think that that's one area that, uh, that could uh, um, have some improvement. And in terms of media, um, one of the things that UNESCO has is the contacts with, uh, with uh, um, journalists and media organizations around the world. So we would offer uh, some support in this area as well, you know, uh, helping to publicize and uh, elevate this, this uh, visibility of the, of, of the forum. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Mary Elizabeth. Uh, we have somebody online. Um, Ereza. Hi, uh, this is Ayreza Salenejot from the UNESCO Chair on Cyberspace and Culture. I appreciate the work of the IGF is doing. Concerning the fact that 2023 is regarded as the year for open science, I was wondering if IGF could uh, have probably work on that area of open access and open science and perhaps address uh, the concept of internet and media and information literacy. Uh, thank you for that suggestion, and we'll put it forward to the MAG to discuss on um, during the MAG meeting portion on Thursday and Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any last comments from anyone out here? Yes. yes. Um, I just would like to emphasize the importance of the experience of participate participant in, in the conference. So um, I came from digital government where we put a lot of emphasis on uh, life journeys and how we will make sure that the journey is easy and you think about it in advance. Uh, one example of that is is the individual plans for each one. If we can utilize the mobile. App uh, that people will will uh, organize their 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 sessions upfront, what they want to attend and what type of questions they they want to ask. And I understand this technical capability is there, but probably need more of enhancement of look and feels. And I think this is a good opportunity to, uh, yeah, make everybody is is happy and uh, has a seamless experience uh, during this. Uh, event. Uh, thank you very much for those comments. If you want. Um, mobile app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the next one. And I think it's the second last one, um, which is other logistics and the host country's uh, role. Um, the approachability and helpfulness of the volunteers and the very good security arrangements on the premises of the Economic Commission for Africa, ECA and the outstanding social and cultural events organized by the host country Ethiopia were among the most memorable and enjoyable aspects of the uh, 17th IGF. Um, the holding itself of the forum in Ethiopia was cited numerous times as having facilitated high level participation from Africa and invaluable discussions relevant to African stakeholders. So here are some of the comments for improvement or for us to take note of in our planning of the 2023. Um, some concerns were expressed at the foreseen cost of travel to Japan and urged more extensive financing options for Global South participants. Um, acquiring a visa to travel to Ethiopia was not straightforward at all and steps for obtaining a visa to Japan should be clear and communicated as early as possible, especially for participants from the Global South. 
the meeting registration process was said to have been onerous with too many steps involved. A streamlined procedure should be put in place. Number four, um, signage to the rooms at the venue was lacking and scheduled, scheduling of room changes posted to digital signs were not promptly updated. This should be better managed at the Kyoto IGF to prevent participants getting lost. The placement of the IGF um, village was suboptimal. Its distance from the main venue meant that there was little natural flow of participants to the village area and relatively low attendance at the booths as a result. However, the village's dedicated zones spotlighted traditional Ethiopian crafts um, that were interesting and well executed. The location of the lightning sessions at a remove from other meeting rooms similarly inhibited the expected level of participation and this should be carefully identified at the venue in Kyoto. I don't know whether or not we want to put um, uh, if you have any comments. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you very much for asking, and thank you very much for a lot of recommendations. Yeah, we will uh, pay uh, our full attention to the points uh, in organizing and arranging our, our venue, and also we will be in close communication with the Secretariat. Mm -hmm. I see um, online we have um, Claire. Yes, uh, thank you, Claire Melanie Popino. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor. It was uh, on the previous point. Um, I would like to, to second the, the comments made by uh, Lucien Castex and uh, UNESCO on the importance of the languages to reach out local communities. Most people haven't heard about the EGF, and I, I think really that mother tongues are, are the way to reach the general public and the, and the press. Uh, thank you uh, for Japan uh, and um, to organize uh, the future uh, IGF and uh, um, I'm looking forward to, to, to go to Kyoto uh, soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And anybody else? Who, any comments? I'll give that a six count and go to the last. Okay. Mm. Participation and um, stakeholder engagement, including uh, UN processes. Many inputs underscore the excellent participation of youth and much improved participation of women at the 17th IGF. And as noted in reflections on the overall program, the alignment with the GDC was a specific and critical sign of the IGF's stronger engagement with UN processes. Looking ahead to the 18th IGF, um, respondents sought a furthering of the above and made a few new suggestions as follows. The notable presence of youth could be improved and built upon in a few important ways, including ensuring their visibility and participation across the program without siloing them into a youth track, um, selecting young people as the banner speakers or chairs of sessions, especially youth oriented sessions, including adolescents in youth activities and specifically young people from the Asia Pacific region ahead of the IGF in Kyoto. It was felt there should be much wider outreach to legislators to encompass regional, national, subnational, and city parliaments and assemblies. The third point, business leaders in particular, those from big tech companies must as a priority be engaged in the IGF process and at the annual meeting. It was urged that, this is the fourth point, it was urged that the MAG and IGF leadership panel work closely together intersessionally to ensure continued congruence of the IGF with the GDC, 
our common agenda more broadly and the WSIS plus 20 process in 2025. Closer cooperation of the IGF with the UN Tech Envoys Office was also recommended. To prepare for the summit of the future in 2024 and the GDC in particular, it was said that the IGF should seriously weigh how it can respond to the outcomes of the GDC's ministerial meeting in September of 2023, incorporating this as a major point of discussion at the annual meeting. Uh, sixth point, it was suggested that the IGF 2023 schedule include a session for reviewing progress with implementation of the IGF plus recommendations of the roadmap for digital cooperation and the expert group meeting EGM that the IGF hosted in March in 2022. Finally, in the context of the above, some comments advised oh, for the EGM. I also like to thank Finland for actually hosting us. It was it, it was hosted at the um, mission in Finland in um, New York. Um, finally, in the context of the above, some comments advised using and closer adherence to the outputs on IGF improvements produced by the MAG's working group on strengthening and strategy. Thank you. That's the end of uh, have comments. That's Chris. Thank you very much, Chris Buckridge, uh, MAG member. So apologies. <laughs> um, I thought it would be worthwhile mentioning though that in relation to the points made about youth participation, um, there is some work currently ongoing in the MAGS working group on strategy to better connect and coordinate with the youth, youth track coordinators and the work going on in relation to that. Um, I, I think there's, that youth track is doing very well and is, is, is um, providing some very important input and bringing young people into the IGF, but there's perhaps a feeling that there could be some more formalized um, youth representation or youth um, advocacy within the IGF structures, so including the MAG, and perhaps it would be useful to have some um, youth considered as part of the diversity um, metrics for selecting MAG members going forward so that we have some people who on the MAG who are very personally and individually engaged with uh, youth IGF and IG participants. Um, so I think that that's something we'll discuss in that working group, but I would encourage any um, youth uh, who are engaged in this process and in these discussions um, to also join us in the working group strategy, working group on strategy and strengthening the IGF um, to inform our discussions there and help us make progress. Thanks. Thanks. Joyce? Thanks very much. Um, Joyce Chen, for the record, I'm taking off my uh, hat as a MAC member for the moment and putting on my hat uh, as a staff from APNIC. Um, so APNIC is the regional internet registry. We are, of course, looking after the internet number resources in the Asia Pacific region. And, and as such, we're very excited um, that the IGF is coming back to the Asia Pacific region this year. Um, I want to underscore the importance of the feedback that we've received about engagement and participation from the youth, from different stakeholders, especially from within the Asia Pacific region. And I'd like to share that APNIC does have plans for capacity building this year, um, for activities leading up the road to IGF in Kyoto. Uh, and we do welcome partners, um, any form of participation or support uh, for these activities. Uh, we'd be happy to work with you in any way. Uh, so, you know, do come to me if you have some ideas you'd like to share. We, we usually have activities for youth, uh, for, and this year we're also planning something perhaps for government representatives in the region, uh, and we'd really love to um, have your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, to for the record, part speaking as a private person, but also as a dynamic coalition coordinator, internet standards, security, and safety. First point is that we worked extensively with the youth coalition group on one of our research programs on education skills, which you had the report uh, presented to in uh, in Addis Ababa, and they 
delivered excellent work for the content that we were looking for on the, on tertiary cybersecurity education. So that's an example of how this sort of work can integrate. The second point is that I put off my Dynamic Coalition hat is that I was in Katowice in the youth session where they could have presented for the whole week, obviously, on the work that they've been doing in all the months working towards Katowice in 2021, the youth. And I left the room totally surprised, amazed by all the wisdom and ideas that came out of this session and out of their working groups. And then I wondered what has been done with all this work. So they should be at, at a minimum part of the messages of the IGF, which they maybe are, they maybe not. I'd, I'm not certain about that. But what I think is important is that they've been working on this topic for months and they're obviously very, very clear on how to communicate their ideas. So where is the tie-in with the work in the rest of the week? So if there are workshops tying in with their topics or the other way around that they are told to prepare these sort of topics, then you can put them on the panels and not just leave that to the session organizers, but the session organizer told you get this person on your panel. And that way their messages come become more part of the whole and probably a part of the messages of the IGF at the end of the road, because in hopefully all the ideas coming from the youth work is something which is inspiring for the people in policy, for the people in industry to start working with. So I think that that is a way of integrating youth better into the IGF and make use of the knowledge they've gained in the six months working up to Kyoto in this case. So thank, thank you for listening. Emilia? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is... Oh, thank you for letting me to uh, turn on my camera. Uh, my name uh, is Emilia Zalewska. I am the coordinator of the Youth AG of Poland, and also I work for NASC, National Research Institute. And first of all, uh, thank you very much to the previous speakers for the support uh, they expressed to our young people. And also, especially, thank you, Vote, for the very kind words about the Youth IGF uh, Summit in Katowice, which, as Youth IGF Poland, we had a pleasure to prepare together with people from young people from all over the world. Uh, my comment is uh, maybe a bit from the technical side, but I thought it is a good time to mention it because uh, it is also a uh, concern about the representation. Uh, what Vote mentioned is that uh, it is important that young people are present not only at the day zero at the youth summit and during the youth track they prepare, but also at the whole IGF at other sessions. And today I had looks. Uh, I had a look into the statistics of the IGF, and I didn't find that there would be any statistics about how many panelists were young people, or how many panelists were female, uh, or how many panelists were uh, representatives of different stakeholder groups. So my thought would be that maybe it would be interesting to. Uh, gather this kind of data to check if in this area of how many particular stakeholder group or gender group, uh, how many representatives of this group were present not only as participants of the whole IGF as passive participants, but as panelists. So people who got a dedicated spot to speak uh, are uh, were involved in the IGF in the current years. So we could also observe if there is a progress in that matter. And I guess it would be an interesting data to have a look into to see if there is a true representation of, for example, young people at the, uh, as the panelists uh, in different kind of workshops or other sessions at the IGF. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, online, we have Kuzefi, I think, and apologies for the name pronunciation. 
uh, it, it, it was very correctly, I mean, pronounced it. Thank you, the chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Visa Hadidvan. I coordinate the chat with IDF. Uh, sorry, I couldn't make it to Austria, but uh, I'm very happy to see all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to highlight I mean, a few important points in terms of connecting the connected uh, communities, which is still I mean, a challenge for global rural communities, and particularly in the sub-Saharan countries. I would love if the, the MAC can integrate a specific panel on that so government will talk to us about, I mean, their capacities to uh, invest more in infrastructures to connect these communities. Uh, secondly, uh, as said by one of our colleagues earlier, the presence of the UN General Secretary is very important, but also the, the other UN, I mean, organisms is also, I mean, important to see around in, on different panels. Uh, I want to remind the, the MAC the necessity to invite all the government, especially those from Africa, the ICT ministers to actively participate at IGF meetings and especially the annual meeting because today we know what the civil society is doing, I mean, in these countries, but unfortunately all these efforts are not recognized by the local governments. We cannot spend a whole week or a whole year working in something that I mean, the government will not recognize and it is not doing also, I mean, its role to, uh, uh, to, to, con to contribute to achieve, I mean, the, the, the goal at um, IDF. Uh, so why if we can organize it, I mean, a panel dedicated to the ICT ministers, so everyone of them will come and talk to us about their local issues and how they see to collaborate with other stakeholders in promoting an inclusive ecosystem to find common, I mean, solutions. What the IDF, I mean, can do to contribute to, to help them. And uh, about the youth, uh, I think few points were highlighted, very important, but uh, as I said it in Malawi during IDF last July, and even in, in Ethiopia, I think it's very important nowadays to have at least one seat during uh, among the, the IGF uh, uh, members because having someone who is under than uh, under 20, 35 is good but we need someone who will be I mean taking care of youth I mean uh, uh, how they can uh, the problems how I mean uh, the person will be in contact with uh, uh, other stakeholders to talk about the future of youth in terms of uh, participating uh, during the IGF. And I would like to finish with uh, the issue of visa. How can we, I mean, uh, promote a very easily uh, getting visa as we do in the other, I mean, uh, United Nations meetings. Everyone who has like uh, an invitation letter is automatically something will lead to uh, having a visa to participate at the meeting. If we can do it, it will be very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments? Thank you, Paul. Um, now, just to build up on Emilia's comment, I remember that um, in 2020, the Best Practice Forum on Gender, we, did, we tried to do a deep dive on um, gender diversity at the IGF and, and things like that. And just as she commented, um, she commented like one of the points that we reached was that more disaggregated data was needed in, in order to be able to fully assess the, the gender diversity across the IGF. And, and this in fact is something like a lot of the, the community has been saying for a, for a long time now. But just um, my comment was more on an urge um, for both the host country and um, the ones organizing the main sessions and the high level track and also the parliamentarian track is that we do need to at least try to achieve a 50-50 kind of parity between genders. Um, for the speakers at the IGF, last year's high level track was really bad in terms of gender representation. I know we had a lot of um, last minute confirmations and things like that, but it would be really important to send a good message to the community and not just have all male panels or like panels with just one woman in a moderator role and then things like that. So just adding this as an urge for us to once again, to try to have gender as kind of this transversal approach or, or things like that. And maybe Emilia and many others 
from the community can help us um, achieve that. So that's all. Thank you both. Anyone else? We're just discussing, we're waiting for, for Vint to, uh, before going forward. And the idea here is now we'll take a short coffee break. Um, I assume that goes well with everybody. So take 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 15. 15. We'll take 15 minutes and come back and, and proceed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we take our seats, please? Uh, Mr. Kuma, Karina, can we take our seats, please? Hope you all got your coffee or tea or whatever. Um, so this is their opportunity to interface with the um, chair of the high-level panel, Ben Sir, and uh, to have a little discussion of the strategic options, the, the strategic goals for the lead for the uh, panel and the IGF and I'll turn it over to Ben. Uh, thank you very much Paul. I apologize for being so late. Um, I don't know about you but if you spend the entire day in meetings like this email piles up uh, and for two days so I spent <clears throat> until now answering 48 hours worth of email. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for allowing us to join you today. I can tell you that the uh, leadership panel uh, is uh, completely dependent on the outcomes of the IGF meetings. And so your summaries uh, and the uh, important points that you um, conclude, um, insights that you're able to gather and then uh, and then document, are the input to our work and our purpose as uh, uh, Minister uh, Edstadler said yesterday is to try to be a bridge from the observations and recommendations that you make to places that might not otherwise hear what the IGF has had to say and so the panel if you've looked at the uh, list of participants uh, is a very broad spectrum of people with connections to other parts of the uh, policymaking world that doesn't necessarily interact uh, with the UN, for example. So it's, there are some of these uh, parties, like uh, Maria Fernanda, who's sitting next to me, participate in the IGF, as well as uh, being deeply engaged with the business community through ICC. 
But uh, many other organizations are less familiar uh, with the IGF's work, even though they are so very dependent on the internet. And so we think it's important for them to recognize uh, what it is that makes the internet work and what it is that might interfere with the successful operation of the internet. And so our purpose is to amplify those messages that come uh, from this organization uh, and to try to uh, explain to them why they should care. There's a, a phrase uh, that has been going around uh, for a while called the internet we want. And uh, yesterday in our discussions, we came, I came in, I don't want to blame the rest of the panel for this, but I came to believe that that expression wasn't quite right. That what was more important when you're talking to someone uh, who is dependent on the internet, but doesn't quite know uh, in what way, is to tell them, this is the internet you want, and this is why you want it that way. And that's the kind of message that I hope the I, leadership panel can in, um, convey uh, to these various institutions. So we have a, an outreach um, panel or an outreach uh, subgroup, uh, and we have a subgroup that's concerned about funding for the IGF operation. We have a subgroup that is concerned about documenting and um, providing principles to those people who need to know which internet they want. And our, our uh, intent in today's meeting anyway, for me anyhow, is to listen, uh, although I gather that I'm also supposed to answer questions, so I'm happy to do that as well. But I want to thank you and the Secretariat, especially for all of the hard work that you put into this, all the preparations that go on all year followed by the frenzied uh, meetings that we will have uh, in Kyoto. Uh, I can't tell you how much it means to me, having spent 50 years working on the internet, uh, to see the amount of effort uh, and enthusiasm you have for making it a better place. So I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman, but uh, happy to answer questions if I can. Thank you. And so this is an opportunity for the assembled people here to ask questions and provide input. And so does anyone want to go first? Yes, Jim. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Vint. Uh, good to see you again. Um, thanks for coming. Yesterday, the, the MAG and the leadership panel had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, wasn't open to public observation. Could you just share sort of what happened during that meeting and sort of your takeaways from it? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. And those of you who participated, please feel free to jump in and uh, refine anything that I say. First of all, there was clear interest uh, in the uh, MAG to interact more with the leadership panel. And so we concluded that we might have a liaison from the MAG uh, for each of the four working groups that we've established to carry out our task. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, uh, offer that opportunity. Second, uh, we're going to share our documentary work, including uh, work which is still in progress. So the whole idea here is to have uh, an opportunity for MAG members to comment on our work and vice versa. As you organize, I don't know how you do this, but somehow you manage to organize this gigantic uh, operation. And so we'll have an opportunity. Uh, we'll have an opportunity also to, um, in, you know, to interact on the topics that are, are selected. Uh, for discussion in Kyoto. So there's uh, the result of that meeting, I think, was a conclusion that there should be more collaborative interaction between the MAG and the leadership panel, and I'm happy to invite that. Uh, Maria, do you want to add anything to that, Maria? Yesterday, uh, at the meeting with the MAG, we... we um, we talk about the way we foresee the the, the role of, of the leadership panel, which is more of an ambassadorial role. 
for us. Uh, and just like in the same traditional sense of ambassadors that they uh, represent their own governments in foreign nations, the panel members will be supporters of the IGF within our stakeholders, communities, and at the various international processes that we are part of. And the IGF will benefit from this open, bottom-up input of the global multi-stakeholder community to develop its numerous outcomes uh, from the messages that we receive to the, from the IGF to all the various reports and, and success stories of partnerships and projects that are forged in here. And we definitely count on the support of the MAG and the IGF Secretariat to help transmit and tailor the numerous IGF outcomes as relevant to a specific interest of the audiences each of us uh, interacts with. So I hope that uh, helps clarify Thank our view. Thank you. We have Giacomo online. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, my question that I put also in the chat was for Bint. Um, as we had been requested um, in the uh, in the exercise of the intersessional work for IGF 2022, uh, in the PNMA that I had the honor to co-chair with Sonia. Um, we, in the final recommendation, we suggest some uh, that the leadership panel could eventually try to follow up with some of the recommendation and some of the suggestions we have provided in the final document. Um, how this could be implemented? Uh, how we can give a follow a concrete follow up for that? Because this, of course, will prepare the way for the work of the PNA in 2023, and of course, will prepare the next IGF in Kyoto. Thank you. Well, I certainly uh, take that as a, uh, an actionable uh, recommendation. I think we'd be happy to try to organize around that. One thing that uh, did come up yesterday uh, that I found very intriguing is the thought that we could try to interact more with the regional and national IGF uh, groups. Uh, we're trying to split up our modest resources. There are only 10 of us plus the uh, ex official members, so we can't go to everything. But we're, I think we're very interested in taking advantage of intersessional activity, uh, not only to shape our own thinking about uh, how to uh, fashion the messages that we deliver to uh, various institutions and organizations, but also uh, to try to reflect on what we're hearing uh, from more local uh, interests in the internet. Uh, as we get together in the international forums every year, uh, it's important that we also get a sense for what it's like in each locale. My impression uh, from my own travels is that internet doesn't necessarily look the same everywhere you go. People access it using different technologies. They have different quality of service uh, and uh, different costs and therefore different um, opportunities to uh, to use it. So I think we should all learn from that. So thank you for that suggestion. And Christine? Um, yes, thank you. This is Christian Arida um, representing the government of Egypt. Um, so I would like really to thank you for for being here with us. I think it uh, it's uh, very important to have this encounter uh, on a regular basis. And um, I, there are two things that I would like to mention. Um, so there there is an interesting regional diversity within the leadership panel, and I'm happy to hear you mention the NRIs because I see I see a lot of value in uh, members of the leadership panel reaching out towards the NRIs um, within their regions uh, uh, because they could provide a lot of support simply by you know connecting the dots with the relevant stakeholder groups within those regions. Um, I can see a similar role, um, um, uh, a thematical one in terms of reaching out to dynamic coalitions, um, again, within the stakeholder groups. So uh, reinforcing those uh, different uh, vehicles that are there within the IGF intercessionally would be very important for the IGF. Um, and uh, I sure would hope to see um, uh, meetings like the uh, open consultation today become uh, more popular. I think they used to be more popular than that. Um, and I think that's something we uh, 
we should be focusing on because if we can't really reach out uh, beyond uh, the smaller group that is just the Mac Plus, uh, we're definitely missing a lot on a lot of voices. Um, having said that, uh, the discussion that we've had yesterday regarding the GDC, I think uh, there's a mutual interest for the Mac. Uh, and uh, the leadership panel to position uh, the IGF um, in a very uh, uh, strategic way within everything that is happening on the global arena, whether it be it the GDC or the WSIS Plus 20. Uh, and I would say that this is very crucial uh, for um, strengthening the IGF within uh, the coming, let's say, two years. So thank you for that. No, thank you very much. Uh, two th two things to say, and Maria, if you want to jump in, just tap me on the shoulder, <laughs> hit me on the side of the head. Um, two things. First of all, um, there are more of you than there are of us. And so one thing that you can help us with is uh, is to, as you participate in various NRIs or as the other colleagues that, uh, that are part of the IGF family, uh, we would like to have a channel for, uh, for uh, incoming from people who are working on NRI uh, and other intersessional activities. So I hope that we can make that channel uh, flow freely, just like we want information to flow freely in the internet. So that, that's a, an ask for help. Uh, the second thing on the GDC, uh, it is a focus of attention right now, understandably so. Uh, but one thing I have come to believe is that we should be careful not to depend solely on uh, that one focus. Uh, for getting our messages across. So we are we will be preparing uh, and we'll share with the mag the text of, of our contribution uh, before the end of this month. But uh, I want just want to remind everyone that there's a lot uh, more going on besides the GDC and we don't want to lose track of uh, how important it is to be visible uh, in other fora as well. Uh, so not to say anything negative at all about your, your recommendations, but I don't want us to be so narrowly focused that we miss an opportunity. Maybe, Maria. Yeah, maybe if I um, could go a little bit uh, deeper on the what our, our subgroups are, are, are laid out to, to do and the specific works of them, it could help you understand how we see uh, the approach of working with you together and why we consider it so important to work closer with the MAG. And the first group that we set up is the Awareness Raising and Outreach Group, who aims to promote the IGF itself and its outputs. And such an outreach should be done strategically and streamlined per target audience to amplify the benefits of joining and engaging with the IGF and to provide substantive considerations on digital policy matters, which require us to work in tandem with you and very, and very close and contribute to each other's processes. This group, um, the group on funding, which is the, the, the third group, will depend on the leadership and experience, obviously, of the IGF Secretariat and the UNDESA and the support of the IGF donor community. And this uh, panel can take advisory role, provide insight and discuss opportunities across the community. The MAG is an invaluable asset to act as a multiplier for our outreach and in the, in the group of inputs to the IGF and the liaison with the MAG aims to establish an open and transparent channel for two-way communication between the two groups, both facets of our mandate to strengthen the IGF and to provide sustainable considerations on digital policy matters requires us to work in tandem with the MAC and contribute to each other's processes. And uh, the group on substantive, substantive considerations in terms of addressing strategic and urgent issues aims to create a joint narrative to describe as has been put it, the internet you want and everybody wants to list and describe the main principal issues we consider paramount in line with the overreaching IGF messaging for a whole open, free flowing, safe, trustworthy, and rights respecting internet. And throughout all of this work, we will consistently advocate for preserving the multi stakeholder model of the, for internet governance. 
This narrative will be the further enhanced with targets, indicators, and metrics under each category to provide guidance on how to achieve the principles. And this should be developed together with the multi-stakeholder community taking advantage of the IGF's unique convening power. This work will be point, as, as Bean was just mentioned, beyond the global digital compact. But the core elements are very much the same. Developing the internet we want, you want, everybody wants, will take longer than the time we have to provide uh, input to the ongoing consultations on the compact. What we can do for now is to adapt the IGF's existing messages into a contribution. And here again, the input of you, the MAG, will be of crucial importance. Thank you. Maria Leza. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, uh, um, Mary Pontes. Um, I, I'm cycling back to the, your initial comment about uh, the importance of communications, because that was exactly the first comment that I made as well uh, on the fact that uh, we, this is the 18th year of the IGF, and uh, I still have to explain to people what the IGF is uh, and uh, what what it does, and uh, and the only time it actually pops up in the media is mm -hmm. during a forum. It really doesn't reach people in terms of uh, how important these processes are and how people are affected by them and how they benefit or not from it and how can they engage with these processes and channel their ideas. So uh, I'm delighted to see uh, that there is a, 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 an outreach awareness raising outreach group um, in there. And, uh, and uh, my question is, should perhaps the MAG consider a working group on visibility awareness raising that would interface uh, with that, you know, uh, with that? What structures in the MAG would be helpful? And how do we tap into this ambassadorial uh, um, uh, role uh, that the leadership panel has in order to really, you know, uh, um, enhance people's understanding of how the internet is governed and, you know, what kind of a, of a um, effect that that has in their lives, you know, so thank you. So I think the first step uh, is to establish liaison uh, parties uh, between the MAG and the leadership panel for each of our four groups. <clears throat> and I think we can, we can do that in consultation uh, with your chair. Uh, I think the more interesting question that you raised, though, is how to get more visibility for IGF in different fora. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that um, we are taking all of the written material from 2021 and 2022, we're trying to boil that down into succinct messages that um, we can call talking points. And uh, we're finding that boiling that down, and we will share with you what that um, distilled uh, summary looks like. I think we are also, well, I am anyway, concluding that even when you have those talking points in place, you have to, depending on the target that you're trying to get to, you have to make those talking points relevant to them. This is back to the internet you want and why. So uh, we could use your help, I'm sure, in uh, uh, helping to tailor some of those messages for various target audiences. And I hope that you don't reach the conclusion that the leadership panel is the only means by which you can gain visibility. Uh, I would reiterate, there are more of you than there are of us. Uh, and you have uh, visibility in uh, your national fora uh, or regional fora. And so it's important that, uh, that we all uh, take on the responsibility for making the IGF a more visible activity and more relevant in people's minds. But thank you for those suggestions. Justin. Uh, thank you. And good morning, Vin. Um, yeah, just picking up on this this comment about the uh, ambassadorial role, uh, and also kind of building on the comments about visibility. Uh, we we did have a conversation earlier this morning about you know a targeted effort to uh, increase the level of participation in the IGF in Kyoto this year, and and perhaps an important first step is to promote uh, the UN itself, the UN officials to participate both at the expert level, which I think many do, but also at the leadership level. And it, it was positive uh, last year, IT Secretary General Bogdan Martin and the Tech Envoy uh, Under Secretary Jill and, and some other uh, UN leaders were there. 
but I think as the the leadership panel is doing outreach to you know kind of non traditional partners and 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 groups and entities, it would be helpful to promote that that uh, actual participation in the IGF in person uh, is is it would be great, uh, including the Secretary General uh, if if uh, he can make that trip, um, and then just related to that. Um, I was just curious if there was any feedback from some of the meetings this week uh, with, again, non-traditional UN uh, agencies uh, about, you know, what they would like to see for the IGF or any questions they have, which might inform, you know, how we approach the IGF uh, this year. Thank you. So, first of all, the uh, topic of having senior leadership in the UN appear and participate in the IGF did come up. Uh, there's a great deal of eagerness to have the Secretary General appear we're not sure that we could uh, guarantee his personal appearance but i think we might be able to uh, argue for at least a virtual appearance to show uh, his interest and concern after all he set up this leadership panel in the first place and it's not unreasonable for us to say uh, you know hey boss uh, would you like to uh, hear what uh, what we've been doing for the last year or so and say something to the assembled igf uh, similarly, I hope that Amandeep uh, can come and speak to the GDC as an example, and certainly uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin would be uh, a wonderful spokesperson as well. Uh, there are other parts of the uh, UN that are, although they aren't directly involved in the internet, they they, they depend on it. Uh, maybe even if they don't under, know that. And so having others, FAO, for example, uh, participate would be good too. So I take your point and we will make invitations. Did you want to add something to that? Yes. I, I do have some of the topics that came up uh, regarding the, our priorities uh, or what was laid down as a priorities for the IGF 2023. It was a universal access and meaningful connectivity in particular to discuss how to facilitate continue and substantial investments across the entire digital value chain, infrastructure, application and services built on top of that uh, infrastructure uh, capacity building and skilling to ensure end users ability to use uh, devices and understand the features of applications and services. The second issue was uh, cybersecurity and trust, in particular to discuss how to mainstream cybersecurity for the global development agenda and support capacity building programs. And the third one is uh, it's not the unique, the, the more that we talk, data governance, and in particular to discuss trust in data, data flows and the technologies and services built on data, as well as how to minimize disruptions in data flows, which are fundamental to reaping the benefits of digitalization. And other considerations uh, that we propose for the IGF 2023 programming will be concentrating the IGF program into a small number of thematic track in, uh, in tracks in 2019 and 20, did that and was very welcome idea and translate well into the final program of the of the IGF. The 2021 and 2022 editions seem to move away from this precedent and the, the idea of having three, four, but no more uh, thematic tracks should be maintained and going forward to help streamline the agenda. Uh, and second, aligning workshop proposals on the thematic tracks works well. Efforts should be strengthened to align other sessions that are part of the official IGF program, as well as pre-events under the themat same thematic tracks. A reinforced communication campaign could be helpful ahead of the workshop proposal process to ensure uh, those new to the IGF are aware of the various possibilities to be actively involved in the upcoming IGF well in advance of the annual meeting. And finally, this should also include information on the possibility of proposing other types of activities for the IGF program that are not suitable for a workshop format for example, networking, publication, uh, launch, hackathons, et cetera. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could uh, interrupt for one second. Uh, as I listen to Maria, it occurs to me that we could take the uh, internet you want idea and let's apply this to IGF for a second. Imagine, uh, nobody knows what it is. What's the IGF and why do you care? 
that is probably a theme that we can develop. And of course, it will have to be specific to the interests of the various uh, groups that we're trying to address, which is why parsing the targets is really important in understanding what they care about. Uh, but I kind of like this idea of uh, repeatedly trying to introduce the IGF as well as the internet uh, and, uh, and why they should care about that. So Mr. Chairman, please. Thank you, uh, Mark Cartel. Online, Mark. Yes, thanks very much. I, um, I'm trying to put my uh, video on, but I can't do it somehow. Anyway, um, first of all, just to explain that um, I'm a member of uh, Euritix Support Association, the European Regional IGF, and I'm also a policy advisor for an IGF Dynamic Coalition, ISCC. Internet standards, safety, and security, uh, and so, and I've been following the IGF almost from the beginning in my previous capacity as a uh, government policy advisor for the UK. And I, I just want to make the point that the IGF is at a point of transition. Uh, we following the uh, the experts group meeting and the high-level panel on digital cooperation, all those recommendations about strengthening the IGF. And my, my question to, uh, to Vint and to colleagues in the leadership panel is, uh, I've heard in recently about the leadership panel having a contribution to make to more strategic thinking about the IGF and how the transition to IGF plus, as we uh, have been referring to it, should take place. Um, so what will be the mechanisms for the leadership panel to engage with the secretariat and with the uh, with the MAG in moving forward the transition so that it is becoming a more impactful forum that uh, the communication strategy that you've just been talking about now uh, is uh, fully worked out and resourced. And I mentioned in, in the chat that uh, one issue, of course, is the funding resources that are available to the IGF. A number of governments have always been committed to supporting uh, the budget of the IGF through donations, and there have been private uh, sector contributions and individual contributions as well. But uh, the I hope the subgroup that you mentioned with Vint with regard to the budget will look at this seriously because um, there needs to be much more financial resource available for the IGF to uh, implement uh, the uh, transition to IGF plus uh, to undertake more effective communications and uh, and and. Uh, uh, support intercessional activity much more effectively than in the past. I'm thinking in particular of the um, dynamic coalitions, uh, some of whom are working hard, including the one I, I work for, IS3C, to contribute to IGF outcomes, but we, we don't have any funding mechanism to support that important work. So there are a lot of issues here about um, uh, the strategy for the IGF and moving forward. And uh, I hope the leadership panel will be able to contribute to these discussions and uh, in, in, import the expertise that you all have on the panel uh, to secure a, a, a fast and effective transition that will place the IGF in a good position ahead of the WISIS plus 20 review when the mandate of the IGF uh, will be uh, reviewed and the future of the IGF will be determined. The transition should therefore take place at a uh, at a rap rapid pace ahead of that key juncture in the in the uh, in the future of the IGF. Thank you very much. I hope my questions are clear. Thank you. Uh, your questions are very clear. Uh, yesterday there was a, an expression that said the answer is money. What's the question? And uh, for many situations, that's exactly the right formulation. Let me suggest to you that the leadership panel, uh, at least speaking for myself, 
hopes to be part of the plus in internet in IGF plus. Um, its intent in part is not only to deliver your messages to parties that might not otherwise have heard it, but to persuade them that they want to be part of the IGF. They want to come and participate in it. Uh, a measure of our success might be the diversity and growth of the parties that come to the IGF meetings and contribute to it. Uh, Maria is in a particularly interesting position because she is representative of the business community. And uh, when you think about available resources, governments, of course, are one place to look, but the business community is another place since they benefit from building and operating businesses that make use of the internet that you and I uh, create and operate. So uh, part of our task, I think, is to stir up an understanding of the value of being part of the IGF discussions uh, and even to say to influence the course of the internet so that it is attractive to the business community to participate. And I think that uh, anytime the business community recognizes an opportunity to improve its business opportunities, um, that they are often willing to put resources uh, and uh, and representation into it. And so uh, we're back to uh, that other theme, which is what's the IGF and why do you care? Uh, we need to tailor a message that draws uh, parties in that haven't been part of the discussion before. Uh, we also we recommended to make a benchmarking among other UN organizations that are already engaged with the private sector in in this type of of funding because the 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 rules that apply for the IGF are are not the same as in other organizations, for instance, uh, for the COP. Or, or sustainability issues where they are more open to, to private sector participation. So we need to review that in order to be able to, to, to bring in all of this funding from the private sector. Thank you. There's a question over there. Yeah, there, I've got a queue running here and we're actually supposed to break for lunch. And so I'm gonna ask for no objections if we go for another half hour. Oh, wait, there is a... I'm sorry, uh, there is uh, a funding uh, thing that's supposed to start at one o'clock, isn't there? No, no, it's started at two. Oh, it two starts at two. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so we're good for yeah. to one thirty. Thank you. Yes. And okay. which your, your, your name is on the queue, so we'll call your name. Yeah, so Henriette, you're next. Henriette, are you there? The problem is finding the unmute button. <laughs> okay, let's move to Chris and uh, Henriette. If you if you're online, you can come in as next. So Chris. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, thank you, Vinton Maria. I, I just wanted to offer. Um, I, I guess some of my own thoughts, sorry, Chris Buckridge, MAG member, um, on the, the meeting yesterday. Though I did want to first um, just respond to Maria's point there about the, the different rules for funding. And I think that's a really important issue. I think it's something that has come up in the past, but has not really been addressed. And in talking to some private sector folks in the last, last year and sort of encouraging um, their contributions, I, I've heard those, those um, perspectives that, that there are rules in place that make it difficult so I think addressing that and if the leadership panel can really bring this to the attention of whoever it needs to be brought to the attention of that would be really useful um I, I as I say I think the the meeting yesterday was really um a, a good spirit and a, a good sort of approach of um collaboration and cooperation and I think uh, Vince's point about the well the, the leadership panel's point about the ambassadorial role but not being the only ambassadors for the IGF is a very important one. Um, but I do think that the leadership panel has a quite specific ambassadorial role. And what, I think the the term that I heard most yesterday, um, beside a, besides the very memorable um, statement about um, ambitious guinea pigs 
on the leadership panel um, was a was a characterization of crisp messages um, that that Vint made a number of times, and I think that's a really important point for us to take on board and to consider as a job because I think reflecting what some other people have said here and which I think is really important there is important input coming from the NRIs there is important input coming from the intercessional activities whether it's dynamic coalitions or best practice forums or policy networks there is important input coming from the IGF workshops and the main sessions so what we have is a very large amount of content coming in and we have a task of winnowing that down into crisp usable messages for the the leadership panel and i think we should not underestimate the challenge of that and the importance of doing that and the way that we will do that both to meet the requirements of the leadership panel but to also retain the ownership and the the sort of legitimacy of those messages is to work between these organizations to facilitate the leadership panel working with members of the mag working with others in the the IGF community and I think we took some important steps yesterday towards operationalizing that including the liaisons to the different different groups there um so I think we need to now act on that and move forward but I think some really important steps yesterday and thank you for that Henrietta are you there Why does this begin to sound like a seance where uh, you're waiting for the ghost of someone to appear in the atmosphere somehow? Henriette, if you can hear me, I hope you can find the mute button and unmute yourself. Okay, we'll 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 try again, uh, Elisa. Thank you. Uh... Paul, um, and uh, thank you, Vint and Maria, for um, for your observations and and, and sharing um, a bit more about what we discussed yesterday. Um, with regards to sharing, uh, you mentioned that you would be sharing the 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 crisp uh, or the the, the brief uh, IGF messages um, that or talking points. Um, I was wondering what would be the timeline. Um, in sharing them and would you also uh, want mag uh, input or input from the community in in these um notes and um for the second part also uh, i'm sorry i'm i'm yeah. as i get older i discover my push down stack gets shorter and so if you ask me two questions the only one i'll remember is the second <laughs> one so i'm going to start with the first one if you'd be so kind uh the answer is we can do this in the short term uh those messages have been boiled down to a proposed uh, set of crisp observations and with, before the end of this month i'm sure we can make those available uh so um uh, that i can that takes care of that and it, it we're certainly open to your recommendations and suggestions for uh making those more refined uh, one thing i will uh, say though is that we're going to have to figure out how to take those crisp messages and then adapt them to the audiences that uh, that we're going to because their relevance may vary anyway what's the second question It was just on um, about uh, also the GDC uh, input. Um, uh, what would be the timeline in sharing that as well? Um, and do you intend it to be a, a leadership panel um, contribution to uh, the GDC or um, like a broader leadership mag uh, contribution or IGF? I don't know. Um, just maybe if you could clarify a bit more certainly that. thanks uh it, I think that it was um we were among the parties asked to uh, to respond and so this will be a leadership panel contribution uh two of our groups had uh, put together uh their drafts and we're going to combine those and make a contribution we'll have that finalized uh by the 20th or so of this month and so happy to share that well Cool. Uh, thank you, Vint and Maria, for the whole presentations. Uh, also, yesterday, where I was not allowed to speak as not my MAC member. My name is Walter Natris, and I am the coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition Internet Standards, Security, and Safety. Uh, there's no coordination with Mark. I didn't know he was going to ask that question. Um, there, I think that 
progressing from Addis, where we asked you how could we cooperate in the future? There's now an open invitation to cooperate, and I thank you for that. So there are some practical questions I would like to ask. Uh, I have four, so I'll do one <laughs> at, a, at a time for you. But the, the first one is how do we share our reports with you as dynamic coalitions? Because uh, we've made an inventory last month on what to expect this year, and it is an extremely long list from all these different dynamic coalitions, which I think we can share with you. But there's also reports coming out later in the year. So how can we share them with you, but also how can we assist you with making the crisp, to, to, to quote Chris, the crisp messages that we can share and make for you so that you actually have something to work with. So let, let me start there and then look at the other side, the other side around. Oh, uh, the Secretariat uh, is going to, uh, has already created a place for us to accumulate not only our uh, productions, but also other materials coming from other sources. So if you go through the Secretariat, uh, uh, hoping that uh, Chengatai is in agreement with that, uh, those things can be passed on to us in a place where we can all get our hands on them. But I do want to emphasize uh, once again that, that we all have full-time jobs in addition to our roles on the leadership panel. Uh, and second, massive amounts of input are actually less helpful than considered well-crafted and crisp messages that you think uh, need to be emphasized. So uh, we beg your help. Uh, it, burying us in documents will not do you much good because it will be hard for us to do exactly what we need to do, which is to boil those down into um, chunks that are meaningful to uh, the parties who will hear them. So uh, I see you're nodding. So thank you for that. You're muted. I'm muted because you're <laughs> because you're uh, on. Yes, thank you. Um, the second one is: Can we reach out to you to ask for help to get input from communities that are hard to reach sometimes when you don't have the right the right door to knock on? And the second one is: I heard you say yesterday that perhaps dynamic coalitions could assist the leadership panel with tackling some questions. So yes, speaking for my own dynamic coalition, if there's interest there, then we definitely can take questions into the research that we're doing. So that's an open invitation from, from us. So, um, how, but can we knock on your door to, to as a sort of a resource to, to knowledge basically? So uh, two things occur to me. Again, I want to emphasize that A, we're only 10 people and B, we have full-time jobs. Um, in, in my own defense. However, uh, if we can help introduce you to organizations that you wouldn't normally have access to, I think that would be a very valuable role for the leadership panel to uh, provide. So thank you for making that suggestion. I hadn't thought about that particular channel. So uh, yes, we can do that. Um, so if you, uh, if in fact, it should go the other way, too. If we know of organizations that should hear more about the safety and security uh, opportunities that there are or challenges that lie ahead, that's another direction, too. So feel free. Jorge and then uh, Teresa. Thank you so much, Paul. I hope you can hear me OK. Yes, we can. You have to go. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so great to to seeing you all there. I wish I, I would be able to to be in Vienna, but uh, next time I hope we uh, I can be uh, with you. Um, I, I just wanted to to share two two ideas we suggested yesterday at the bilateral meeting, which I think uh, um, spurred a, a good discussion in the meeting and uh, which go uh, in the direction of proposing very concrete uh, ways for the IGF to, to be part of the overall discussion of uh, the GDC of the Global Digital Compact. The, the first one is to uh, propose uh, as uh, quickly as possible that the IGF uh, uh, serves a, as a platform and forms a multi-stakeholder drafting group that would prepare uh, the Global Digital Compact uh, uh, very similarly to 
how the working group on uh, internet governance prepared the discussion on internet governance between the two phases of WISIS um, <clears throat> back then. So that's one possibility of uh, including a multi-stakeholder uh, um, uh, group uh, based on, on the stakeholders we have in the IGF and of improving the ownership of uh, the larger internet governance community uh, regarding the, the product of the global digital compact. So that's one thing for, for the process of creation. And then uh, if we don't want the global digital compact to, to be just a paper that will be forgotten uh, after it is signed, I think that uh, the Internet Governance Forum is the best place to serve as a follow-up and evaluation mechanism of what is in the Global Digital Compact. And uh, that would also something that we could uh, propose as IGF to the co-facilitators to, to consider, because it, it would be really a shame either to leave the GDC in a, in a drawer and forget about it, or to create any new uh, mechanism to, to do that follow-up when the IGF already exists, is established, and is a perfect place to do that internet governance uh, discussion. So uh, I'll leave it by that. Hope uh, this is helpful. Thank you. So this, uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind my uh, responding. First of all, thank you for both of those uh, points. It occurs to me that uh, the GDC will be most, I'm being trapped by my own headset, uh, the GDC will be most beneficial if it has executable stuff in it. Because if you sign it and say, we will adopt whatever is in there, one of the questions is, what does that mean You know, in a, in a concrete way? If there are concrete actions that the GDC implies, then the IGF, with eyes all around the world and uh, uh, seeing the internet as it manifests everywhere, could help us figure out whether or not any of the GDC provisions actually got implemented. And uh, one of the things that I think I probably said this yesterday, and I certainly said it many times before, one of the things I've always hoped that the uh, Internet Governance Forum could do because of the fact that it's so diverse and, and global in scope is to help us, not just the leadership panel, but all of us uh, understand the state of the internet where it is almost as if we have a way of, it's Stanford has an internet observatory, for example, the IGF could be its own observatory in many respects. So uh, if there are actionable elements coming out of the GDC, it would be wonderful to be able to point out annually how well they, uh, these things have been implemented. So uh, I think those, those are uh, the propositions that you've made are in fact quite uh, actionable. Uh oh, don't let them get away. Power supply problem. Hey, Teresa, you get the last question for lunch. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Mr. Serf, thank you also. Uh, coming back a little bit, building on what Jorge said and uh, Alisa uh, with her questions on also the timeline uh, and the sharing uh, of the inputs of the leadership panel on the Global Digital Compact. Um, as you might be aware, or not as you might be, as you are aware, <laughs> uh, also shaping the previous year's IGF, uh, kind of the themes of the GDC were really taken into consideration uh, to frame the IGF also as the possible uh, kind of place uh, where, where to discuss related issues. Uh, the MAC working group on strategy of the IGF is very, very busy uh, and in a very uh, devoted way uh, involved uh, in uh, in discussing uh, the Global Digital Compact and, and the role of the IGF. My, my colleagues can speak about that more. So my worry a little bit after your specification uh, that the leadership panel submission would be the leadership panel submission uh, to the consultation process is wouldn't be a little bit confusing uh, to the community uh, if there are kind of inputs coming from the MAG, inputs coming from uh, from the leadership panel, and would it not be worth uh, considering some uh, some kind of coordination in this matter? Thank you. 
Well, I think we thought we were coordinating by taking uh, the inputs uh, that had been published, uh, results of the um, IGFs in 2021 and 2022, and then using those to frame our contribution back to the GDC. But I sense that that doesn't sound adequate to you. Do you want to amplify on your message a little? Maybe what I can suggest uh, uh, to have uh, very soon a discussion between the working group on MAG working group on strategy uh, with uh, with you and those of you involved in drafting of the messages might help in this respect. So uh, let me distill from your uh, suggestion an idea. One of the things that we might want to convey to the people who are putting the uh, the GDC together. Uh, is the idea, I think I'm repeating what you said, the idea that IGF is where the signers of the GDC should consider participating uh, because that's the best place to get a vision of how is the internet doing. Uh, that sounds consistent with where I think you were headed. So perhaps that's one way for us to capture. I've had no problem with some interactions between the, uh, the strategy panel and welcome that. But the specific uh, idea is to suggest in the GDC contribution that the IGF is an important place for those who are signing the GDC uh, to commit to participating in. Uh, sorry, last comment. Uh, which is where I believe that we are in this together, because this is the this is the Mac intention and reflects the discussions we've been having here as well. That raises an interesting question because the GDC is still, uh, I would say, very um, unformed, not uninformed, just unformed. And uh, the, the parties who are trying to put it together are uh, have engaged in a pretty broad consultation to try to figure out what components would be broadly uh, accepted uh, and and adopted. So uh, that's still to uh, to be seen. Um, what I do wonder is whether the document will give opportunity for those who sign it. And by the way, it's supposed to be signed by nation states, member states. I keep thinking maybe others should be able to adopt the GDC recommendations as a commitment uh, of engagement. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be possible because of the way it's been framed. Um, but I do like the idea of making it attractive for uh, member states to see IGF as another place where uh, they can influence the course of the internet. So let's talk more. Thank you very much, and and thank you to everyone who asked a question or paid some commentary. Uh, we have lunch now, and uh, we're back at three o'clock. Enjoy your lunch. So we're trying. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can we start taking our seats, please?
Uh, could we start taking our seats, please, Mr. Marcus Kumar? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a good lunch. Uh, we'll start the second half of the open consultations day now. And I'll just hand it over to our chair, Paul Mitchell. Thanks, Jingita. I'm going to hand it right back to you in just a moment. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. The, the, this session is um, to take a look at the um, inputs that we've received up to this point in time, and we can have an open discussion on overarching themes, main title ideas, discussion on the, the, the 18th IGF program structure and how it might impact the current uh, year, um, beginning all this with a distillation of the feedback that's been um, produced and the inputs that have been produced up to this point. So I'll turn it over to Changatai to uh, run us through that. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And so the first thing I'll do is a slight technical problem here. I will just um, wait for the computer to reboot. Uh, Eleanor is going to give us a um, summary of the inputs received because the we did issue a uh, open call for thematic inputs where we asked our stakeholders um, what themes they would like to see um, this year um, at the IGF. And so Eleanor is going to um, present that report shortly. And after that, we're going to take another look at the um, suggestions for the overarching theme. I mean, there's two ways we can do that. We can do the sub-themes in the overarching theme, or we can look at the overarching theme. And uh, our host country has made um, five suggestions uh, for their overarching theme. Um, so that can form the basis of our discussion, plus what has come in uh, from our stakeholders. And then we can discuss and finalize on the overarching, well, not finalized, but have a discussion because the finalization is going to happen in, um, tomorrow and the day after during the MAG portion. So today we are just garnering input um, from the stakeholders. So the people who have the um, priority to speak today will be non-MAG members then followed by the MAG members, and then during the course of uh, Thursday and Friday, then the MAG will review what has been said today and um, come with a consolidated um, view on what the main themes and the sub-themes will be. 
So I think I've talked now for three minutes and I'm just um, looking ahead. Um, we know these things happen, um, that we do have uh, technical difficulties sometimes. Mm. Okay, all yours. Okay, I'm very sorry about the wait, everyone. I hope you can see the uh, the slides on the uh, on the screen. Okay, so I have actually discussed a little bit the thematic inputs process in a prior uh, MAG virtual meeting, so I'll try not to take up too much time being uh, repetitive here. Um, but uh, in short. Um, we ran our annual um, thematic inputs process uh, and received uh, inputs from 194 stakeholders, um, roughly the same number as uh, last year, 191. Um, so a, a pretty um, a healthy uh, volume of, uh, of inputs. Um, most came from um, the African region, uh, which can sort of be expected considering when we hold an IGF uh, in a particular region or country, um, those stakeholders stay engaged. And then when we run a public process, they um, they, they tend to be very responsive. Uh, and the uh, second uh, most popular regional group was um, the Asian regional group, uh, also to be expected since we are holding the IGF in Japan this year. Um, a slight improvement in our number of uh, female respondents. Um, last year, we had 35% who were female. This year, 41. Um, in terms of the stakeholder groups who responded, um, the most uh, popular group was uh, civil society, followed by private sector uh, and then governments. We've discussed a little bit in the past about some difficulty in getting uh, private sector and government input. So it's good that um, these were uh, toward the, uh, the top of the uh, responses. So looking at the uh, thematic areas, um, the most popular theme was cybersecurity followed by emerging technologies and universal access. This is actually, these were actually the, the uh, three most popular themes last year too, so probably not a, uh, a big surprise. Um, however, things get more interesting when you look uh, inside the actual issues constituent to these themes. Um, so um, if you uh, look at cybersecurity, the most popular is child online safety, uh, emerging tech, artificial intelligence is the most popular by a mile, uh, universal uh, access, um, access and connectivity is the most popular under data governance, uh, data privacy and protection. Uh, sorry. And then under digital cooperation, uh, cross-border cooperation on, uh, on um, especially on data issues, we'll see that later. Uh, and then environmental sustainability, uh, climate change, um, probably not surprising. And then under rights and freedoms, uh, children's rights online, uh, sort of tracking with the most popular uh, issue under cybersecurity, which was child online safety. Uh, under economic issues uh, and development issues, uh, digital health, uh, there seemed to be quite a bit of interest in that this year. Uh, probably related to COVID, one can logically surmise. Uh, and then um, under media and content, content policy and regulation, uh, under technical topics, uh, internet routing. Uh, and then we took a, a deep dive uh, into what the regional preferences were for all of these themes. Um, we focused a little bit on Asia, given that uh, the IGF will be held in Japan in Asia, and we expect a lot of participation from stakeholders uh, in the region. 
uh, you'll see that the three most popular overarching themes are cybersecurity, emerging tech, and economic issues. Um, these track with uh, what uh, the kind of global uh, um, uh, globally popular themes were, except for economic issues, the third most popular there. If you looked across all of the uh, all of the regions, the third most popular would be universal access. So we see that economic issues are slightly more important for Asia. So here, looking at the issues inside the themes, um, what's notable is that uh, in three out of the six regional groups, artificial intelligence is the most popular uh, issue. Um, and then looking at the uh, looking at the other regional groups, uh, you have data privacy, uh, international cooperation on data. Uh, and data localization. Um, so, and then data privacy is actually the second most uh, popular issue in both Africa and Asia in two of the regional groups. So in three out of the six, artificial intelligence is the most popular. And then in another three out of the six, it's issues related to data. So I think that's our, our kind of high level um, takeaway here is that data related issues and AI are really floating to the top of uh, people's interests. Uh, in addition to asking stakeholders' views on what themes the IGF should cover, um, we asked um, you know, how the IGF should relate to major global initiatives or global agendas, specifically um, the UN's um, big overarching agendas, uh, our common agenda, um, and the, uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, I think there are some, uh, we think there are some sort of high level takeaways uh, there too. Um, I'm not gonna read the individual suggestions of which there were uh, many for, for both, of these, um, both of these agendas, but across both what we see is that um, respondents want um, these to be integrated into the IGF's intercessional work uh, and at the annual meeting, uh, either with uh, dedicated sessions or, um, a thematic or track alignment. Um, we also heard um, we also heard this in the stock taking process. I think that came out pretty clearly, um, and that uh, many want to see a continued tie in with the uh, with the GDC. Uh, also related to this, um, many said that. Uh, there's already a lot of uh, convergence between what's being done in the intercessional work and these agendas, and that this could be uh, this could be better highlighted, uh, especially with regard to uh, our common agenda. The GDC actually falls under our common agenda, but respondents said that there are um, many themes um, that the IGF community is dealing with that uh, go beyond the GDC and they relate to many of the twelve commitments in the uh, in the common agenda. So picking up some uh, or picking out some specific uh, and varied inputs uh, in response to these questions, um, respondents also said that they would like the IGF to play uh, a, cent a central role in um, rapidly developing digital and emerging technologies, um, like all the developments happening in AI right now, um, to hold multi-stakeholder consultations um, with, uh, with stakeholders uh, on the 12 commitments in, uh, in OCA or on the SDGs. Um, and under the umbrella of the SDGs um, to discuss, for instance, um, the role of ICTs and women's empowerment uh, or and perhaps um, less discussed or, or newly discussed issues like um, sustainable business models and sustainable automation. And um, finally, we also asked for ideas on the overall format uh, and design of the IGF. And here we see a lot of similarity with what was received in the uh, in the stock taking process, uh, in particular requests to streamline the program, limit uh, limit sessions, limit tracks, uh, go more in depth on certain issues and themes. Um, and also uh, not just to engage youth, but to engage youth uh, in, uh, in, in different ways and in more visible ways, um, and, uh, and really to engage uh, the business community and in particular um, uh, big tech companies. 
So that um, that concludes our our inputs into the thematic process. Uh, thank you very much, Eleonora. Um, th this presentation is available um, on the inputs on the IGF website. So if you um, do go to the front page um, under input documents, and I think it is the it's the fifth uh, document in the line. So you can um, open it up and um, look at it. Uh, Do we have any questions? Yes. Um, Amrita. Amrita, please. Thank you, Changitai. Amrita for the record. Um, I was interested, uh, Eleonora, in the updates which came from Asia Pacific. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, switch on my video. I'm at the airport. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, emerging tech um, uh, economic issues uh, to be the issue and the other one. Um, sorry, I forgot. But I was kind of interested to know which countries from Asia Pacific you re you received the inputs more from, because when we look at it at APR IGF, access is one of the concerns which people raise. Uh, so, um, you know, Asia APAC being very diverse with very developed countries and LDCs. So that could be an interesting um, understanding as to who, which countries um, actually spoke about economic issues more. Thank you. Yeah, we did have quite a few submissions from Japan, logically, and I think that there there probably was some tracking between um, the uh, um, the Japanese submissions and, and the interest in, in economic issues. But we didn't do a detailed country by country study, so um, I could you know I could double check that and, and get back to you if you would like to know in more detail. Thank you. No, it's, it's just that with it, when we look at it from APR IGF, the comments which we receive are slightly different. So I was very curious on it, but thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any other questions on the inputs? And these inputs are a guide, right? They're not, um, we're just using them as a guide to show what's the, interests are in the topics hmm. okay if we don't have any other questions um maybe if we can just put up the um the five suggestions just to um refresh our minds from the presentation that our host country gave us today Sorry, I didn't warn you in advance, but um, it's right at the end of the presentation. I think it's the last slide, yes. Uh -huh. So we have um, just a reminder before we start a discussion of inputs on um, themes. We had um, the first suggestion was global internet for everyone. The second suggestion is internet for everyone, a critical infrastructure for democracy. Uh, third suggestion is better internet for the planet internet ways of ethics peace and civilization and fourth is a trustworthy internet for the future and fifth is empowering multi-stakeholders for the future of the internet so these are suggestions for the overarching theme for igf uh, 2023 and with that i think we can open the floor for discussion um based on the um, input and also on the suggestions, and then we can just start to see where we go. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. so this is the opportune time to to knock this out and get some, some detailed feedback and 
and make a decision potentially. So floor is open. Yes, from basis. Thank you, Chair. Um, if that's okay, we'd like to contribute to the themes and issues that's part of the agenda. So by way of introduction, my name is Mania Nassasialu, and I'm a digital policy advisor at the International Chamber of Commerce, where I support the activities of ICC's business action to support the Information Society Initiative, as known as BASIS. So with regards to the themes, issues, and strategic approach to consider for IGF 2023, we would like to bring forward the following key considerations. Firstly, we would like to strongly encourage the MAG to focus and streamline the agenda for the annual meeting. This will help to give a clear direction for the discussions, make time for deeper conversations, facilitate reporting, and not in the least, make communication and marketing of the IGF and the annual meeting easier and more impactful. In 2019 and 2020, this approach for a more focused set of tracks worked very well, and we recommend concentrating the IGF themes into ideally three, but no more than four overarching themes to ensure a lean and easily manageable agenda. We would also like to highlight the importance of leveraging the IGF's work and the discussions we have here to inform debate and contribute to the work of major international policy forums such as the G7, G20, the GDC process and others to enhance the relevance of the IGF agenda and outputs. Uh, with this in mind, we would like to also suggest the following three topics as priority themes of the discussion that ICC basis also noted uh, in our contribution to the call for thematic inputs. Uh, firstly, we have universal access and meaningful connectivity, focusing in particular on access and user capacity development and scaling on digital inclusion. Secondly, on cybersecurity and trust to discuss how to mainstream cybersecurity for the global development agenda and support capacity building programs. Thirdly, the IGF should also address data governance more holistically, focusing on building trust in data free flows and developing safeguards to minimize disruptions to support the global digital economy and the social and central, I'm sorry, social and governmental services. Thank you so much. Thank you. Utah. Utah. Yes, <clears throat> Utah Kroll, former MAC member from Germany, civil society representative. Uh, I really uh, appreciate that we have uh, such huge and important uh, uh, themes uh, from the Japanese government. Uh, from my perspective, I'd say that uh, we should have a, a main theme that focuses, that is not too much dispersed. Uh, although I like the third one, Better Internet for the Planet, uh, with uh, Internet Ways of Ethics, Peace and Civilization, it's a bit broad from my perspective, and I really appreciate that we have human rights and democracy uh, in the title of the main theme. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, L. Johnston. Thank you for organizing this. Um, data, AI, and governance would be a focus of a rule of law thematic session. Uh, the UN has presumed to make decisions for more than 1 billion humans represented by their original institutions that pre-exist states. And the UN undermines its own charter and impairs its ability to To, plan, to respond to planetary crises because it has not fulfilled its obligations taken up at the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. The internet, which is controlled by the world leader in exterminating Indigenous Peoples, was created by forcibly appropriating the wealth and knowledge of Indigenous Peoples and is used to perpetrate violence. The internet demands the resources of indigenous peoples, but rejects the governance of indigenous peoples who made its development possible. So rule of law governing this anthropogenic driver of planetary crises should be a priority in the discussion. Thank you. We have Rosalind. Thank you, um, Rosalind Kenny Birch, Observer for the United Kingdom. Um, the 2022 UN IGF included a wonderfully rich array of important topics linked to internet governance. 
We appreciated that the 2022 UNIGF aligned with the themes of the Global Digital Compact, including avoiding internet fragmentation. We are pleased that the Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation will continue its important work in this area in this regard and welcome the network's progress thus far on creating a framework as a tool for defining and discussing that concept. The 2023 IGF is an important opportunity to continue to build on this important theme and push it forward. The 2023 IGF also presents an important opportunity to discuss many key issues uh, linked to internet governance in addition to internet fragmentation. For example, the potential to focus on universal access, a key priority if we are to bridge the digital divide across the world. Promoting digital cooperation goes hand in hand with access to the internet. If access is to be meaningful, people must be able to use the internet in their own languages and scripts, and also be empowered to engage in internet governance fora. We would welcome the opportunity to discuss topics such as broadening stakeholder engagement in internet governance, the IGF's role, and how the multi-stakeholder model has helped us all to take advantage of the innovation, access to knowledge, and other opportunities presented by the global internet to date. Finally, it was excellent to see, as we've alluded to earlier today as well, such a rich presence of national and regional initiatives at the 2022 IGF participating and leading a range of sessions. We saw various members of the IGF community linking up to their local NRIs with many attendees inquiring about ways to get involved in their respective regional and national initiatives throughout the week. We look forward to the 2023 IGF further building on the diverse participation in 2022 by including more youth and people across uh, geographic regions. And we also support the ICC's comment to keep um, the themes focused um, and as we discussed um, earlier today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Matthias? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you very much, uh, Chingatai. And I would like really to personally thank the also country co-chair and Japan, because we know that you're very keen uh, on innovation and new technologies. And we are, I think that uh, it's a really a good and a marvelous opportunity for uh, uh, to, to gather all the world to, uh, to show how the innovation can be positive and, and can be boost in uh, our world. And uh, also, I really thank for uh, your themes that, that you suggested because uh, they are always the theme that, um, you know, it's the, it, they are ongoing every year on, uh, on the IGF, but they are incredibly, they are uh, incredibly uh, actual. And uh, I think that they are very important that has to be discussed. But please let me just suggest one thing, sir. Uh, in order that what uh, Vinda van der Chef said, that, that uh, we need uh, some media, we need to be uh, concrete, uh, we need to give the mainstream uh, on the media. And so it means that, uh, let me be a bit, uh, uh, a bit brave, just to go just step, just a step up a little bit. Uh, I think that we, we should talk about the uh, the subject they are really at the moment important. I mean, we know, we all know that uh, artificial intelligence must be trustworthy, ethical, human centric, everybody knew. And uh, this is a discussion that began uh, five, 10 years ago and keep on going. And it's really important. We cannot miss. But there are some problems with artificial intelligence. I mean, we all know the chat GPT. Uh, I think that everybody is going to use it. And everybody can really benefit from the child LGBT, but there's a pro there, there's a problem there about the human rights there, about the, the, pro the uh, rights of property there. I think that the IGF could say something about it. Maybe it's just try to put on the table just, just to discuss or the human rights on a metaverse. This is a, this is a real important aspect that really will will affect our life in the next few years. But when I say next future maybe in the present future. And really, I think that as Japan is one of the country that, that has the power to sustain this team and as a power, just because it's a really huge country as a real independence, to be a little bit brave and just to take about this kind of topics that uh, in a sort of way, they put the 
topic that are all the uh, main topic of the IGF with the topics that are really ongoing and uh, they really affect our personal life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to take the floor? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Peter, the, the head of uh, Emerging Technology from the French Development Agency as an observer today. So uh, I've been listening to the discussions and thanks a lot for the propose, uh, proposal on a theme for uh, the forthcoming IGF in Japan. Uh, looking at the themes uh, one to five, uh, I think they are all very, very interesting. I'd like to uh, support what my dear friend actually talked from about. I think it is important for us to look at some of the current issues. Um, I will propose probably uh, one, one potential theme could be looking at responsible emerging technologies and the future of democracy, right? And it seems to include most of the things that I'm seeing from one to, to five. Um, Concerning ChatGPT, I think it raises a lot of debates, right? So it's not only on ChatGPT, it's also on chat, uh, search engines, right? Uh, Google has been there for long. We all use it for so many things. So ChatGPT is just adding another flavor to it. So I think looking at responsible design and use of emerging technologies and the future of democracy can play a very important role. And when I talk about the future of democracy, I'm also looking at issues around disinformation and misinformation, which um, covers, can, can play a very significant role uh, in accelerating transitions towards the SDGs. It has issues around that. So that's, that's what I can put on the table. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, basis. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is Menin Siavu on the record from the International Chamber of Commerce. So first of all, we would like to thank um, the hosting country for all the uh, suggestions, which we find very interesting, particularly number four and five. Um, and might we add a small um, reformulation suggestion for number five, just to make it more inclusive um, to something uh, along the lines of empowering all stakeholders for a shared digital future uh, as a suggestion. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tal Roach, uh, Bahamas. I like number three. What I would like to suggest as an ad is the sustainability of it in terms of, I suppose, getting towards the idea of um, internet fragmentation. So we really need to look at a means for sustaining uh, internet that is for the, the planet. So that's just my input. Thank you. Their comments, ideas, desires. Thanks, Paul. Hi, it's Adam. Adam Peake, apologies, MAG member during this session. But anyway, I thought I'd mention, I just put in the chat themes from, I think, the last five or six or seven IGFs, which may or may not be helpful, um, but I hope it's a little bit helpful. Um, also, that the Global Digital Compact has the uh, intention of uh, an outlining of shared principles for an open, oops, free and secure digital future for all, very similar type of aspirational kind of language. And the leadership panel told us um, they're, they're working on an idea around um, the internet we want. And that seems to me to actually encapsulate most of the things that are on the screen behind us. So I wonder, as the MAG and, and we last year and this year have discussed aligning with the Global Digital Compact, um, then perhaps working with the leadership panel on this notion of the internet we want, which will encompass everything I think we've discussed so far. Perhaps that's why one way of doing it. What do we want from the internet? 
Are we talking about the equivalent of sustainable development goals for the internet so that we can break out all of these important topics and, and address them over the coming months and years? But anyway, um, yeah, just a thought. And I don't think it's really my time to be saying it, but it should be tomorrow in the mag. Thanks. Sorry, so just to clarify, you're suggesting the internet we want. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think I, I, I have a particularity for the first and the second one because of uh, the for everyone part um, that really includes um, a perspective that it's just not, well, sometimes it's not even a problem of uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation. It's at the basis of lacking for, of information. For example, if you look at uh, artificial intelligence and um, chat GPT that was just mentioned, uh, if you try to access it in a local language, um, let's say a local African language, it won't be able to respond to you. So uh, I would like that maybe some of the themes emphasize uh, for everyone to also include that part of accessibility. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Um, Walter Atris, observer. Um, a bit hesitant because I'm not really going to talk about the themes because that's something that the Mac is going to decide. But what I do hear is that main topics that are being advised come back from last year. I hear Matthias say that we need to be bold as Mag and as IGF. So I would like to 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 add to that because probably we're going to discuss the same topics as last year. And listening to the NL IGF, the Netherlands IGF uh, meeting after the IGF, they said, yes, we had themes, but there was no structure. There was no coherence. There was just sessions and nothing tied into each other somehow. And I think that has to do with the boldness that Matthias is, is uh, uh, alluring to because the, what I think is important is that as I said this morning that there should be some focus if you want to have real messages so if cybersecurity and artificial intelligence etc come back in a huge way then the question what solution are you looking for or what is what should be your message at the end of the IGF are questions that you would like to know up front and answers you'd like to know up front because that way you can provide the focus in the program make sure that there is a streamline and not somebody saying some the same message three times in in consecutive consecutive workshops where he is in, introduced to because he's he's the expert or she is the expert so in other ways you want to avoid that you want to avoid having somebody sending just messages but you want to have somebody thinking about solutions because that basically is the message. And that is something that will be hard to organize, but I think it's the IGF in its 18th iteration is ready to do that. And that will lead to far stronger messages and policy advice for policymakers, for industry, that they have to adhere to some way or address in some way and take into account. So that is my message, provide the focus in the program so that there's a logical approach to the topic and not just incidental approaches to the topic. Thank you, Paul. And thank you. Other people would like to take the floor? Once. Carol. Just want a clarification on civilization. What does that cover? 
Say that again. Civilization. What what is the interpretation for that? That's great. Are we talking social? What are we talking? Ah. Hmm. So she wants um, for the title of number three, uh, better internet for the planet. Internet way of ethics, peace and civilization. So. Her question is, what is meant by civilization? Is it the social structure or? Mm -hmm. Excellent question that I don't know yeah, if we yeah. know the, the answer yeah. to. I mean, but, you do it to something. Right, yeah. 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 Yes, please do. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the element uh, uh received from our uh, private uh, community but i think uh, uh kind of uh shared by all citizens and prevail in the society i i that my that's my understanding or interpretation but i think it's a, a kind of uh you know the uh, internet uh, for for everyone or for society whole society I think that's the, what uh, our uh, community wanted to mean by this ter uh, terminology. Who's going to go first? Okay, please go ahead. We'll just mm -hmm. help. Yes, um, thank you. Um, that's um, Honorable Al Haji, uh, parliamentarian. I tend to lean towards number two, uh, but I would add um, uh, two words, which is accessibility and uh, sustainability. Um, I would rather call it accessible and sustainable internet, a critical infrastructure for democracy and innovation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Roz Kenny Birch, Observer from the United Kingdom. Um, uh, we appreciate the multi-stakeholders language in the fifth theme. Um, we think it's quite positive to be looking ahead towards the future of the internet. Indeed, um, the UK held a session um, on a positive vision for the future of the internet uh, at last year's UNIGF. And given that the multi-stakeholder model has been so successful in promoting innovation, access to knowledge across the global internet, we believe um, that this multi-stakeholder Stakeholders language is quite important. Um, uh, and uh, with that, thank you. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Chair Jim Prendergast. Um, Adam, Adam saved me uh, a pint of beer for somebody. In years past, I would bet members of the MAG if they could tell me without looking it up what the themes from the last three years were, I'd buy them a beer. I've never paid out on it. Um, so that is my way of saying, you know, keep it short, keep it memorable, um, and keep it proactive and future looking. So to that end, you know, uh, again, I think the leadership panels actually handed us something that's pretty proactive, and pretty memorable and pretty short with the internet we want. Um, that seems to, you know, have us looking forward at the issues of the day, coming up with solutions, uh, and it allows for, you know, some introduction of some issues that, you know, would breed some excitement, some controversy, and some interest. So there's my suggestion. Thanks. Thank you. And Joyce? Thanks very much. Um, Joyce Chen, Mac member. Just looking at the variations on the screen, I think internet for everyone or for all seems to resonate across most of the suggestions. I'm seeing also future of the internet coming up quite a fair bit. So we could perhaps take these into consideration. I mean, all the other, you know, words, critical infrastructure, democracy, ethics, peace, et cetera, those are just extrapolations of the, the larger idea. And I think the main theme could just encapsulate that larger idea. So something to do with internet for everyone or for all and then looking towards the future something like that i think we might be able to arrive at something during the mac meeting tomorrow or i'm not sure if we can come to a conclusion today thanks 
Yeah, to be clear, we won't make a decision today. Justin? Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, Justin Fair, also on the mag, so I'll be short. I was just going to offer, I think, um, <clears throat> just to add to, I think, a good constructive conversation we're having. I, I do I do uh, agree with those that said I think the leadership panel has has offered, you know, a good um, input. I wonder if, you know, a way to kind of tie it to some of the other comments about uh, Global Digital Compact, instead of the Internet, talk about a digital future, which might also kind of encourage that alignment with other processes, but also capture kind of the broader issues we're doing. So something like uh, the digital future we want or something like that uh, could be another option, but I know um, further conversation on this tomorrow. Thanks. Just looking at uh, the themes from the previous IGFs and um, not taking up uh, Jim's bet, but um, we did have, um, in 2008, we did have an internet for all, which may be similar to, um, I mean, yes, there's internet for all, there's internet for everybody. Um, a global internet, of course, does encapsulate the one unified internet, but we have had internet for all as a um, theme, you know, as a main theme. Go ahead, Chris. All right, Chris Buckridge, also a MAG member, so keeping it brief. Um, I, I mean, I think first I wanted to say thank you to Japanese hosts for providing these five suggestions. I think it's really useful for us to be able to to pick through this and and work out a, a way forward. And I, yeah, I know coming up with with these is not always straightforward. So thank you very much. Um, I, I do also agree that the the leadership panel's suggestion of the internet we want is perhaps a useful framing um whether in that language or or in language to that effect sort of identifying that um maybe we don't we don't right now have the internet we want whether because it's not available to everyone or because even for those to whom it is available there are open questions regarding issues like privacy or human rights or other um or meaningful access etc um Personally, I also really like the fifth point there about empowering stakeholders. Um, I'm not sure whether the, the language could be modified a little, but I think that's one of the key jobs of the IGF. It's empowering stakeholders to actually um, improve the internet, improve internet access, improve the internet as we as we know it. So there is, there is a lot to, to work on here. And I know distilling this, I absolutely hear Jim's point about making it short, memorable, um, so, and we definitely can't bring in everything there, but there is a lot, there are some good points to work with here. And I think we have some really good starting points for our discussion in the MAG tomorrow. Thank you. Mary Elsa. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to second the idea of, uh, of uh, the internet we want. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, the timing of the meeting will make a huge difference as well uh, for this conversation because it will be right after uh, some of the principles of the Global Digital Compact will already be coalesced, you know, uh, um, because, you know, they're expected to be, you know, kind of a um, um, firmed around, you know, September, concluded around September. So this comes in October. And then the, the negotiation with, uh, for member states will take the, will take a, a place the next year, of course. Um, but it's uh, the Internet we want also plays into the WISIS uh, plus 20 process. You know, so it, it takes forward some of the principles that we are looking at and uh, that we looked at last year and, and uh, moves that forward and saying, OK, so if you are rethinking, you know, the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, with this, you know, uh, um, um, conversation, you know, this 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 could be a, become a, an important input towards it. Um, and indeed, you know, it, it, uh, the Internet we want will play, you know, uh, uh, well into this kind of discussion. I agree with uh, uh um, but others have said already uh, in terms of uh, there are things that uh, that exist on the internet that we want more of, and there are things in, on the internet that we want less of, and that kind of conversation is really you know a, um, a very useful one, and 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 could yield you know very clear recommendations and uh, and messages uh, on the way forward. Thank you. 
Thank you. Other input? Right. There, there are a few hands online. Maybe uh, they could also come in. The Zoom. Hey, Mark. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, there are a lot of important key words that uh, we're all circling around and trying to condense into a uh, catchphrase type theme, which um, I agree with Jim is very important to, to have, so it's memorable. Um, and thank you to Japan for uh, providing a, a very uh, inspirational set of uh, options to, to draw on. I've I've made a suggestion. Uh, it was quite quite a while ago now. Um, for a text in in the in the chat, uh, I'll read it. Uh, achieving the transformative and trusted unified internet that we all want. And I've also added and need. Everybody in the world needs it. So, in addition to want, I've suggested the word need. Achieving, I start off because that gives the sense of uh, stakeholders being empowered to establish this aim and achieve it. Transformative, I think, I, I thought would capture the sense of future. Technologies are coming down the track very fast, like metaverse, uh, which are going to change the way everybody works, lives, socializes. Uh, entertains and so on. Trust is important to have captured that as a word as uh, I know Japan has used. Um, unified to avoid uh, the fragmentation risk. And uh, as I say, to finish off with uh, a sense that this is what we all want and need. I hope that's a helpful contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Jorge. Jorge. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Paul, for giving me the floor. Uh, I thought that perhaps we could paraphrase uh, the famous uh, phrase from uh, Abraham Lincoln on democracy and government. And uh, in the end, uh, it's, a, it's a catchy phrase. And it encapsulated uh, a lot of uh, what we were uh, thinking and discuss and discussing. So uh, it could be something like uh, uh, the internet. Um, sorry, one moment. Uh, an internet of, by, and for all people, or for all peoples, perhaps in the plural. So this uh, also talks about uh, democracy. It talks about uh, empowerment, uh, not in a paternalistic, but in a bottom-up man manner. It talks about what we want and it uh, rings a bell, I guess, with uh, many journalists uh, and media because it uh, makes this connection with, uh, with a very famous phrase from, uh, from Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you. Additional commentary. And we're out of commentary on the on this. We'll <clears throat> give a, a here an open question, an open discussion on the eighteenth. IGF program structure, including thematic tracks and other program components, high level black leaders track, parliamentary track, youth engagement, capacity development, etc. So the floor is open on that topic. Don't be shy.
Um, I mean, program structure, we've heard from comments that they should be no more than three subtracts. Um, I think that was what uh, one of the suggestions uh, was. Um, we currently have um, 11 concurrent sessions. And one of the reasons why I'm just trying to um, urge you on a little bit um, about the amount of sessions that we have. Uh, we have, you know, 10 rooms going concurrently. Um, there's always this argument that we should have less sessions. And then when June comes, when it's time to select the sessions, we always have more than we had um, in the previous year, because it's very, very, when it comes to the crunch, it's very, very difficult to where to make that cut and that line. So if anybody's got any comments on that, that might also help uh, shape our thinking and also the process that um, we're, we're going to go into because after this meeting um, that we have, we're going to have the call for workshops and the grading and et cetera. So um, what we discuss here it might set expectations for um, that process. So anybody's got any comments? Um, Yes, Jim. Yes, uh, thanks, Chengatai. So um, coming back to something that Jorge Cancio had mentioned earlier this morning about, I, I don't have the acronym handy, maybe it's VIP, but a very integrated program. You know, it never dawned on me that we didn't have the high level track and the parliamentarians and the youth track and all the other workshops all driving towards the same agenda and hopefully the same outcome for outputs and deliverable. So I would say um, focusing on that for this year, I think is critically important to answer the call for more concrete outcomes from the IGF uh, that could feed into one of many other processes. Thanks. Um, thank you, Shankar. Um I'm, I'm looking at the, the email you just uh, sent on the mug list. Um, the second year, I think the mug uh, topic was uh, internet governance. Uh, the second year, I'm, I'm 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 thinking it was taking stock of uh, the, the the previous two years. Um, is that something after many years of of, of internet governance, we we should also be looking at taking stock of many themes that we've had and and um, pretty much summing them and and seeing whether we're making progress. Um, but along along those those kind of discussions, I'm just I was just interested with with uh, that the selection selection of that sort of a topic. Thank you. Um, uh, just to clarify, what Bram is talking about is that I just sent uh, the, the list of the past themes, and then in uh, 2007, which was the second year of the IGF, uh, the theme was Internet Governance Forum. The first two years. So it was basically taking stock of what, what we've done during the first two years of the IGF. And I guess um, his question is, is it time for something similar? Internet governance, I don't know. I mean, 18 is not really the round number. Uh, these are usually done 10, 15, 20, um, but yes, it's... Um, Uh, Baltanatos observer, um, just reflecting on the parliamentarian track, I've been involved in 2019 with the organization and participated last year. And if I reflect on last year, what I noticed is that a very fundamental thing came out of a three hour session. And it was that all parliamentarians in that room realized that they had to train the judiciary to, to if they come up with strategies or with laws on cybersecurity or whatever, that the judiciary has to understand what is going on actually on the internet and that that often is not the case. So that shows how elementary a three hour session that goes on about 10 different topics comes up with one 
si fairly simple conclusion. And I think that is something that perhaps is forgotten when we engage with new stakeholder groups is that the knowledge is not at the same level that we are at. And I am involved now with the Eurodic parliamentarian track and I've been asked to, to help get that together, find topics, etc. But we came up with a very fundamental problem and I hope that you can ask and I could ask that off, offline as well, but I think it's also important to address here. How do we make sure that there's continuity with parliamentarians, but also with perhaps at the ministerial level where people tend to be not re-elected or a government falls? And do we have the right contacts around the world to make sure that the next person knows that this is happening? So what I came up with is, are there parliamentarian groups around cyber or digital whatever they call it, they, then they usually have a secretariat. And do we have that name? Do we have that generic address? Because that would help a lot and not have to address the head of a parliament who usually discards the message because he gets a million invitations. So is that something that is in place? Or is it something that we should compile together, for, for example, with the help of the NRIs and see if we can find out uh, if, what the right contact details are so they have continuity? And the second one is the elementary questions that need to be solved in these sort of sessions, because that helps the community forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wood. Uh, those are good questions and um, maybe a bit deep for here, but we can um, uh, discuss them um, later on as far as um, our work goes with the parliamentarians. I mean, yes, yeah, again, yes. I mean, the, that's a, a, a broad question. Um, there is and there isn't. Uh, there is in, in the form that, yes, we do cooperate with the interparliamentary union, and of course there's us, and um, but at the home basis of the parliamentarians, um, not really, but yes, uh, we can discuss and come up with something. Um, Adam, is that up or is it down? Okay, thank you. Uh, Justin, please. Um, thank you, Chengatai. Yeah, I think I think you've heard me say it, but one of my my references this week is this movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and and I, I feel like that also often applies to um, you know the feeling of being at the IGF, where there's just so many sessions on so many topics, and they all seem to be happening at the same time. That that even participating, it's very hard hard to kind of come away with a narrative or or kind of you know uh, I mean even track everything, but to come away with a narrative, and a lot of the I think. Um, <coughs> criticisms we've heard the last few days kind of go along with um, it's hard to have clarity or crystallization of our messaging. <coughs> it's hard to kind of how the outputs kind of uh, impact other processes because there's just so much that happens and it, it is, uh, you know, I don't want to say diluted, but it kind of dilutes the ability to kind of point to any uh, major, major outcomes from the IGF. And so while I think the challenge is always that when the proposals come in, they're all important. Uh, you know, pol uh, all the policy issues are inherently valuable and in, in their own right. I think that the there is a responsibility on the MAG and the and the uh, Secretariat and others to have some prioritization, to have some discipline in the IGF, so we can have you know somewhat focused, integrated discussions that actually make progress on the issues that actually show. Um, where, where outcomes can be and it can help influence kind of, uh, you know, external things. And, and that's a challenge because no one wants to say no, but I do think that it's in the interest of the IGF to have that kind of focus and to have that kind of discipline um, and it will help the, 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 the process be more impactful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. And we have um, Utah online. Yes, thank you again for giving me the floor. Uh, I wanted to get back to what Yu Cheng Atai said before uh, in regard of setting expectations in the community uh, when choosing the overarching theme for IGF 2023. 
from my perspective, internet governance is all about creating the internet we want. So I really appreciate that uh, suggestion from the leadership panel. Nonetheless, I'm concerned whether we are all in consensus about what internet we want. There might be diverse perspectives and the IGF is the best uh, forum where we should be able to discuss these diverse positions in regard of what internet we want and then trying to argue in order to achieve at least a rough consensus what internet we want. So I, I really appreciate if we could set a theme in that direction. Nonetheless, uh, the broader the theme is, the less specific it is, uh, the more we need to explain to the community what workshop proposals are expected to be sent in. And that would mean that as we did years before uh, to have a, a concise description in which direction uh, the community is expected to draw up their workshop proposals and send them in. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Carol. I think um, what we're hearing from a lot of persons here also is that we should have a theme that should not have to be explained um, and it needs to be bold. We don't need people trying to figure out well, what does that mean? What does, you know, we just need it to be plain as we had from the beginning, simple. And as you said earlier as well, bold, you know, not so flowery. Thank you, I think that's right. Mark? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to um, um, remind everybody if they haven't, um, uh, if they don't recollect it, that uh, the sub themes last year in Addis uh, were drawn from the DDC. That's that's that was very right and appropriate. But there was one thematic area that wasn't um, in the in the seven proposals for the GDC. That that is the um, digital common commons as a global public good. Um, and I, I was disappointed actually in Addis that 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 theme wasn't or that concept uh, wasn't discussed because uh, you know it needs it needs um bottoming out uh you know what what exactly does it mean that digital commons what would be the scope of it but i think it's uh important given that it is a proposal for the gdc that the igf picked this up uh, in kyoto um and uh if not the main theme um perhaps um a sub theme to connect with this uh, in terms of the global public good and and what we are doing at the igf as stakeholders worldwide from governments private sector civil society academia uh, and technical community and so on is trying to achieve an internet that does serve the public good globally now that avoids i think some of the risk that Jutta has just explained in terms of definition um, of what, what we want. But I, I can't imagine a theme that reflects the ambition to achieve the global public good would be controversial. Um, so I, I, I throw that in into the uh, discussion. Uh, um, I hope that's helpful. But I, as a, I guess one of my messages uh, for for uh, the program in Kyoto is that um, this this thematic proposal for the GDC is discussed and explored and defined and uh, something substantive is proposed for it uh, by the IGF community in its conclusions on uh, on the digital commons as a global public good. Thank you.
Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Seattle from ICC Basis. Um, with regards to the 18th IGF program structure, allow me to repeat some of the messages we shared in the ICC basis input to the Taking Stock Hall. In particular, uh, concentrating the IGF program into a small number of thematic tracks in 2019 and 2020 was a very welcomed idea and translated well into the final program of the IGF. The 2021 and 2022 editions seem to slowly move away from this precedent. The idea of three, four, but no more thematic tracks should be maintained going forward to help streamline the agenda. Furthermore, aligning workshop proposals on their thematic tracks works well. Efforts should be strengthened to align other sessions that are part of the official IGF program, as well as pre-events under the thematic tracks. A reinforced communication campaign would be helpful ahead of the workshop proposal process to ensure those new to the IGF are aware of the various possibilities to be actively involved in the upcoming IGF well in advance of the annual meeting. This should also include information on the possibility of proposing other types of activities for the IGF program that are not suitable for a workshop format, including networking, publication launch, hackathons, etc. cetera. Uh, lastly, uh, turning towards the different types of sessions within the IGF program, we wish to congratulate the past uh, host countries, the IGF Secretariat and UNDESA for their efforts to attract government officials, legislators, and business participants to take part to the meeting. To amplify the high-level reach and in-person participation of high-level stakeholders at the IGF, we suggest more targeted and timelier outreach beyond generic invite to drive the interest through a clear engagement proposal. Thank you. And thank you. Yes, right there. Hello, this is Alan Ramirez from Peru. Uh, what about if we rephrase the internet? We want and um, make a question about that. For example, what internet do we want? That's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? If there are none, then we'll take a coffee, tea break for about 10 minutes and come back. Okay, so coffee and tea. Yes, and we have to be seated by uh 4:30 because we have some online participants who are going to be presenting as well so we don't want to okay. mm -hmm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time that we start. I think we're missing a lot of people, and I do see their laptops. Ryan, can you just try and announce to the people outside that we have started? Thank you. Because we have some people online, and they don't have um, a lot of leeway with their time. Um, so I think for this session, we should try and start on time.
and while we're waiting, um, Jorge asked ChatGPT what the main themes for IGF 2023 should be. And uh, it doesn't, as with ChatGPT, it gave us a little bit more than, well, actually it did give us three. So the first one was digital inclusion. Um, and then the second one is cybersecurity and privacy. Third one is um, emerging technologies. Well, I mean, these are generic ones. Uh, and then the fourth one is digital rights and freedoms. So there you go for your consideration. Okay. <laughs> Oh, and the last one is sustainable development. Uh, the digital world has a significant impact on the environment. And as such, it is essential to consider how to ensure sustainable development. A theme in sustainable development could explore ways to ensure that internet governance policies and regulations promote sustainable practices and reduce the environmental impact of digital technologies. So, yes. Anyway, thank you very much, and um, uh, let us begin. So for this portion, we're going to get updates from related internet governance initiatives and processes, followed by an open discussion on possible IGF 2023 activities and collaborations, interventions, etc. Um, we have a long list, starting with the European Commission, ICC basis, Council of Europe, Internet Society, AFRINIC, OECD, etc. I won't just keep reading them, but uh, but there'll be a list and um, it's managed for us by Anya. And without um, any ado, let's just start beginning with the European Commission. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. Hope you can hear me. My name is Esteban Santa. I don't seem to be able to connect the video. It says uh, that your video, because the host has stopped it, but uh, that's fine with me. Um, so I'll go ahead without video. Oh, wait. I'm getting Sorry, just give us uh, 30 seconds. I think we'll be able to. OK. I didn't see you. And now you see me. You see me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Shengatai, the IGF Secretariat, uh, Anya, the uh, MAC Chair and the MAC for inviting us to, to give a few words about uh, what the European Commission has been doing in fields and topics that relate to internet governance. Uh, I'm Esteban Sand. I'm the head of the internet governance uh, uh, sector in the European Commission. Uh, as it's normally the case, we've been very busy with uh, regulatory packages and, and, and legislations. Uh, perhaps uh, the most important development in 22 is the entering into force of the uh, Digital Services Act, uh, which establishes new rules for a safe and accountable online environment and puts fundamental rights of citizens and users at the, at the center of the relationship, of their relationship with, uh, with especially big platforms. The Digital Markets Act, the DMA, has also entered into force. And this legislation sets a, a new regulatory framework to ensure fair and open digital markets. These both uh, regulatory packages are complex and they are in the process of being implemented. The Commission is getting ready for a, for a very serious and, and thorough implementation process and um, enforcement process of both uh, legislations. The NIS directive, the NIS 2 directive, which is the EU directive on cyber, secu cyber security uh, aspects, uh, was also agreed by the co-legislators in 22. Uh, the directive has implications for uh, DNS companies operating in the EU, uh, which will have to take uh, appropriate security and resilience, resilience uh, measures. In 22, the Commission adopted also, these are still under negotiations, uh, the Data Act, 
which uh, proposes new rules on who can use and access data generated in the EU. Another legislative proposal currently under discussion by these different EU uh, institutions is the Artificial Intelligence Act, which ensures that artificial intelligence, AI, evolves in a trustworthy environment. And moreover, there are more, but I'll, I will stop here, but I would like to mention uh, the, the something that it's less known perhaps internationally, but also extremely important for the EU, which is the proposed legal framework that would allow EU citizens to use safe and privacy enhancing digital identity to access key uh, public services across borders. So across the whole of the EU. There are other, a lot of legislative activity uh, by, the, by the EU in general. Um, I'd just like to, to say that uh, the, the commission organized a very well attended and vibrant with a lot of uh, opinions and, and views uh, open forum in the IGF 22 in Addis to discuss the potential inter international impact of these uh, legislative packages with the multi-stakeholder community. Uh, there were, of course, uh, is normal reports issued on, this, on these discussions, and these reports were widely circulated to the EU co-legislators and EU member states. Uh, this was a great opportunity for us to gather international input, and we concur with uh, many participants that we've heard this morning here in the SMAC gathering that the IGF in Addis was extremely successful and a great environment to uh, enable such important discussion for us. Late uh, 21, the EU adopted a new global connectivity strategy, the Global Gateway. And in 2022, we've been busy uh, implementing already many, many projects, many of them dealing with digital aspects. And for 23, 24, 25, we have already many uh, digital projects in the pipeline which have a common denominator, which is promote a global digital transition that is based on the open internet and human rights. The EU firmly believes that this is the way to bridge the digital divide while truly empowering local communities and countries. But this is, of course, well understood in many places. In our outreach and dialogues with African countries, for example, which we've done together with our Japanese friends, among others, we see plenty of innovative, locally driven models that have the open internet at its core. On this note, in 22, the EU has engaged both internally and internationally in discussing and putting in paper the principles that we think should underlie a vibrant and democratic online environment, which is unfortunately not, a, not at all a given. The EU has adopted the Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles that will guide the digital transformation in the EU, but also guide the EU external policy on digitization. As part of our diplomatic efforts, the EU has an, around 70 partner countries uh, across the world and in different regions have subscribed the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, which is a set which sets out a basic vision and principles of a trusted internet. There will be plenty of multi-stakeholder activities around these declarations uh, organized in, in 2023. And these declarations have also been at the core of the forthcoming EU contribution to the global digital compact, which represents a great opportunity to broaden the consensus around the human rights and democratic principles that should underlie the open internet. So to conclude with the GDC and the WCS plus 20 process, we are indeed arriving at an important moment for internet governance. As a firm supporter of the multi-stakeholder model, uh, the European Commission is thrilled to have our Japan friends as the organizers of IGF 23 in a moment where IGF needs to show its relevance and capacity to evolve to meet the many challenges that the open internet uh, faces. Let me conclude by thanking on behalf of the European Commission, the MAC and the IGF Secretariat 
for the tremendous work that is carried out to ensure an inclusive and relevant forum, and the new IGF leadership panel for bringing new energy and ideas to the process as we have seen this morning. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much. Now we'll turn to ICC basis. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is Menin Asasiado from ICC Basis for the record. With uh, regard to the 18th IGF program structure, uh, I'm sorry, I spoke uh, a different section. Uh, so many thanks for the opportunity to share a few updates on the work of the International Chamber of Commerce and ICC's business action to support the information society. Uh, by way of introduction, ICC is the institutional representative of more than 45 million companies in over 100 countries. Through a unique mix of advocacy solutions and standard setting, we promote international trade, responsible business conduct, and a global approach to regulation. Our members include many of the world's leading companies, SMEs, business associations, and legal chambers and local chambers of, com of commerce. ICC's global policy commissions convene business experts who examine major issues of interest to the business world, prepare policy products to contribute to intergovernmental discussions, as well as rules and codes to facilitate international business operations. ICC's Global Digital Economy Commission works to advance the global development of the digital economy and enable the continued growth of technologies and business models that underpin the digital economy through private sector policy leadership, like regulatory advocacy, and promotion of best practices. The Commission aims at creating an, an enabling environment in close cooperation with all stakeholders to benefit from the, from the economic and social dividends of the, of the digital age and to mitigate its challenges. And the Commission's main focus areas for this, year's, uh, for this year are, first, on cybersecurity, safety, and resilience. ICC recognizes that the tension between the need to close digital divides and advance digital transformation versus the lack of a strong cybersecurity posture can be considered a risk to continued social and economic development. With the private sector and policymakers um, continuously working on to increase the resilience of digital infrastructure, software, and devices to make it harder for malicious actors to succeed in their objectives, this is not a sufficient um, way to break the growing trend and decrease cyber threats. One key opportunity lies in mainstreaming cybersecurity into the global digital development agenda and align the efforts of all stakeholders behind shared goals and ambitions. And ambitions. To this effect, ICC is calling on the global multi-stakeholder community to come together and set an actionable, collaboratively drafted and agreed agenda to incentivize the implementation of existing cybersecurity norms and international law, identify and address implementation challenges or capacity gaps, and help direct resources to build targeted programs in response. We call this the Cyber Development Goals, a concept we launched at the IGF in Addis Ababa and aim to further develop uh, in the year. Furthermore, we will continue to work closely with member states of the United Nations as they move forward with negotiating a global convention on cybercrime to ensure this effort is informed by business experience and evidence and aligns with existing global measures and best practices. Secondly, I would like to draw your attention towards data flows with trust. Um, so looking at how cross-border data flows of both personal and non-personal data underpin every aspect of today's private and public sector activities, processes and services, as well as cross-border cooperation from fields as vast as trade, public health, climate change, or crime prevention. ICC is currently working on gathering evidence, experiences, uh, best practice, and recommendations from the global business community on how to reinforce trust, boost data-driven innovation, and tap into the potential societal and economic benefits of data sharing, while protecting the rights of individuals and supporting the ethical use of data. We aim to specifically bring this work and our findings to the discussions of the 18th IGF meeting in Kyoto. Third, in addition to ICC's Global Digital Economy Commission, the BASIS initiative is ICC's main advocacy vehicle to mobilize our network to contribute to global conversations on internet governance matters. Here we focus on three priorities. Through BASIS, we work to bring business input to the IGF, from contributing to intersessional work, such as the policy network and internet fragmentation, to organizing sessions at the annual meeting and encouraging business participation. Through BASIS, we also coordinate the input of ICC's vast business network to the development of the Global Digital Compact and advocate for continued opportunities for meaningful contributions by all stakeholders across the entire process of the elaboration of the Global Digital Compact. Last but not least, we are also looking ahead to the 20-year review of the WISIS process in 2025, which will also decide on the renewal of the IGF's mandate. 
We're looking forward to collaborating with partners across the globe and all stakeholders on these issues, which is why we find it particularly important to bring our work to the IGF year after year. Please don't hesitate to get in touch should you like to discuss any further uh, anything further on the topics that uh, I mentioned. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much. And next we have Council of Europe. Yes, I hope that you can hear me because I cannot uh, I cannot apparently start the video. Um, yes, we can hear you and okay, you can also see we me can see quickly. you though. Yes, we can see thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Christian Bartolina and I'm head of the Digital Development Unit in the Secretariat of the Council of Europe. And I would like to start by thanking you for offering the Council of Europe the possibility to briefly update you on the on our work relevant to your to your work. As you know, we are mainly a standard setting intergovernmental organization, and we have therefore several intergovernmental uh, committees that work on various aspects that are relevant to the internet governance field. I will go by sector to make it simple. It is in fact six sectors uh, that I will focus on today. The first is media policy. Uh, on this, uh, our work is influenced by the extraordinary evolution and disruption resulting from the digital transformation of the media ecosystem. Media and internet governance uh, have become inherently intertwined, which is reflected in the latest Council of Europe regulatory uh, interventions encompassing both legacy media and digital platforms. Five recommendations were adopted in 2022 dealing with different aspects of the platformization of the public sphere. And in 2023, the organization will finalize the work on a set of guidelines for the responsible use of AI in journalism. On the second topic I will mention is hate speech. Um, at the end of 2022, a recommendation on combating hate speech with a focus on the online space and outlining a comprehensive approach to addressing hate speech within the human rights framework was adopted by the Committee of Ministers. The recommendation provides guidance for member states to implement a comprehensive and calibrated set of legal and non-legal measures uh, and devote special attention to the online environment in which most of today's hate speech can actually be found. Uh, this year, we will conduct a review of promising practices at national level in this regard and produce a report. The third area I would mention is disinformation. We are recognizing that combating dis disinformation is essential for protecting human rights and for securing access to accu accurate and reliable information. The Council of Europe has therefore taken several steps to encourage implementation of regulatory frameworks, uh, reducing the spread of disinformation and promoting the integrity of online information. In 2022, several recommendations were adopted addressing issues such as the impacts of digital technologies on freedom of expression, uh, but uh, the org organization is currently working on a set of guidelines on countering the spread of online myths and disinformation through fact-checking and platform design solutions in a human rights compliant manner. The fourth area is data protection. The ratification of protocol number 2223, uh, 20, amending convention 108, remains uh, on, on data pro personal data protection, remains the main priority for the Council of Europe. This already has an impact on internet governance as it contributes to the convergence of privacy regimes around the globe, uh, which will intensify once the instruments enter into force. It has now reached 21 ratifications. On the area for which I'm personally responsible is artificial intelligence. And the Council of Europe's Committee on Artificial Intelligence, uh, the CHI, has continued uh, its work this year. Uh, on, a, uh, on a future framework convention, which should set out general, common general principles and rules ensuring that the design, development, and application of artificial intelligence systems respect human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. At its third and fourth plenary meetings, uh, the held in mid-January and early February 2023, the CHI started negotiations of a draft text of the future framework convention on the basis of a draft prepared by the chair of the committee, Mr. Thomas Schneider, Ambassador Mr. Thomas Schneider of Switzerland, with the support of the Secretariat. The revised version of this so-called zero draft has now been made public and can be found on the website of the Committee on Artificial Intelligence website under the Council of Europe website. The next plenary meeting uh, where will the negotiations will continue is scheduled for 19th to 21st of April. 
according to the our terms of reference, the CHI will have to uh, complete the negotiations by 15th of November 2023. So as you see, this is a rather uh, uh, rather short deadline to produce uh, 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 such a complex uh, instrument as we're talking about here. Uh, we are considering now in the committee that the future framework convention could later be supplemented by a standalone non-legally binding methodology for the risk and impact assessment of AI systems, which could facilitate ex ante regulation and supervision of AI systems that are used in a context involving issues relating to respect for human rights, the functioning of democracy and the observance of rule of law. The sixth and final uh, area that I would like to uh, draw your attention to is our work on the metaverse. Now the metaverse is a relatively uh, new concept, but it has already been mentioned in the Council of Europe's digital agenda for 2022 to 2025. Uh, and we will soon go into a midterm review of this, uh, of, uh, of this agenda. Uh, the Council of Europe uh, has the task to alert member states on new and, uh, and emerging digital technological de developments uh, that may have an impact on human rights, rule of law and democracy. After an initial mapping through the various aspects of the organization, it became obvious that the topic of the metaverse is transversal just as was the case, by, for the, by the way, for the AI, and that more information is needed to take further action tailored to the complexity of the phenomenon we're talking about. We have therefore started a joint project with the Institute of Electri Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, to uh, prepare a report going in more, more in depth concerning the challenges of immersive realities. The analysis and the conclusion of the study will explore the potential impact of the metaverse and other virtual realities uh, on human rights, the rule of law and democracy from the perspective of the Council of Europe. Uh, the aim is to understand whether the tools the Council of Europe already has as its as, as at its uh, disposal are sufficiently comprehensive for such a new reality or if further uh, legislative uh, action is required. Uh, I would like here also to draw your attention to the fact that we have a we have a platform for cooperation with the business sector, the so-called digital partnership. This partnership enables companies to participate in an array of activities of the Council of Europe uh, and to also participate in the shaping of digital policies. Uh, I think that this uh, report on the metaverse, which we have uh, are conducting together with the IEEE, is a good example of an outcome of this form of cooperation. Finally, I would like to take the uh, opportunity to thank uh, uh, the IGF for the excellent work that you're doing. We are, of course, as always, uh, from the Council of Europe side, supporting it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Next, we have the Internet Society. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I yes, we can. Yeah, perfect. I cannot turn on my video, but that, if you can hear me, that's perfectly fine. So thank you very much uh, for, and there it is, sorry. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Before I start, as it's March 8, I would like to recognize the excellent work that women in internet governance are doing to advance women's digital inclusion. I'm Agustina Calegari, Senior Manager of External Engagement at the Internet Society, and I'm here to provide some updates on the Internet Society's work and share some exciting fellowships, learnings, and awards opportunities. In 2023, the Internet Society will continue working to promote and defend the Internet. And within this context, on the promote side, we are developing the Internet infrastructure to bring us closer towards university connectivity and to help the Internet grow as the robust and resilient resource it was designed to be. Our projects focus on connecting the unconnected, fostering sustainable peer infrastructure, enable sustainable technical communities and measuring the internet. On the defense side, we also work daily to protect the internet's open architecture. This means identifying and mitigating threats to ensure 
a secure and trustworthy internet for everyone. And in this front, we have projects on extending encryption, securing global routing security, and protecting the internet from fragmentation. Regarding internet fragmentation, as I know that this is a topic of much interest for the IGF community, I can add that we are currently looking for like-minded organizations that want to collaborate and join efforts to advocate against internet fragmentation. So please feel free to reach out to me if you want to, to connect on this front. I would also like to share updates regarding our IGF Youth Ambassador programs and e-learning opportunities. The goal of our fellowship programs and online learning tools is to ensure internet champions are equipped with policy and technical expertise that is critical to building and protecting the future of the internet. Um, this year, we will continue with our early and mid-career fellowships and the Youth Ambassador program. We expect at least five fellows to attend the IGF in Japan and a group to participate online. As every year, we would like our fellows to be involved in the session, so please bear this in mind if you want to include the voice of youth in your sessions. In addition, I would like to share the Internet Society offers uh, as regards e-learning. We offer, uh, we offer a diverse range of e-learning opportunities, and our courses cover topics such as community networks, encryption, internet governance, and network operations, among others. And we offer all these courses in English, Spanish, and French. So I will share the link on the chat, but I invite you to visit our website and explore the various uh, options available. And lastly, I would like to remind you that the Internet Hall of Fame call for nominations uh, is open. So if you know someone, and I'm, I'm sure you know someone, uh, that have done significant contributions to the development of the Internet, I invite you to nominate that person to the Internet Hall of Fame. Nominations are open until March the 24th, so hurry up. Again, I, I will share all, all the links on the chat. So that's all from my side. But now I would like to, if the chair allows me, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Brian from the Internet Society Foundation, because he would like to give further information about funding opportunities for the NRIs and the schools of internet governance, and that I'm sure is of your interest. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I will share more information on the chat. Yes, and please take it away. But Make it make it short so we can keep the, the meeting on time. But uh, yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brian Horlick Cruz. I'm a grant specialist with the Internet Society Foundation. Uh, and I support one of our programs which offers funding to um, recognized uh, NRIs and also um, schools on internet governance. Um, we have been offering funding uh, since 2021 to organizations that are directly involved in the organization um, of these types of, event, of events, um, and we offer funding at two different tiers. We offer funding to uh, national IGFs or organizations that are involved in organizing national IGFs uh, or local or national level schools on internet governance. Um, we offer funding up to $3,500 uh, US for those kinds of events. Um, we also offer funding for regional uh, IGFs uh, and regional level schools on internet governance for up to $10,000 uh, US. Um, the main criteria for this is that the NRIs are uh, formally recognized by the IGF secretariat. Um, and we uh, also offer uh, up to two sponsorships uh, per eligible organization per calendar year. Um, that said, that would be uh, up to one sponsorship for a recognized NRI. Uh, and one sponsorship um, for a school on internet governance. Um, so uh, applications for this year's uh, funding are currently open uh, and are available on our website. That is at uh, isocfoundation.org, isocfoundation.org. Um, and I'll share also more information uh, in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now we have Afrinik. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, my, my, my colleague, uh, my name is Arthur Karandangetson. My colleague, Bruce Abar, will uh, share the update from Afrenic. So I will leave the floor to my colleague, Bryce. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Bryce, please go ahead. Hello? Yes, you have the floor. Can you please go yes. ahead? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. And we can hardly see you. Um, Bryce, Bryce, please, could you go ahead? Let me. Can you? Mm -hmm. Or we can come back to you. We can um, take the next on the queue and then come back to you. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you sir. okay. So we'll take the next one and then come back to you. And the next one is uh, OECD. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for giving us the opportunity to intervene and give uh, a brief update on our main um, internet governance related activities. I am Lucia Russo. I am in the digital economy policy division of the OECD uh, and part of uh, the team working on artificial intelligence. Uh, and I would like to, first of all, echo uh, the the previous speaker in, uh, in International Women's Day in recognizing uh, the, the role of women in advancing uh, internet governance um, topics. Uh, so just uh, to give you a brief update on our recent activities, uh, to start with, we have had uh, a 2022 filled with uh, very fruitful events and developments, and certainly the key uh, event for the OECD has been the ministerial level meeting of the OECD Committee on Digital Economy Policy, which was held in December 2022, uh, hosted and chaired by Spain in Gran Canaria. And this is the fourth ever uh, OECD digital ministerial uh, on, um, on, on, digi uh, on yeah, digital ministerial and took place at uh, a, a critical juncture for OECD and member countries. And this was reflected also in the theme of the ministerial meeting, which was driving long-term recovery and economic growth by building a trusted, sustainable and inclusive digital future. So this ministerial meeting saw the participation of over 600 uh, participants from 46 countries, but also uh, the European Union, Council of Europe, UNESCO, ITU. Um, and, and so the participation of several ministries and high level senior representatives who discussed uh, policies for human-centric uh, rights-oriented digital transformation uh, through four perspectives, uh, economy, society, people, and technology. Uh, this ministerial meeting had an, an unprecedented number uh, of deliverables. Um, first of all, there were two declarations that were approved and launched, uh, one on, uh, the, on a trust, sustainable, and inclusive digital future, and the second, the OECD Declaration on Government Access to Personal Data held by private sector entities. And this is the first uh, intergovernmental agreement on common approaches to safeguarding privacy and human rights and freedoms uh, when accessing personal data for national security and law enforcement purposes. And so this declaration aims to uh, contribute to a, um, a, a a data-free flow uh, with trust. Uh, then uh, at the meeting, uh, there was also the announcement of the Global Forum on Technology, uh, which will be a forum uh, to host uh, in-depth dialogue um, uh, for regular in-depth uh, um, 
dialogue among multi-stakeholders um, on long-term opportunities and risks presented by emerging technologies. Um, then we, we also launched four new recommendations on digital security uh, and the accompanying policy framework on digital security and launched uh, the, the, the key uh, deliverables from the third phase of the Going Digital Horizontal Project, uh, which include as well a Going Digital Guide to Data Governance Policy Making. And then uh, we, uh, at, at the ministerial meeting, we also launched, uh, uh, published a report on rights in the digital age. Uh, you can find all this, uh, I can share the link uh, afterwards uh, on, on the page of the ministerial meeting. Um, beyond this, uh, we have uh, uh, 2023 uh, filled with uh, continuous um, work on, on themes that are relevant to uh, the IGF, and, um, such as um, the twin transition, uh, including impact of AI systems and communication networks, um, continue with work on, on the topic of data free flow with trust, um, and also work on immersive technology and privacy enhan enhancing technologies. And also in 2024, uh, uh, we plan to publish our flagship digital economy uh, outlook, uh, our flagship publication, uh, which will cover um, a number of topics um, that uh, like uh, privacy, security, uh, artificial intelligence, but also emerging um, emerging technologies. Uh, and then uh, the the team uh, that I'm part of um, is also continuing his work on artificial intelligence, particularly focusing on risk uh, and media incidents, providing guidance on responsible business conduct. Um, we also developed uh, a catalog of tools for trustworthy AI, uh, which will be um, launched uh, at the end of the month. Um, we did some uh, work on compute um, measurement, uh, and we will uh, continue doing work on, on foresight on AI, uh, on generative AI, uh, and uh, country reviews um, on national AI policies and strategies for artificial intelligence. Uh, lastly, I would like also to flag the continuous cooperation with internet intergovernmental uh, organizations on the platform globalpolicy.ai. And uh, to end my uh, this brief update, I would like to flag two major events which will take place in March. The first one next week uh, on the 13th and 14th of March, the Global Forum on Digital Security, uh, which will take place here in Paris. And then uh, on the 27th to 29th of March, the third international conference on AI work, productivity and skills, uh, the AI WIPs. Um, I, I will share uh, in the chat uh, links to, to the publications as well as the uh, upcoming events. And I would like to conclude uh, by thanking you, uh, thanking the IGF Secretariat at the MAG uh, for the excellent work uh, you have been doing and you are uh, doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll give uh, Afrinik another try. Yes, um, I can see myself. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. I my my cam is on, so maybe. But I think the most important thing is that we okay. guys, now. It's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, good af good afternoon and everybody and. Uh, yeah, uh, um, I would first of all like to thank you all for the opportunity that uh, uh, Afrin has now to present their program that we are having for the African community. And uh, as a um, key actor in the internet ecosystem in Africa, we have a program called um, 
IDP, Internet Development, Development Programs. And uh, under this program, we have uh, six pillars or six sub programs. And uh, one of uh, them is uh, the fellowship program that I've started since uh, 2007. And uh, the last program that, uh, the last round that we have for the uh, fellowship program received over 2000 application. And uh, we also have diversity in ICT program. And in diversity in ICT program have been created since uh, 2000, 2020, where we realized that uh, despite the effort that we are doing to uh, increase the participation and of human and uh, people with disability in the internet ecosystem in Africa, we realized that the number uh, was not that uh, good. So we have created this program to give them the opportunity to come to our meeting. So it's a fully funding uh, program that they can have. And uh, when uh, they have, they want to organize an, an event related to uh, um, diversity in the region, Africa also support this, this program. Still in the internet development program, we have technical community development program. In this program, we uh, we help the uh, technical community, it's engineers, it's uh, schools, it's, uh, it's uh, national technology community groups and uh, by providing financial support and also by being facilitator because we are all tech techies and actually most of us are from a technical background and uh, we have been called, we are called to assist them as facilitator and uh, also we are giving support to uh, to to, uh, to 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 the to to them when they want to organize a a, a meeting a conference and um, and so on we have another program that is called critical infrastructure development program and in this program we are we are offering uh, devices servers to a um, group of um, of people that are in a given country within Africa that want to uh, set up a network that is called a, a critical. And in this program, we are providing, uh, as I just said, servers and and uh, also capacity building where to help them set it up the server. And we are also giving IP numbers for free for critical infrastructure in Africa. And uh, we we have a we have over eighty thousand dollars for for this program and we have uh, equipped over 20 critical internet facilities in, across Africa for now. We also have research and collaboration program and uh, under this research and collaboration program, we are working with uh, research and education uh, institution and uh, we are giving them um, support when they have project that can that is aligned with uh, the objective that we have in the continent with Africa. So most of the time we have like some project that measurement project, for instance, that we want to set up, we want to know the um the 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 how people in Africa are using internet, what are their um the the bandwidth they're using, what are the protocol, IPv4, IPv6 protocol, what are their the the website that uh, that that uh, that visited from Africa. And to this, part, to this type of project that will serve the entire community in kind of measuring the way the African community is using internet. We are also partner with universities and we are giving a fund for, for those universities to have interns so that they can work in this project to, that will help their, uh, uh, the entire African continent and abroad. And the last project under the IDP initiative of Afrinic is internet governance and ICT initiative development. In internet governance, I'm myself facilitator at Africa IGF and West Africa IGF as well. And um, as facilitator, I give courses in the when we have internet development, internet governance courses in the in the region. And also we are giving financial support for the, the, the country level internet governance initiative and also uh, regional and Africa level. So these are the um, the six initiatives that we have under the uh, uh, Africa Africanic Internet Development Program. So I said fellowship program, diversity in ICT program, technical community development program, critical infrastructure development program, research collaboration program, Africa IGF and ICT initiative development programs. So um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity you 
that have been given to Afrin to present this African IDP program. I'm going to paste in the in the chat the link to the to have more detail about the program and the email address that uh, uh, you can that you can reach out if you need more detail about this program. Thank you and uh, over to you. Thank you. And next we have you on SCAP. Thank you, Chair. I'm providing this update on behalf of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. At the outset, allow me to thank the organizers for inviting ASCAP to contribute to the first IGF Forum Open Consultations and Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group meeting. I'm pleased to provide a brief update on the work of ASCAP in the area of ICT connectivity for Asia and the Pacific that promotes digital transformation, including e-government platforms and services. Allow me to highlight three key milestones. First, ASCAP has promoted regional cooperation on digital connectivity for Asia-Pacific countries through the implementation of the Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway, APIS initiative. A new APIS action plan 2022-2026 was endorsed by the ASCAP Committee on ICT and Science, Technology and Innovation in September 2022 which contained 25 specific actions for multi-stakeholder cooperation. Aligned with the relevant WISI action lines, the action plan focuses on three pillars, uh, pillar one on connectivity four, pillar two on digital technologies and application, and pillar three on digital data. Second, in November, 2022, the Asia Pacific Digital Ministerial Conference 2022 was successfully organized by the Ministry of Science and ICT of the Republic of Korea with the support of ASCAP. Uh, with a theme of shaping our common future, the ministerial conference recognized the critical role of digital technology and connectivity for sustainable development and acknowledged that the APIs initiative is a useful regional platform for promoting digital cooperation in the region. Third, ASCAP continues to collaborate with other regional partners on promoting digital connectivity to bridge the digital divide and accelerate digital transformation. Um, allow me to, to, to say a few words on, on these uh, partnership. Um, ASCAP is working together with UNDESA, for example, to strengthen institutional capacity of government officials in Bangladesh, Kazakhstan, and the Maldives on developing regulatory sandboxes on frontier technologies for sustainable development. Um, ASCAP is also supporting capacity development in Bangladesh, Lao BDR, and Samoa to developing innovative digital and transport strategies between rural and urban areas. In the Pacific, ASCAP is supporting Fiji, New Zealand, and Samoa on the development of a Pacific Internet Exchange Point to improve efficient internet traffic between Pacific Island countries. Lastly, ASCAP collaborated with uh, UNDESA, UNEP, UNITO, GSMA, Collier Telecom and NIA Korea last year, 2022, to publish a joint publication on digital transformation in the region, highlighting the opportunities and risk of digital transformation and recommending three pathways for digital transformation. With this information, I will stop here. I thank you, Chair, for the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have CGI.PR. Thank you, Paul. Um, good afternoon. Um, and of course, morning and evening for those remotely following us in other time zones. Uh, my name is Vinicius. I'm an advisor to the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGI.br. And thank you to the IGF Secretariat and the MAG for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be here to give you a brief overview of our activities within the committee. Um, to start, uh, I'd like to make a brief comment about Brazil in general. Uh, the country is now having some new dialogues on its digital agenda and internet discussions, uh, especially due, due to the transition of governments, um, as you may know. Um, when we can observe a natural shift in the dynamics and in the ways of relating to and engaging with digital policy initiatives. Uh, in this context, CGI also uh, has been taking part in diverse pro processes. Uh, several topics are on the agenda, such as platform regulation, gender and diversity, digital cooperation, and also the Global Digital Compact, 
among other projects and initiatives undertaken by the committee. Um, we have uh, a working group on platform regulation, which is uh, very active uh, these days. Um, the working group has been working hard to study, debate, and seek consensus on this area specifically. Uh, recently, this WG has engaged with other regulation experiences, such as the European model, um, and or organized dialogues with experts and society in general. CGI has recently released a document with the outcomes that emerged from this first workshop with experts, organized at the end of the last year. Uh, the document presents a report on the meeting, highlighting the main achievements, consensus, and proposals of experts from all, all over Brazil that have participated in the, the activity with concrete actions and guidelines um, to, the, the, to the, this policy issue. CGI is now doing the planning for an upcoming public consultation that is being organized also in dialogue with governmental representatives. The goal is to release a nationwide consultation on various topics in order to contribute to the discussions and help organize the debate around concrete policy proposals. Some governmental structures are also analyzing if and how they can use the outputs of this consultation to advance the national digital public policy agenda. Um, we have also a project on collections and memory in internet governance uh, that we have already mentioned here sometimes. Uh, it's also advancing the collection green number, and we have released two new pieces since our last update, both translation, uh, translations of important IG documents to Portuguese, to spe specifically to Portuguese. Um, the first was the book written by Dr. Carolina Guerre about the history of LACNIC, uh, and the second was the report Advancing Cyber Stability from the Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace that uh, you probably know already. Um, there are more publications on the queue that will be released soon. All our publications are freely available on the website of CGI.br. We also send out limited number of printed copies to interested organizations upon request. Gender and diversity discussions are also part of CGI.br's agenda. Um, after more than two years of work, the committee is implementing a nationwide program to support diversity, including with financial incentives for minority groups for the participation in activities such as the publication of articles and book chapters. Um, as a result of a long-term work in consultations with the community, the responsible working group within CGI.br is also finalizing an extensive list of proposed measures and concrete actions to mitigate gender inequality on the internet and ICTs, and it will be released soon. Um, there are also several other activities and events scheduled to happen throughout the year. Other projects under the responsibility of CGI.br are also running in a permanent way, such as the program for supporting youth engagement in IG, and also our capacity building activities, such as the Brazilian School of Internet Governance, which has just published an open call for the 2023 cycle. Um, I'd like to also mention uh, briefly about the organization of the Brazilian IGF. Um, and uh, it's worth noting that the process for organizing the Brazilian IGF is ongoing and, and we have now uh, just released the, the results of an open call for workshops. 27 workshops proposed by the community have already been selected for the 2023, 2023 program out from 96 received proposals in, in the total. Uh, the zero activities organized by external entities and three main sessions will also be part of the program. The Brazilian IGF will take place between the end of May and the beginning of June in the city of Uberlândia. For this year, we will also count with a new activity, an IGF-like expert group meeting to discuss improvements and advancements for the Brazilian IGF. Well, this is the, the update from our side. Uh, I remain available for any kind of dialogue, doubts, or whatever may emerge. Um, I would like to thank once again the IGF Secretariat and the MAG and I hope to see all of you soon in Kyoto. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Diplo Foundation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Thank you to the IGF Secretariat and uh, the MAG for giving Diplo Foundation and the Geneva Internet Platform the possibility to speak about our work. I'm Marco Lotti, External Relations and Partnerships Manager at Diplo and the GIP, and I'm based in Geneva.
Diplo and the GAP are among the organizations that have been supporting and informing digital policy discussions and processes for over 20 years now. And we will continue to do so now, especially in these crucial times when important developments with digital and internet governance are unfolding at the international level. As these processes unfold, Diplo and the GAP would like to stress the importance of the three eyes approach so that discussions and processes continue to be inclusive, discussions and processes continue to be fully informed, and they also should continue to be impactful. When it comes to inclusivity, inclusivity must be substantial. It means that it is not enough to open the doors formally if we cannot walk through them. Many actors from small and developing countries and marginalized communities do not have sufficient capacities and resources to participate meaningfully in international consultations. Yet much more can be done to build individual and institutional capacities for meaningful participation. And in this regard, this is um, why Diplo and the GAP like to stress the importance of capacity development. Diplo is ready to assist in building capacity for more inclusive and meaningful participation, leveraging its 20 years experience uh, in, in digital governance and capacity development in, in digital issues. And when it comes to being uh, too informed, informed refers to evidence-based work and discussions. Unfortunately and paradoxically, we do not have enough data sometimes now on digital developments. For instance, while the actual movement of data is well documented, we do miss data on the impact of such movements, for example. Through our studies, events and trainings, we make our contributions towards better and informed discussions. When it comes to the last uh, element, uh, impactful uh, discussions, I don't think I need to elaborate on that, but it mainly refers to the fact that our efforts ought to be close to the needs of the communities that we have included in our, in our activities and that we address. So let me now briefly provide you with a few examples on how Diplo and the GIP support digital policy discussions and processes in an inclusive, informed and impactful way. Many of you are familiar with our reporting activities. We do report from the main digital policy related events happening in Geneva and also around the world when it's possible. I'm talking about the WISIS Forum, which uh, out of coincidence is happening next week here in Geneva, the UNCTAD e-commerce week, sorry, and the European Dialogue on Digital Policy, the Eurodig conference. And we call this the just-in-time reporting initiative as we publish the reports online within two hours after the session took place. And this is also what we did for the IGF in Ethiopia, when we covered about 90% of the sessions and published the reports on our website, the Digital Watch Observatory, which I invite you to visit at dig.watch. And aside from the session reports in, in, in Addis, we also issued daily summaries, the IGF dailies, as we call them. And at the end of the forum, we compiled all these resources into a final comprehensive report, which covered the IGF uh, meeting as a whole. So for us, it was really a three-step process, a session reports, daily summaries, and the end of the conference analysis document that our team, uh, team performed. This year, we hope that this important Just Time Report initiative will continue to be appropriately supported, um, also for the IGF meeting in Japan, where we look forward to meet, or at least e-meet, uh, all of you. In the meantime, in preparation for Japan, we will continue our analysis throughout the year on the Digital Watch website, and as well as report from the main digital policy related processes in Geneva, but also Brussels and Washington. Uh, just a few examples to, to conclude. In Geneva, we have just published the second edition of our Geneva Digital Atlas, which offers a comprehensive overview of who does what when it comes to digital policy in Geneva, which is one of the digital governance hubs at the multilateral level. I don't think I need to explain that to, to you. Outside Geneva, uh, still on the research side, we published an, a landmark report, Stronger Digital Voices from Africa, Building African Digital Foreign Policy and Diplomacy. This report provides a comprehensive mapping of elements of digital foreign policy in African countries by firstly drawing on African countries' digital agendas and policy documents. The report was launched last year during DIPLO's 20th anniversary summit in Malta, as well as the summit of the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie in Gerba. 
In this regard, throughout the 2023, with our network of, a network of experts, lecturers, and alumni, as well as our unique capacity development methodology, which we have been testing, testing for the past 20 years, Diplo remains ready to support the meaningful engagement of developing countries in digital policy processes. Specifically, Diplo will continue to offer its support by creating and strengthening links with the international digital diplomacy scene via the Geneva Internet Platform, since more of the 50% of the global governance processes are happening in Geneva. So to conclude, we will continue to hold our uh, reporting initiatives, we will continue to publish our studies, and we will continue to uh, organize our monthly online webinars, which analyze the latest trends, especially when it comes to advanced, techno advanced technologies. So thank you very much, and I will stop here for the moment. And thank you. Next, we have uh, UNESCWA. Um, that's Esqua. Do we have Esqua online? Yes, hi. Hi, uh, Shanghai. This is Ayman. Uh, well, my name is Ayman Terbini. Uh, I am, I'm going to put my video. Can you see me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, my name is Ayman Sherbini. I'm the chief of ICT policies, uh, digital cooperation and digital development uh, in the UN ESQA. As you know, UN ESQA is one of the regional uh, five regional commissions of uh, the UN. Uh, we uh, are uh, uh, part of the ECOSOC uh, uh, related the regional uh, commissions. And uh, we have been working on in the field of uh, information society since uh, 2002, uh, before, during, and after Tunis Agenda, uh, before, during, and after the inception of the IGF, the global one, and so on. Uh, currently, we are working on many topics, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I don't want to get deep on that, just give a glimpse. Uh, we have been working on the internet governance, uh, as I said, since uh, 2003, when uh, the issues erupted at the, the global level and the WIGIG and then the uh, contention between processes. And we believe in the multilateralism as well as the multi-stakeholderism. We have uh, been uh, always at uh, equidistance between different stakeholders uh, in the region. Uh, while having our uh, nature uh, and DNA as an, an intergovernmental body, we believe that intergovernmentalism and multi-stakeholders have to go hand in hand. And that's why, uh, in, uh, as uh, some of our colleagues know, we have established the Arab IGF uh, a few years after uh, the inception of the Global One. Uh, we uh, proposed it uh, in uh, IGF 4 in Sharm Sheikh. We launched it in 2012, uh, and then uh, we are now uh, working towards the uh, um, convening of the seventh edition of the Arab IGF. Uh, before I go into these details, uh, I just want to say our work span many other things. In addition to work on information society and internet governance, we work nowadays uh, on, on uh, the metaverse, AI, data ecosystems, entrepreneurship, and, and many other things. That is for ESQA. For, for the Arab region, uh, during the last 10 years, there was uh, a gap and void uh, in having no comprehensive strategy for the region, uh, despite the fact that there has been uh, one uh, in the first decade of the, of the millennium or of the century. Uh, but in the last 10 years, there has been such a, a void in the cohesive, comprehensive, uh, strategy or agenda for the region, and I will explain how we fill this gap. But nevertheless, there are thematic strategies for the region on one on AI, one on digital economy, uh, another one on cybersecurity, and so on. But uh, some kind of cohesive panoramic thing was not there. Uh, that will be uh, the main idea of uh, my intervention. Uh, uh, ESCO and uh, the League of Arab States came together uh, uh, in 2019 and uh, decided to partner and uh, fill that gap and work together on a joint project uh, through which we uh, co uh, collectively and jointly 
uh, and with the engagement of all UN and the last uh, entities, we develop one coherent and cohesive uh, Arab digital agenda. And uh, we worked for uh, two years on that uh, thing, and we ended up by uh, producing the first uh, edition, uh, uh, Arab Digital Agenda 1.0, uh, which uh, is uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, target-based uh, plan of uh, uh, action for the region for the decade 2023 till 2033. Uh, um, many uh, specialized agencies like ITU, UNESCO, and our colleagues in DESA and UNCTAD, in FAN, our WHO, many UN bodies, uh, were uh, part of this uh, aggreg uh, aggregation consortium. And uh, we worked as one UN, also with many bodies of the League of Arab States. Uh, the, the conceptual model uh, uh, we have produced uh, relates all the voices action lines to all the SDGs in a certain simplified conceptual model covering the uh, state, the economy, the society, the culture, the media, and so on. But, uh, and underneath these things, we have developed a, a number of objectives and targets and indicators. Uh, we have also produced a baseline for the region and targets for the coming uh, uh, 10 years uh, in uh, three uh, installments, uh, short term, mid term and long term. Uh, uh, as far as the Arab uh, IGF uh, is concerned, the seventh edition will be convened uh, this year. The last edition was convened in 2021 uh, in conjunction with the Arab Voices, which is also an Esqualas uh, joint uh, uh, collaboration. So uh, we uh, have uh, examined the idea of uh, uh, giving shape for the digital cooperation. And, and what we have really uh, came up with is really co consolidating the uh, WESIS community with the IGF community in our region. And this was very successful in 2021, during which we were the vice chair of the UNGUS at the global level. Uh, last uh, message I want to give is that the Arab IGF uh, community now uh, are co uh, convening uh, to produce input to the GDC, Global Digital Compact. We have two meetings uh, uh, during March. Uh, uh, during which we are going to finalize uh, the input document coming from the Arab IGF community to the GDC. And uh, we are uh, looking forward to uh, uh, convening uh, our next edition this year. Uh, the date and host uh, are still to be uh, announced, uh, but we hope that we can do it before Japan and to have an input uh, to Japan as well. Uh, my uh, thanks to the, uh, our, the global IGF community, to Shanghai, the, all the secretariat, and to the MAG uh, at large. Thank you so much. Back to you. Over. Thank you. Uh, we have the UNECA next, and I'm going to ask that, as we have several more of these uh, overviews, if you could be quite brief as we go forward. Hello, so I guess it's time for UNICEF. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Yasmina Byrne. I'm a Chief of uh, Foresight and Policy in uh, UNICEF Global Office of Research and Foresight. And I just want to thank uh, MAG and um, IGF Secretariat for convening and for giving us this opportunity. Like many uh, others who have spoken today, we are also working on understanding the impact of emerging technologies and uh, new digital environments and their impact on uh, children in particular. Uh, and we also, through this process of trying to understand better these environments, provide some recommendations for policymakers and others. And that includes the work on metaverse, uh, virtual environments, XR and children. We have a paper coming out soon, but we are also a member of the World Economic Forum um, Metaverse Governance Working Group. We are. Uh, also looking into neurotechnology and child rights. Um, that work is also coming to uh, fruition and, and further uh, unpacking some aspects of digital equality uh, uh, and inclusion 
of uh, children and in uh, all over the world uh, with a view to developing a framework and reviewing digital inclusion policies from around the world. But beyond this uh, work on em emerging technologies, um, I just want to mention that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in relation to persistent issues and problems uh, with regard to children's safety and uh, children's exploitation online. Children still experience online violence, abuse, and harassment. And these will only be amplified in this new digital environment. So uh, the old problems are not going to go away. They're just going to be amplified. And the first uh, uh, point of reference is that we do need to consider children's safety first, even though these technologies obviously offer a lot of opportunities. Uh, we are working on strengthening legislation to address all forms of sexual exploitation and abuse, um, and including those that are technologically, uh, technology enabled. We are tracking progress at the national level of a number of countries with legislation in that regard. And in also in support of development of these legislation, we have developed um, a guide for improving legislative framework to protect children from sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, the second point I want to make is that we're also working on responsible innovation in technology for children. And uh, in 2023, this is going to be a key year for us to discuss with the private sector how to design uh, digital products uh, with child well-being in mind. Uh, this is a continuation of the work that we've had uh, in, in respect to child rights and, and, and business. But also, uh, the, the, my, my third and last point is that uh, through the anticipatory approach to digital governance, we hope to work more closely with children to unpack what kind of digital future they want. Um, we need to, uh, um, we just want to emphasize the importance that we need to give to all children as large percentage of internet users are those that are below the age of 18. And even though there are many youth organizations and youth groups, um, this uh, age uh, range that uh, we are talking about in UNICEF is actually lower than the uh, typical age when we talk about young people. And children have specific rights enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, and in that regard, we feel that we need to really listen to young, uh, to, to, to children and youth, uh, 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 children in particular, about what kind of digital futures they want. What do they want from digital uh, technologies and digital developments? And how can we learn from them to build the digital public goods that we can leave as a legacy to children and to future generations? Um, so uh, we work very closely with children uh, and youth to make sure that their concerns are addressed. We have uh, recently formed a Youth Foresight Fellow Network that has worked with us on some of our foresight future-oriented products and will continue to engage with them. And uh, I would like just to invite the IGF to, uh, provide, uh, to continue to provide space to uh, children and youth in um, its deliberations and to listen to them when it comes to what kind of future they want and they anticipate. Thank you very much. And thank you. And uh, now we have um, the UN Food and Agriculture, FAO. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Henry van Burgstede of the Food and Agriculture Organization um, of the United Nations. Um, ladies and gentlemen, happy Women's Day. Digital inclusion is a prerequisite to enable equal access to transformative digital technologies for sustainable agriculture. We need to address the key barriers, including access to the internet and smartphone access to fully utilize digital technologies. I will uh, mention two things, one, we need to shift the focus from the coverage gap to the adoption gap. And secondly, we need to address demand side barriers in rural areas and focus on incentives. To achieve these two objectives, FAO is working in several areas. I will give four brief examples. One, FAO is championing the use of digital public goods. We are a member of the Digital Public Goods Alliance and we are committed to developing and championing digital public goods, 
that help achieve sustainable agri-food agri systems and therefore contributing to the UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation and our FAO strategic framework. In our digital portfolio, we have several digital public goods like the hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform, the FAO digital search portfolio with mobile apps, and forest monitoring through open forests and water productivity to our WAPOR um, portal. Secondly, through the participation of FAO in the Broadband Commission and the working groups, for example, on smartphone access. Our FAO Director General acts as a commissioner on the Broadband Commission and is advocating for uh, connecting the unconnected in LDCs, LLDCs, and SITs. Even if around 97% of the world's population now have access to mobile data networks, the disparity still remains, and the adoption gap is actually 43% seven times larger than the coverage gap. We believe that smartphone access can improve the quality of life. Several national studies have consistently shown a positive correlation between internet adoption and GDP, as, as well as socioeconomic well-being and emerging markets. Third, we launched the 1000 Digital Villages Initiative. Um, this corporate initiative aims at promoting digital transformation of villages and small towns across the world, enabling farmers to use digital technologies. And fourth and lastly, FAO is a signature, um, has signed the Rome call for AI ethics. AI is already contributing to one of the main challenges that FAO is facing, feeding a global, a growing population in a sustainable way. But there are also risks that the digital divide can become wider and digital dividends are not distributed equally. A few concrete examples are, for example, the management of, uh, of water, plant pest detection, global information and early warning systems, the detection of agricultural stress and species recognition, amongst others. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, digital value added services for farmers, fisher folks, rural women, youth entrepreneurs and all rural communities accelerate the transformation of mobile phones into new agricultural tools to reach the last mile, leaving no one behind and helping small scale and family farmers to benefit from the digital economy. But we can only achieve that when we, when we shift the focus from the coverage gap to the adoption gap. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I ask you to post some of the links to the in further information in the chat? Yes, and I will do so, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now I have ITU. Thank you, Chair. I hope you can all hear me. Um, a very good evening to you all from Geneva and, um, of course, a very happy International Women's Day. My name is Sadvi and I work with the International Telecommunication Union. Um, let me first convey on behalf of ITU our thanks to the IGF Secretariat uh, and MAG for giving us the opportunity to contribute to the meeting today. Um, our congratulations as well for the successful forum held uh, last year in Ethiopia. Um, as in previous years, ITU has participated at the highest level. We organized a number of different sessions, um, including um, related to the WISIS Forum, the Connect to Recover Initiative on digital inclusion. Um, we also participated uh, at a session organized by OCHR on technical standards and human rights. Um, and as you may know, this year, ITU's new leadership has taken office, um, helmed by our first woman secretary general, uh, Ms. Uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin. And we're very excited to continue our engagement and participation at IGF um, this year as well. Um, I'll take the opportunity now. I know we're running out of time, so I'll try and be very brief uh, just to highlight you know, some activities that might be of interest. Um, my thanks to um, our various colleagues who've, who've spoken before me and have highlighted some of the, co the uh, collaborations that we have ongoing in the UN system. But perhaps touching upon the metaverse piece, since a number of um, you know, folks have spoken about it, and also thanks to Mr. Carville for highlighting it in the chat. Uh, but there is a new focus group on the metaverse. It's a pre-standardization collaboration platform. It's open to everyone. So um, you know, we do hope that we can kind of increase um, uh, collaboration uh, with uh, you know, uh, everyone who's working um, on the different aspects uh, of, of the metaverse. Um, and of course, we'd be very happy to contribute to any discussions around the subject in Kyoto as well. 
Um, I think this was also mentioned uh, perhaps by Marco from Diplo Foundation, but we do have the WISIS Forum coming up next week. It's in Geneva. Um, it's been great to see the interest uh, this time. We're excited to host uh, over 500 high-level representatives, including 30 plus ministers from um, um, you know different parts of the world. And uh, we hope to see the, the MAG chairperson there as well. Um, and then later this year in July, we're organizing the AI for Good Global Summit after a break of three years. Uh, but given all the developments that have happened in the space recently, there's um, you know, some exciting conversations that are taking place there uh, with some great thought leaders, including Yuval Noah Harari, uh, Werner Vogels from um, Amazon, Leela Ibrahim from DeepMind, and so on. Uh, and then finally, in September, immediately prior to the SDG Summit, um, we will organize together with the UN, with Partner to Connect, and with the Broadband Commission an SDG Digital Day, which will aim to demonstrate um, in concrete ways how data and, and digital technologies can accelerate progress towards the SDGs. Uh, more information on all of these various initiatives is, is available on our website. Um, we hope you know um, to see you all at one or more of these uh, events and spaces. So I'll stop here for now, but I remain available for any questions. Um, and thank you once again. We remain committed to the IGF process. Uh, and look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have Ankh Ted. Uh, David from Ankh Ted. Uh, you, sorry, United Nations Counterterrorism Committee. Executive Directorate. Yes, we are here. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Irene O, oh, and I am from the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, called CTED. I'm pleased to provide a brief update on our activities related to digital cooperation and safety. As part of our commitment to addressing digital threats, CTED assisted in convening the special meeting of the Counterterrorism Committee in India on 28 and 29 October 2022. The meeting focused on the increasing threat posed by the use of three significant technologies by terrorists and violent extremists. Number one, the internet and social media. Number two, new payment technologies and fundraising method. And number three, unmanned aerial systems, including drones. The meeting brought together all Security Council members stakeholders from the technical, academic, and civil society sectors, and the broader international community to discuss how the related terrorist threats are likely to evolve and how we can act together to ensure effective responses in a manner consistent with international law. The highlight of the special meeting also included the adoption of the output document called the Delhi Declaration, unanimously agreed by all security member, uh, Security Council members. The Delhi Declaration is a pioneer document that reflects the resolve of the Security Council to counter the use of new and emerging technologies for terrorist purposes in a comprehensive and holistic manner. The Declaration also reaffirms the importance of public-private partnerships, human rights, civil society engagement, and collaboration more broadly to address the host of challenges stemming from new and emerging technologies. And as a follow-up to the special meeting, CTED has been tasked and is working towards developing a set of guiding principles to further assist member states, as well as recommendations on the three themes of the special meeting. CTED will continue to work closely with our partners from the technology private sector, civil society, and academia in this consultative process. Once again, CTED would like to thank the organizers of the IGF for giving us the floor to share our work in combating digital threats with respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. We look forward to continued engagement and collaboration with the IGF, the government of Japan, and all other stakeholders on this front. Thank you very much. And thank you. And I think um, we have Scott, Cam Scott Campbell from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. 
Thank you, colleagues, uh, the colleagues from the MAG, Chengatai, IGF Secretariat. Um, thank you all for this opportunity just um, to provide a quick update from the UN Human Rights Office. Uh, my name is Scott Campbell. I lead the work on tech and human rights uh, at our office. And while our office is active on a number of fronts uh, relevant to, to the IGF in this discussion in view of the time, I'll just quickly highlight four areas uh, of our work. Uh, first, uh, as was just mentioned by my colleague Sadvi, uh, technical standard setting and human rights. Uh, and following an open forum at the IGF uh, in Ethiopia, uh, and also following an early request from the UN Human Rights Council, our office convened an expert consultation last month in Geneva to discuss the relationship between human rights and technical standard setting processes for new and emerging technologies. This, this discussion, which was really a first ever of its kind, mandated by the Human Rights Council, brought together the ITU and other technical standard setting bodies, companies, civil society, and other experts to explore how to effectively break silos and integrate human rights concerns into technical standard setting processes. Um, we continue to work closely with the ITU and other standard setting bodies in these efforts, and we will present a report on the topic to the Human Rights Council uh, in June. Second, uh, human rights due diligence for the UN's use of digital technology. And this is also building on an open forum that we held in November uh, in Addis, and also as part of implementation of the SG's roadmap for digital cooperation and the SG's call to action for human rights. Uh, our office has continued to develop guidance for UN entities on human rights due diligence and the impact of the use of digital tech by the United Nations. Uh, this will be a continuing effort throughout this year, uh, including further consultations, uh, presentation of the guidance to the Secretary General's Executive Committee, and eventually rollout. Um, third, uh, allow me just quickly to note our efforts uh, in regard to the development of the International Cybercrime Convention. Um, our office has provided and will continue to provide advice on human rights standards and principles during the negotiations of the convention. Uh, which we believe holds important implications for the protection of human rights, in particular, uh, the right to privacy, freedom of expression. Uh, and this provision of advice will continue also throughout the, the year in the negotiation process and including at the upcoming next round uh, in Vienna. And lastly, um, our work in the regulatory space, which many participants today have touched on, uh, we continue to intensify our own public and private advocacy on a number of fronts for rights-based online content government frameworks uh, and legislation um, by directly engaging with member states and directly with tech companies. Um, we do this including you know, on the basis of the High Commissioner's reports to the Human Rights Council, the work of the human rights mechanisms, as well as reports by the Secretary General. Um, of note, the High Commissioner's report last September on privacy in the digital age, which provides guidance around spyware and hacking tools, the role of encryption in ensuring privacy, and monitoring public spaces. Um, and I would also draw attention, as many people um, mentioned disinformation, the Secretary General's report on the impact of disinformation on human rights. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much. Uh, sorry, just to jump in, can you also paste some links, um, if you can, into the chat, if uh, people want to follow up, if that's okay? Yeah, that's ah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, next we have you, Nadir. Yes, uh, good evening. I hope you can, you can hear me okay. Um, thank you so much for giving you, Nadir, the opportunity to, to brief the group. My name is Giacomo Persipaoli. I'm the head of Unidir's security and technology program. Uh, we're based in Geneva, but I'm actually dialing in from New York, where we are uh, following and assisting the uh, fourth session of the OWG, the Open Ended Working Group on uh, ICT and International Security. Um, very briefly, in the interest of time, I wanted to uh, highlight three uh, updates, and I'm very happy to, to share more in writing. Um, first and foremost, last Friday, uh, we hosted here in New York our annual cyber stability conference that focused on international law, and more specifically, the, uh, the applicability or how does the UN Charter applies to, to the cyberspace, a very relevant and timely topic that attracted uh, 24 speakers from all around the world and 600 participants, of which 114 person, which is uh, you know, the highest number we've had uh, since before the pandemic. So very, very good sign. Um, if you're interested, 
uh, we will upload the conference recordings on Unidear's YouTube channel in the coming days, and we'll also be releasing a short summary report in the coming weeks. The second uh, a point I wanted to highlight and bring to your attention is our cyber policy portal and its latest improvements. For those of you who are not familiar, the cyber policy portal is a one-stop shop providing easy access to the global cyber policy landscape with 193 national profiles and over a dozen uh, regional and international organizations. The latest improvements that we officially launched two days ago uh, consists of a new digital library or, or database uh, which supports advanced uh, searches by users uh, in of almost uh, 1,500 documents in 54 uh, different languages. So a very good resource if you're interested in learning anything about national positions of different states when it comes to uh, uh, cybersecurity, please do consult the portal. You can access the portal directly uh, via cyberpolicyportal.org or through Unity's website. And last but not least, uh, I wanted to bring to your attention an ongoing research project that we plan to wrap up by the summer that focuses on, on linking the topic of cyber threats with the norms of responsible state behavior and capacity building. We've witnessed how in the uh, ongoing processes, these three topics tend to be discussed and dealt with in isolation. We are currently have a project that tries to create a common thread across all of these three topics. And the project aims to identify what we call uh, foundational cyber capabilities that are needed to implement the norms of responsible state behavior and are considered as necessary to prevent or mitigate specific cyber threats. Um, so if you want to know more about anything of what I just discussed. Uh, we always uh, appreciate the opportunity and value the opportunity to collaborate with other agencies and partners. So please do not hesitate to reach out if you'd like to learn more. Thank you. And thank you. And now from the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Hillary Beckery. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. Uh, my name is Hilary from the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. And firstly, I would really like to thank the IGF Secretariat and the MAG for having us and for extending the opportunity to join today's consultation. Um, please allow me to start by saying that we are very pleased to see the continuous growth of youth engagement in the IGF last year. We appreciate the availability of opportunity for youth not only to be able to participate in all of the IGF activities, but also to lead in particular for the IGF Youth Forum, and also the current structure that enables young people to present priorities that are relevant in their regions and local communities to the attention of the global level. This year, from our end, we would love to further strengthen our support to the IGF Secretariat and also collaborate to help shape the IGF's youth track and further support the meaningful youth engagement across the forum. Uh, with that in mind, it's our big hope that we can work together as well as with everyone to encourage all partners to include young people in their official delegation, especially uh, young women, indigenous youth and youth with disabilities among others. So, so that the meaningful participation of young people are mainstream throughout the forum. Uh, as important as it is to shine light on youth specific issues in the context of internet governance, we find that it is equally important to make sure that the participation of youth is not siloed. Um, the participation of young people, especially those who are often left behind, are very crucial to help us identify and address the gaps of the digital future, as well as our work on this. So we also hope that the voices, recommendations, and ideas shared by the young people in the forum will continue, not, continue to not only be heard, but also be taken forward into action and decision by all the partners. Um, as highlighted in the, our common agenda report, um, meaningful youth engagement is key in our efforts uh, to partner with young people in achieving many of our ambitious agenda, including this one. So we truly hope we can work together to enable this. Um, as we know and believe that having young people as equal partners is a leverage that should not be missed. And we stand ready to support and collaborate. We hope that this year's IGF theme will be able to also address not only rights and inclusion, but also trust and safety as we really see the increasing need for trust building and greater efforts to uphold and protect human rights online as many of the young people have voice, um, in particular in the global report on protection of young people in civic spaces that we recently launched uh, in 2021. Um, especially, as we all know, with the rapid development and use of AI and metaphors uh, as some of the technologies that young people often engage with. 
With this topic in mind, I'd like to also share that we have been working uh, with partners such as the Office of the SRSG on Violence Against Children and ITU and um, partners from academia, civil society and private sector through the protection online uh, through the protection through online participation initiative to map out how young people and children are leveraging the internet and technology to stay safe and uphold their rights to be safe and protected. Uh, we have also been collaborating with the Tech Always Office as well as the UNICEF Office of Innovation and calling young people and children to contribute to the global digital combat process so youth can further highlight their recommendations on the importance of human rights online, safety and protection and inclusion uh, so that they will be reflected on the compact. Uh, this is done through our joint advocacy and um, the new research that was launched um, uh, last month in Saver, during Saver Internet Day uh, that aims to find out young people's key concern in regards of the digital future and as well as its governance. Um, this work uh, aimed to highlight how young people perceive, trust, and utilize the internet, which I believe is uh, very relevant uh, to this year's uh, IGF focus. So just as we have done last year, we hope to bring them once again uh, to this year's forum and we welcome any collaboration on this. So we thank you once again for the opportunity and we're looking forward to continue our support for this important process. Thank you very much. And next we have UNDP. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. And thank you, IGF Secretariat. Thank you, Mac Chair, um, for the opportunity. My name is Yolanda Ma, and I represent United Nations Development Program. To keep it short, I want to share a few things that UNDP has been prioritizing as we observe them um, with as emerging trends and needs coming from the 100 countries that we support on digital work. The first one is on the importance of the digital inclusion and the need to continue bridging the digital divide, which is not new for this crowd, um, but I'm glad that ChatGPT actually listed digital inclusion as the first priority, and we would agree with that. Um, it's important to note that those ex ex currently excluded from internet usage are more likely to be poorer, less educated, older, rural, and women. And we'd like to emphasize that connectivity is not just a matter of infrastructure without training, affordability and digital literacy, those left unconnected are at risk of further exclusion. Therefore, UNDP recognized that advocating for universal connectivity is not enough. We also need to advocate for meaningful and inclusive connectivity. So we have published a policy brief on inclusive digital transformation, which I can share the link um, in the chat in a bit. And we're supporting countries to embed digital inclusion at the country level through practices like participatory policy making, institutional strengthening, responsible data collection, strengthening their digital capacity building, etc. And secondly, um, which is a topic I haven't heard so much so far, is on digital public infrastructure, infrastructure and digital public goods. Um, we noticed that um, every country is actually currently building or upgrading their digital infrastructure. And there's urgency to really support them and get it right now, otherwise it will be too late. And we, from UNDP, we receive a lot of those requests every day. And we believe that it is important that countries develop open, safe, inclusive, and rights-based digital public infrastructure, and also leverage digital public goods as they fit. Together with partners like ITU, UNICEF, Norway, Germany, India, India, especially in their role current this year as the G20 presidency, we're working to build out models for DPIs and DPGs as a means of creating the global community for sharing more digital architectures and approaches, including policies and laws. And thirdly, um, and lastly, the whole of society holistic approach to digital transformation, and also the need to mobilize and engage more local, local digital ecosystems. For UNDP, we have seen the demand from countries evolving from the one-off digital solutions into requests for support their digital um, national transformation that really requires a whole society approach. And that means the transformation is no longer just a job of ICT ministers, which we by now hopefully already, already understand that that's impossible. And But that requires all stakeholders and players um, across different sectors, such as tech industry, legislators, youth entrepreneurs, etc. And UNDP is currently supporting um, over 40 countries on their national digital transformation or their national digital strategy. And we will be happy to bring our experience or the governments we work with to IGF this year. I'd like to conclude by saying UNDP is really committed to IGF and the multi-stakeholder model that it represents. And we would welcome further engagement 
and we would um, look forward to co-create this with IGF secretariat and stakeholders. Over, thank you. Thank you, and we have UNECA, Actar. Mata. Uh, Mata Sek. UN Economic Commission for Africa, are you on? Okay, we'll just go to the next one. And the next one is Dino Del uh, Delaccio from UNJSPR. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My name is Dino Delaccio. I'm the Chief Information Officer of the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund. I'm based in New York, and uh, I was recently nominated as representative of the fund to the MAG of the IGF, and I'm honored to be part of this distinguished group. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Chair, I will uh, uh, present a few slides simply to uh, support my uh, presentation. So by using maybe some graphical representation, uh, I will make my presentation more clear. Um, so the Pension Fund uh, is an interagency organization established by the General Assembly with a resolution 1949. We uh, serve 25 member organization and in turn, we are supporting 82,000 uh, retirees and beneficiary that uh, are uh, residing in more than 193 countries around the globe, as well as an approximately 130,000 active participants, which basically represent all the UN staff members, the staff members, some of the international organizations that uh, are part of the fund. And uh, I included some of the logos on this slide. Um, in 2021, the pension fund developed a new strategy, a care strategy, synonym acronym of client focus, action oriented, relation build and efficiency driven, which uh, highly relied on the use of digital technology and therefore has been also redefined as a digital transformation strategy. This strategy took input from the uh, Secretary General strategy on new technology, which was issued in 2018, as well as, of course, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the three pillars of the UN Pension Fund strategy are based on improving client experience using innovative technology, such as blockchain and the digital identity, modernizing the UN pension services using robotic process automation, and artificial intelligence, and building a strong global partnership focusing on data governance and data analytics. One of the biggest and first uh, issue that uh, the pension fund address vis-a-vis a 70 -vis year old process which pertain to the need to give certainty to the digital identity of our retiree and beneficiary that as I mentioned before, they reside in more than 190, 193 countries around the globe, was to support the ability of the fund to give certainty to proof of identity and authentication, proof of existence, proof of transaction, and proof of location. The solution to these uh, four problems was found by developing um, so, uh, an application called the Digital Certificate of Entitlement, which each uh, beneficiary, retiree of the pension fund have been in the last two years downloading on their phone. And after going an initial enrollment process, enable them to confirm who they are, and most importantly, also that they are still alive in order to ensure that they will continue to receive the payment of their benefit. So, in summary terms, the key technologies and the themes of the UN Pension Fund pertain to digital identity using biometrics and specifically facial recognition, digital evidence by supporting the creation of this evidence through a blockchain and immutable creating an immutable record on a distributed ledger technology, providing digital assurance. And this is definitely one of the things that is very crucial and critical to us, given that uh, 
using innovative technology, unfortunately, uh, it's operating in an environment where there are not yet well-established, generally accepted principle and standard for providing assurance. So we are looking and we are interested in contributing on any initiative or any effort that uh, aims at creating standards and principle for the ethical use and for the use of technology that will preserve and guarantee privacy and cybersecurity. And finally, the digital fluency in order to make sure that both internally as well externally, all our stakeholders are adequately trained and made aware of the strengths and weaknesses of these technologies. So uh, as a matter of just some example, we have identified some already of the benefit that we were able to achieve by using these innovative technologies in the domain of digital identity. We are now, I mean, we are, we are minimizing the use of paper, given that this solution does not utilize any more paper form that used to be mailed through 193 postal service around the globe. No more printing, no more mailing, uh, no manual signature verification, no proof of work for those who are technically informed because when, uh, uh, audience hear the name blockchain that is usually a, a, an immediate uh, association with Bitcoin and the use of uh, technology that uh, exploit uh, natural resources. So that's not our case. We're not using proof of work for mining consensus and non paper archiving, given that we are creating only digital archives uh, as evidence of the transaction. Uh, finally, just to mention in 2021, we received the UN Secretary General Award on Innovation and Sustainability. We have certified the solution with the what is or still and right now available standard for an independent certification, which is the ISO 27001 for Information Security Management Standard. And again, not definitely not very specific standard for the use of blockchain or biometric, but this is what's available and this is what we were able to obtain. Hence, our interest in working and contributing to developing the adequate standard for the these new technology that are being used. And finally, just to mention that uh, thanks to the success of the digital identity solution developed by the UN Pension Fund, this gave input to a wider, larger project, uh, namely the UN Digital Identity that aims at creating a, a digital identity for all the UN staff member at large in the whole system in order to facilitate the mobility of uh, staff member uh, amongst organization without the need of using paper or the risk of losing or duplicating data and certification. With that, I finish my intervention. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And thank you very much. And the last one for tonight is uh, Gaia Mantini. You know. Thank you, and good evening at this point to everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I'm Gaia Mantini, representing the digital evidence team of uh, UNODC within the terrorism prevention branch. And well, um, I will keep it short. And as we all know, nowadays people are more connected than ever. And as we all know, it is clear that information and communication technologies will only continue evolving. With this rapid growth of the internet users, the criminal exploitation of online services clearly looms large. And so while terrorists and criminal, like cyber criminal, are using the internet and social media to commit substantive part of their criminal activities, so not only the crime per se, but also uh, glorification, incitement, financing, recruitment, training, etc. National criminal justice system may not always have developed um, keeping the same pace and in parallel. And this was stated by uh, stated stress recognized by several Security Council resolution. And in response to these issues in 2017, the Digital Evidence Unit of UNODC within the Terrorist Prevention Branch launched the Global Initiative on Handling Electronic Evidence Across Border to support member states in strengthening capacity to combat crimes committed through the exploitation, not even the use, but the abuse and the exploitation of information and communication technologies, in particular, um, building capacity of national authorities on how to handle electronic evidence uh, that are left in the net while committing this kind of crime, especially when these electronic evidence are based 
uh, and stored by service provider based in a foreign jurisdiction. Everything is done in an interconnected and holistic manner. So this assistance has been implemented to several work streams, including tailoring, tailored intervention at the national, regional, cross-regional and global level, and the development of numerous specialized uh, technical tools. Well, given the time frame, my intervention will not really picturing all the work that UNODC and our unit is doing, of course. However, uh, I would simply highlight that the large number of our publications and tools um, are present on the Electronic Evidence Hub, which is a portal within the uh, Sherlock portal, and the majority of which are publicly accessible resources. Uh, no, we can stay on the first slide. Thank you very much. It's just the picture is just to have a picture of our uh, hub where you can find all our tools because I will not uh, be able to mention all of them. I will just highlight the practical guide for requesting electronic evidence across border. This is the global initiative flagship tool and the state of the art product contains um, well, a mapping of relevant procedures and the main available contact points of major service providers to help criminal justice officials identify steps at the national level to preserve, to request, to gather electronic evidence, understanding the steps to engage in MLA requests, understanding non-MLA measures uh, such as voluntary data preservation and disclosure. The practical guide forms uh, is the first main um, tools uh, that uh, has been developed and forms the basis of multiple UNODC work streams globally and has been uh, used as a foundation for technical assistance activities involving countries of all the regions of the world. The tools that we are developing under the global initiatives uh, are like they always guarantee the right balance on how to handle electronic evidence for law enforcement and uh, judicial purposes while respecting human rights, of course. Um, I could keep walking, but it's late. And uh, I would just want to highlight that all our tools are present on our portals, that others are on their way, and several activities are constantly implemented, including uh, the development of a new strategy for 2023-2028, specifically based on tech and terror, uh, which will address and is addressing the dual issues of how technology is exploited by terrorists and how technology can be used to prevent terrorists. And nothing, just, just to say that we stay open to dialogue and to keep foster cooperation with public and private sector. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I know we have, um, we still have a couple of people to go, but they are on site so we were asking if it's possible that you could start us off tomorrow morning because um we have the technical person here and he wants to go home uh, <laughs> i'm not too sure what his interest is in internet governance issues but um if it's okay with you if not i mean we can hear you but um Yes, uh, we just want to be mindful of other people's times. It's fine to. Mm. Sorry, um, fine. We can I can do that tomorrow morning. Um, anybody else uh, tomorrow morning? Okay. How many? Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. And yes, Bruna. Yes, Bruna. Thanks, No, just a suggestion. Maybe tomorrow we can have a time cap on the interventions. Yes, so there's, only, well, there's only four of them or five of them. So let's just keep it's it just, fair. Just a request. And, so we don't waste uh, so I mean, time. you heard the interventions here. They were saying, I'll be very brief. And, <laughs> you know, they were spending 10 minutes and they were well aware. Uh, <laughs> yes. Again, um three minutes because we want to end before 6 30. well i, I definitely uh, this is at least here for the record i definitely didn't want to use three minutes but um that's something that that well if if people are told you have three minutes for your presentation then it's it well we can ask them to stick to the three minutes and remind them after three minutes that their time's up maybe give them a minute more but no. it's also something that we can can manage Yes, we hear you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
thank you very much and uh, deep appreciation going to the technical person. I hope he can uh, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we're back here tomorrow at 10. Thank you. Mm -hmm.